Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us for this hearing on reciprocal switching, docket number EP711 sub 1. This proceeding has a long and storied history, but I'll do my best to summarize it briefly. In 2011, in docket EP711, National Industrial Transportation League filed a petition for rulemaking in which it proposed revisions to the board's reciprocal switching rules. In 2012, the board opened a proceeding on that petition and in 2014 held a hearing to explore further the issues raised by the petition and the comments. In 2016, the board closed EP711 and open EP711-1. By the way, someday I have to get the hang of how we figure out these numbers. <clears throat> in in 711 sub 1 with the present docket number, we issued a notice of proposed rulemaking proposing regulations under which the board would exercise its statutory authority to require rail carriers to establish switching arrangements in certain circumstances. The board received many comments on the NPRM, and since 2017, board members have been participating in ex day meetings with interested persons, summaries of which are posted on the document. Since the issuance of the NPRM and initial receipt of written comments in this docket, there have been significant changes in and affecting the freight rail industry. And we're now holding this hearing to update the record on this topic and any additional or modified views commenters may have. Speaking only for myself, I'll emphasize a few points before beginning. First, it's been over 11 years since this proceeding started. And I think it's time for the board to confront the issue of reciprocal switching head on and reach a decision in this docket. Second, since joining the board in January 2019, I've been continually impressed by the need to increase competition in the rail industry. As quickly it became apparent to me, in recent years, there's been a downturn trend, a downward trend in both the quality and quantity of service in the industry. And yet, there's been an upward trend in rates, up 25% in inflation adjusted dollars since the early 2000s according to the board's own Tornquist study. In my view, one means of dealing with these trends, and as I have stated on many occasions, a means to avoid more granular regulation of rates and service is to enhance the competitive landscape. To me, this is a key to a healthy freight rail industry. For these re reasons, nearly three years ago, I concluded that the board ought to take up consideration of the long pending proposed reciprocal switching rule. And shortly after being named chairman a year ago in January, I determined that consideration of 711 should be a board priority. I'm mindful that several months ago, the White House issued an executive order on competition, which reaffirms the policy of the United States to combat excessive concentration of industry abuses of market power and the harmful effects of monopoly and monopsony. And because of my own concern about increasing competition in the rail industry, I welcome emphasis on this goal as part of national policy. But it is important and essential to note that in the executive order, the White House underscored that the STB is an independent agency I and the other board members cherish that independence and our discretion to reach decisions which we believe are in the public interest. Reciprocal switching is obviously an important issue and one on which I and the rest of the board are very interested in hearing from all concerned stakeholders and members of the public. I would like to thank the witnesses for their in advance for their participation today and tomorrow and for their efforts to prepare for this hearing. I would also like to say a special thank you to our IT folks and other board staff who have worked so hard to make sure this hearing happens successfully. Before we begin, let me briefly go over a few procedural and technical matters. Please silence your cell phones, turn off your cameras and mute yourselves in Zoom. When your panel is called up, 
please turn your camera on and keep it on for the duration of the panel. When you are presenting, a timer will appear counting down your allotted time. When the timer reaches zero, your time will have expired and we ask that you conclude your remarks. If the board member questions while you're presenting, be aware that they may ask those questions before your presentation is over. And let me underscore that we have a lot of people to come and while we would like to stick to our schedule, it's not my style to cut people off in mid thought. So uh, you will have your time to tell us what you want us to hear. Uh, Pat, uh, you have access to the chat function in Zoom but please only use this for technical questions. If you become disconnected from the hearing and are not able to reconnect via Zoom, there is a phone number you may use to call in included in the hearing information you were provided. If you do need to call in via phone, please email us at hearing at stv.gov with the phone number you see uh, with the phone number you are calling from so that we can identify you and let you speak when it's your turn. You can also refer to the frequently asked questions on the board's website for any further troubleshooting or contact information. This hearing is also being streamed on YouTube and the link is available on the board's website. A transcript of this entire hearing will be placed on the board's website after the close of the hearing and recording will be available as well. For the benefit of our court reporters, please speak clearly into your microphone and minimize background noise. They are welcome to interject if they can't hear. As noted in the decisions we issued two weeks ago, today we will hear from the speakers, from the initial speaker through panel three. Tomorrow we will begin with panel four and go through to the end of the speaker's list. We will take a 30 minute break for lunch today at approximately 12.30 Eastern, depending on where we are in the speakers. Uh, we will also take several short breaks through the day as needed. Uh, finally, before we actually begin with our speakers, I want to ask if any of my colleagues on the board have any other opening remarks they'd like to make. Hearing none, uh, we will begin. We will turn to our first speaker, the administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration, Amit Bose. Amit, you're on. Chairman Oberman and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. My name is Amit Bose, and I am the administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration and operating administration of the U.S. Department of Transportation. I am pleased to offer these remarks. On behalf of DOT and FRA, we appreciate the board's continuing review of the reciprocal switching proposal, and we will be ready to assist the board however we can as this matter proceeds. DOT's primary concern will always be safety. In addition, we work closely with stakeholders to foster a healthy, fluid, and competitive rail network. These goals are foundational to the Biden-Harris administration's efforts to promote competition in the American marketplace, as explained in Executive Order 14036, Promoting Competition in the American Economy, issued on July 9th, 2021. As you know, in that executive order, the president specifically called upon the board to revisit the issue of reciprocal switching and to consider how the proposal may help to enhance competition in the freight rail industry. In considering the reciprocal switching proposal and the numerous submissions to the docket, DOT respectfully asks the board to bear in mind some key principles. First, the adoption of any new revised switching requirements must ensure that switching operations are safely executed. This is particularly important because switches involve movements at interchange points that must be carefully planned and coordinated to avoid accidents and injuries. FRA knows that these operations can be completed safely as access, interchange, and switching activities are daily operations of Class 1 railroads. Of course, FRA will remain vigilant over the safety of the rail network and will take appropriate enforcement action where necessary. 
but we expect freight railroads to work collaboratively with one another in carrying out switching operations and effectively managing safety risks. This includes necessary training of railroad employees, particularly those who may be called upon to execute reciprocal switches. Second, DOT recognizes the importance of promoting fair access of efficient and cost-effective rail transportation to shippers. We want to clearly understand all the impacts to the flow of goods in the supply chain under the status quo, as well as under a potential reciprocal switching rule. We are particularly concerned about the competitive landscape and its effect upon captive shippers or shippers with limited or no access to competitive rail options. DOT is also interested in the board's conclusions upon the impact of reciprocal switching proposals on the supply chain that continue to respond to the challenges of the COVID-19 public health emergency. Before I move to my final point, I want to raise a concern top of mind for FRA and DOT at the moment. The continuing challenge to the nation's supply chain and rail's role in moving freight, particularly intermodal containers. Rail plays a crucial role in moving and clearing containers from our ports throughout the country and should further address the challenges to take on an even greater share of that traffic. To that end, where we can be helpful, FRA looks forward to continuing its participation with the STB and the Rail Shipper Transportation Advisory Council, as well as railroads to facilitate and hopefully grow rail's share of container transport from our ports. Finally, DOT recommends that the board consider whether the reciprocal switching proposal is likely to have in any adverse effects upon passenger rail operations. As the board knows across most of the country, Amtrak and commuter rail services operate over host railroads. It is crucial to DOT to ensure that passenger service can continue to run efficiently and that it can be enhanced to the public's benefit. DOT looks forward to hearing the views of other parties on the potential impacts of the board's proposal. We may provide additional views to the board at a later stage of the proceeding if we can aid in the board's decision-making process. On behalf of DOT and FRA, thank you for the opportunity to address the board and for your consideration of our views in this proceeding. Amit, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do any uh, board members have any questions for Amit? I do, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Karen. Um, Administrator, uh, you mentioned uh, keeping in mind any impacts on passenger rail. Uh, you don't know of any particular place in the country where uh, reciprocal switching would actually, uh, you think, would actually adversely affect passenger rail operations. I assume this is just a, a general concern. It is a general concern. Uh, we're not if, aware of any specific uh, locations uh, in the country at the moment. If it uh, seemed to, as a result, uh, impair uh, on-time performance, would that be for the freight rails to fix or for Amtrak to fix? Can you just report the, uh, repeat the last part about, uh, I just- if, if there were an, an adverse impact on passenger rail on-time performance as a result of putting in a reciprocal switch, would that be something that the uh, freight railroads uh, should fix or would Amtrak have to pay for that? Well, we're always hopeful that it, things can be done on a consensus basis. Uh, and, and I think that would be the starting point. Uh, but if there were uh, impacts on, on time performance, I think we would have to review that accordingly. And again, we're, we're available at FRA to work uh, with the board through these technical uh, issues as, as you're going through the, uh, the consideration of this. Thank you. All right, Patrick. Michelle, did you have a question? I, I do, I believe Patrick oh. is on mute. Yes. Oh, okay, well, Michelle, why don't you go ahead? 
Oh, uh, okay. Uh, good morning, Administrator, and, and thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that I, I too echo some of the concerns that have been raised uh, by the DOT. Um, my question uh, to you this morning is with regard to the safety of, of railroad employees, and similarly to Karen, I'm wondering if there's anything in the language specifically that stood out to DOT, or if this is just a general concern <clears throat> that DOT is highlighting for the STB to consider. It's, it's a, a general concern, and, and I do want to highlight one, one aspect of, of safety um, specifically. Uh, in terms of the FRA, we expect rail operations to be done every day on a, on a safe basis. Uh, and as my testimony highlighted, uh, there are daily operations that include access, interchange, and switching today. And uh, so it, it would not be something novel uh, for railroads. Uh, so that, that definitely is, is, is something that we're factoring in. Thank you. Administrator Bowes, uh, thanks so much for, for being here. You, in your testimony, alluded to issues at the port of uh, LA and port of Long Beach. And you know that is obviously container traffic, which is exempt from board regulation. Um, I, I'm wondering uh, to what extent do you see the proposed rule affecting intermodal traffic, uh, particularly uh, at the ports that you mentioned? Uh, as far as I know, um, I, I don't know of any specific instances uh, related to intermodal traffic and reciprocal switching. Uh, it would depend on, on the shipper. Uh, but I, I wanted to highlight that specifically because um, the audience that I have, I don't have access to every day, uh, like the board members today and all of you here. Uh, I just wanted to highlight it because uh, we're coming out of the Chinese uh, Lunar New Year and, uh, and, and volumes are going to grow. And, and I highlighted ports around the country, uh, but you're right to bring up uh, Los Angeles and, and Long Beach uh, specifically. Uh, so I just wanted to, to note that. Thank you. And, and one more question for me is, you know, uh, DOT has obviously issued uh, recently a report um, on the supply chain generally. And um, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, railroads in their comments uh, discuss um, a view that switching might have local operational impacts, which then can spread throughout the supply chain. Um, in, in your testimony, um, uh, suggested interest in this topic. Um, I'm wondering what you make of, of that argument. Uh, on that, I think it's situation to situation. And again, at least from, from my knowledge and, and review of the material, uh, my understanding is this would apply to specific situations at specific locations uh, throughout the country. And so on that case by case basis, uh, in a sense, uh, the impacts of the wider supply chain, again, from what I know right now would, would be limited in a lot of respects. But again, FRA is here to help uh, you all, if you need it, to model that out. Thank you very much. And, and Amit, thanks very much for your uh, engagement with the board on this and other issues. All right, any other uh, questions from the board? Amit, thanks, thank you much, as always. I'm sure we will be in touch soon, uh, as always. Thank so. you so much. All right. Okay, we will now move on to panel one, uh, which consists of representatives of two organizations, the National Grain and Feed Association, Max Fisher and Tom Wilcox, and the coalition associations, which, um, well, I, I assume that uh, they will identify all the associations that they speak for. They're the ones we're all familiar with. Uh, represented by both Jeff Marino and Karen Booth of Thompson Hein. So are you all present? I thought I saw you all at the same table a few minutes ago. The uh, coalition associations are, are. are together here. Uh, NGFA uh, is separate. Okay. Uh, oh, so where is GFA, NGFA? They're different. Oh. We're on one of the screens. 
There you are, separate. Yeah. We're here. All right, so Max and Tom, are you together? Yes, yes we, we are. are. Okay. All right, we'll get, we'll get the hang of this eventually. All right, so uh, why don't you start off first, uh, Max or Tom or both, whoever's going to speak? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, Chairman Oberman, Vice Chairman Schultz, uh, board members, Dukes, Primus, and Hedlund. Uh, we're joining you from NJFA's annual convention that's uh, going on this week down in South Carolina. So um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, my name is Max Fisher, and I am the Chief Economist for the National Grain and, Grain and Feed Association. Um, here to my right is uh, Tom Wilcox, NGFA's Rail Transportation Council. Um, he's here to help and answer any questions that you might have. Um, the NGFA consists of more than 1,000 grain feed processing, um, exporting, and other grain-related companies that operate more than 8,000 facilities. Um, I'd like to begin by commending the board for resuming its work in this proceeding for the purpose of increasing rail-to-rail -rail competition through reciprocal switching arrangements. Many of NGFA's members are captive to one railroad and have little bargaining power in the absence of rail-to-rail -rail competition. Reviewing the board's precedents and rules governing reciprocal switching began with the petition for rulemaking filed in EP 711 by the National Industrial Transportation League in 2011. The NIT League's position was an outgrowth of the board's review of railroad competition, EP 705, where the board received evidence and testimony from NGFA and many other pointing out competition in the railroad industry had declined in the years after several ma major rail mergers. NGFA wholeheartedly supported the position's goals of revising the rules and precedent implementing 49 USC 111.02 to more closely reflect its pro-competitive purpose. NGFA continues to support the positions of the NITLIG and the Shipper Coalition in their filings in this proceeding and the NGFA supported the notice of proposed rulemaking published by the board in 2016. Since 2017, when NGFA submitted its last set of comments on the NPRM, the amount of grain transported by rail has been relatively steady, and the long-running trend of shuttering small train loading facilities and building larger facilities has continued. This combination of steady grain volumes and fewer but larger facilities is in part the outcome of the Class 1 roads changes to their operating plans caused by adopting the principles of so-called precision scheduled railroad. Meanwhile, the need for increased rail-to-rail -rail competition remains. The number and makeup of grain handling facilities is evolving, but the ability remains low to locate facilities in places where more than one railroad can provide service. For example, grain origination facilities stay reasonably close to farms to keep truck freight costs manageable for the first movement from field to storage. This means grain handlers often must build in areas that are captive to a single railroad. To summarize these trends, agriculture's suitability for alternative rail service through reciprocal switching has improved and its need for rail to rail competition remains. With respect to the 2016 NRPM, the NGFA maintains that several primary objectives should be reflected in the final rules the board issues. The first objective is to reaffirm the board's conclusion in the proposed rule that the anti-competitive act standard applied by the Interstate Commerce Commission in the MedTech case and other decisions should be reversed. Second, the procedures contained in the final rules should be as streamlined as possible so decisions on the establishment of reciprocal switching arrangements can be made without lengthy and costly administrative hearings. Third, the NGFA continues to urge the board to be adaptable and take into account the interchanges conducive to reciprocal switching can be established or reconstructed. The NGFA also commends the board, recommends the board accompany the final rules with a public process whereby existing and potential new interchanges eligible for reciprocal switching arrangements would be identified. Fourth, the NGFA, recently surveyed its membership, and now more than one half of its members' rail origin and destination facilities are located on a Class railway, 1 railway that is within 100 miles of a second Class 1 railway. Consequently, a determination in the final rules that 100 miles could be within a reasonable distance of interchange could potentially lead to increased rail-to-rail -rail competition for a significant portion of grand shippers. In any Max, case, Max, could I yeah. could you, yes, could you just give me that number again of how many shippers I just didn't hear? Um, just. So we did an informal survey 
Mr. Chairman. And uh, if we used 100 miles, NJFA found that it'd be well, it'd be well over half. Actually, it's 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 the vast majority of grain shippers would be eligible. Um, also, in case you're interested, if you use 30 miles, it would be it would be less than half, but it would still be beneficial for grain shippers, like on the whole. Okay, thank you. I just didn't hear the number. Go ahead. No problem. Um, in any case, the NGFA is very pleased that the board is simultaneously working to promulgate revisions to its rate reasonables, rate reasonables procedures for shippers and receivers that would be too far from an interchange to participate in reciprocal switching. Finally, the NGFA encourages the board to fashion workable and effective rules governing the compensation to be paid incumbent carriers in board-directed reciprocal switching arrangements. These rules should apply to cases where the board directs a reciprocal switch arrangement and the carriers cannot reach agreement on the conditions and compensation, and also cases where the board directs an arrangement and the carriers do reach agreement, but the shippers benefiting from the arrangement believe the agreed upon amount is unreasonably high. As for the appropriate pricing methodology, NGFA remains generally in favor of the access pricing methodology because it appears to have the potential for the board to develop and consistently apply a methodology that places rail carriers on a relatively level playing field to compete for business through reciprocal switching arrangements. However, the NGFA recognizes that developing such a methodology will likely be easier said than done. And so the NGFA is also open to the shipper coalition's modified SSW approach, which appears to have addressed some of NGFA's concerns with the board adopting that methodology. In conclusion, the NGFA encourages the board to maximize this opportunity to facilitate rail-to-rail -rail competition and allow both origin and destination rail customers to attempt to obtain alter alternative rail service via reciprocal switching arrangements. In a highly cons consolidated and largely captive industry, this may be the best opportunity to create some semblance of rail-to-rail -rail competition. The NGFA accordingly urges the board to act with all deliberate speed to promulgate final regulations in this proceeding. Um, thank you for your, for your attentiveness and uh, Tom and I would be happy to answer any questions if you choose to ask them now or if you'd rather wait till the end, we're perfectly fine with that as well. Uh, all right, thank you, Max. Uh, Tom, did you wanna add anything now or just be there for questions? I'm here for questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, should we go to the coalition associations and then we can open it up to questions for everybody? Why don't we do that? Um, so Max and Tom stand by, because I do have a few questions. I know others will too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, um, Jeff, are you, uh, Karen, who's starting off here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're, we're ready to go. Good morning. Go for it. Why don't okay. you, Karen, uh, for the record, identify the membership or there you put it on the screen. Thank you. Yes, yes. We're gonna we're gonna work through all that for you um, <laughs> okay. promptly <Thank> here. You. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Overman, Vice Chair Schultz, and board members Primus Fuchs and Headland. On behalf of the coalition associations, we thank you for conducting this hearing on the board's proposal to promote competition in the freight rail industry by expanding reciprocal switching arrangements. I'm Karen Booth. I'm a partner at Thompson Hine. With me is my colleague, Jeff Moreno, also a partner at Thompson Hine. And we serve as counsel <coughs> for the coalition associations. The coalition associations is comprised of the following five organizations. The American Chemistry Council, the National Industrial Transportation League, the Fertilizer Institute, the Corn Refiners Association, and the Chlorine Institute. Each of these organizations does have a representative available today and participating on this hearing. And we'd like to ask them to just do a very quick introduction. Three of those organizations are here with Jeff and I. We're gonna start with those three groups and then go to who's virtual. I'm Jeff Sloan, a Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at the American Chemistry Council. Eamon Monahan, Vice President of Environmental Affairs and Workplace Safety at the Corn Refiners Association. Hey, good morning, everyone. Justin Lockheim with the Fertilizer Institute. Thank you. Could we go to uh, Knitley, please? 
Good morning, everybody, and thank you for your time. This is Ross Corthell. I'm Vice President of Transportation for Packaging Corporation America, as well as the rail chair for the National Industrial Transportation League. And the Chlorine Institute. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board. I'm Michael McBride. I'm a partner at Van S. Feldman, outside counsel for the Chlorine Institute. I'm accompanied by Frank Reiner, the president of the Chlorine Institute. Good morning, I'm Frank Reiner. Thanks everybody. So Mr. Marino and myself and Mr. Sloan from ACC and Mr. Laukheim from TFI will present our testimony today, but all of the representatives of the coalition associations are available to answer your questions. Now, we note that none of you were serving in your current roles when the board first issued its reciprocal switching proposal in 2016. So our goal today is to answer your questions, address the points that you believe to be most important. Now we have requested and we will need 60 minutes to cover all of our prepared remarks, but that's a lot of material and a lot of time. And so we have planned to pause at certain times throughout uh, our testimony to answer questions while they're fresh in your minds, if that's your preference, uh, but we will have to be mindful of the clock. Now, the board has scheduled this hearing to update the record in its longstanding EP 711 docket. It has asked parties to address industry developments that have occurred since the board last received written submissions on its proposal back in 2017. And of course, to respond to ex parte meetings that have occurred between board members, some, some of you and some of your predecessors that have been held with various shipper and railroad stakeholders and others. And I think Mr. Chairman, as you noted right at the outset, EP 711 has a long history. Notably, since the board's proposal was first introduced in 2016, the board has received many thousands of pages of comments, analysis, expert testimony from shippers and railroads and other stakeholders, including government agencies and officials. And of course, as mentioned, the board has engaged in one-on-one -on -one meetings with both supporters and opponents of the rule. Those proceedings followed five prior years of extensive engagement over the initial reciprocal switching pose proposal made by Mitley, who petitioned the board over a decade ago in 2011, after then STB chairman Dan Elliott held a hearing on the state of rail competition in your EP705 proceeding. At that hearing and at that time, Chairman Elliott solicited industry solutions to address the rising rates, <clears throat> insufficient service, inefficiencies, lack of negotiating leverage, and other challenges involving captive rail customers and their service providers, and Nitley responded to that call. Ultimately, the board agreed that the 1985 reciprocal switching rules are not working. They fail to give meaning to the reciprocal switching statute in a way that's relevant to today's far more concentrated and profitable rail industry than existed 35 to 40 years ago. And of course, the board issued its own proposal, which remains pending to this day and is the subject of this hearing. In recognition of the long history of EP 711, the coalition associations very much appreciate the board taking this step toward a final resolution of this proceeding. We remain extremely confident that the voluminous record developed over more than a decade strongly demonstrates that the board's measured case-by-case -case approach to evaluating reciprocal switching requests is lawful, it's rational, it's justified, and it's workable with the minor modifications that we offered in prior comments when the board first issued its proposal. And we are not alone in our belief. Adoption of the board's reciprocal switching rules is strongly supported by the Department of Justice and the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Transportation, we just heard, has expressed its own concerns, quote, about the rail competitive landscape and its effect on captive shippers, unquote. And Mr. Chairman, you mentioned, of course, the Biden administration's executive order 13725, 
on promoting competition in the American economy issued last July, encouraging the board to complete this rulemaking and promote rail to rail competition. And of course, there's the thousands of companies across this nation from many industries who depend on competitive and efficient rail service to meet their business needs and the needs of their customers, but who operate facilities that are captive to only one railroad. Now, as we begin our testimony, we want to urge you to consider the following five key points. Number one, the reciprocal switching statute and its legislative history reveal that Congress intended for reciprocal switching to be used as a tool to enhance rail competition to address railroad market power. Number two, the record demonstrates there is a strong need to expand reciprocal switching at captive shipper facilities that qualify under the board's proposal. Number three, the board has the authority and the discretion to change its 1985 reciprocal switching policy that is clearly outdated in 2022, and it can adopt these proposed rules today. Number four, the board has articulated rational justifications for the proposed rules that remain as strong today as if not stronger than they existed in 2016. And number five, the rail industry's apocalyptic predictions for rail operations and investment are predicated upon inaccurate, exaggerated, and unrealistic scenarios. Now, for the most part, <clears throat> we believe that there's nothing in the record that's been recently provided to you that changes anything from where we've been. For the most part, what the rail industry has done is pile on more testimony from economists who largely repackage and restate the arguments already in the record. To the extent they present new analysis, it's nothing that could not have been presented previously and they essentially are seeking a second bite at the apple, contrary to the purpose of this hearing. Now, some witnesses do reference current supply chain issues. Uh, DOT has referenced that as well. And we have already refuted that as being a reason not for you to move forward in our written testimony. And we will address that again today. But ultimately the railroad opposition depends on two flawed assumptions that they've relied on throughout this proceeding. First, the current rail markets are perfectly competitive and the free market already disciplines their behavior. And second, that reciprocal switching will cause severe operating disruptions and efficiencies. We have refuted that before and we will refute that again today. Unfortunately, the railroads failed to offer the board any constructive feedback as to how this board should implement a new reciprocal switching policy that makes sense in today's highly concentrated and profitable rail industry, but instead they continue to drill down on the problems of operational impacts that we believe are designed to freeze this board into indecision and preserve the status quo. But preserving the status quo only serves the railroad self-interest and not the broader public interest which of course is expressly encompassed within the reciprocal switching statute itself. So with that, we'd like to start turning now to some of the more specific arguments that have been made by the rail industry. And of the many positions that they take in this proceeding, the claim that quote, reciprocal switching is a solution in search of a problem quote, is perhaps the most revealing because it underscores best why we are sitting here today. In truly competitive markets, the old age business mantra, customer is king, applies. And that is not to say that customers should dictate everything in a relationship, but it's as simple as when you purchase a service and perhaps that service is not meeting your satisfaction, you should have alternatives and options. But here, the railroads brazenly ignore the detailed commentary from their own captive rail customers of all stripes who are seeking the opportunity to improve rail transportation efficiency, service rates and practices through competition, not board regulation. 
The railroads claim that this proceeding is only about rates, but this is easily refuted from a review of the record. Are rates an issue? Yes. Are rates the only issue? Clearly, no. Rather, this is a calculated attempt to sidestep the reciprocal switching statute and limit shippers' remedies to costly and unworkable rate litigation at the board. Now, it's significant when we look at the statute, the Staggers Act separated rate remedies from competitive access. They are in distinct sections of the statute. They are governed by completely distinct statutory text, and they serve distinct purposes. The legislative history of the Staggers Act unequivocally established Congress intended for reciprocal switching to be that tool to encourage competition. And in recognition of the many benefits that flourish from competition beyond rates. The thousands of companies represented by the coalition associations want the competitive market to solve their rate and service issues. And so with that, I do wanna just turn briefly to Jeff Sloan and give him a chance to outline why there is such a need for reciprocal switching and the competition that it will bring. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of ACC member companies. For our industry, the need for additional railroad competition is clear. Our companies see meaningful benefits where reciprocal switching is already available, and the board's proposed rule presents new opportunities to obtain these benefits at additional production sites. Without a doubt, ACC members hope that this added element of competition will help to moderate rail rates. However, um, just uh, company testimony submitted for this hearing shows that reciprocal switching can also improve the efficiency of routes and help to alleviate rail service concerns. One of our member companies, Indorama, highlights their experience with inner switching at Canadian facilities. They note that since exercising this option in 2018, they have been able to obtain more reasonable rates. Not only has switching not degraded service, competing railroads have been more responsive to service needs. In one case, Indorama obtained an additional service day to a highly congested junction, helping to maintain supply flow and decrease the bunching of rail cars. Without competition from a second railroad, this crucial service need would likely have gone unfulfilled. Another ACC member, Lionel Bissell, highlights their experience at U.S. facilities with access to reciprocal switching. The company has used switching to change routing to alleviate service disruptions on numerous occasions. This has helped reduce the size of Lionel Bissell's private rail car fleet and the associated infrastructure needs. It also avoids the need for emergency truck shipments to sustain customer op operations during service disruptions. The benefits of reciprocal switching are so significant that Lionel Bissell has made capital investments to add 2,200 storage and transit car spots across four of their facilities to allow access to competitive service options. Dow Chemicals testimony highlights the potential efficiency benefits that they stand to gain from reciprocal switching. Railroads route traffic from Dow's captive facilities hundreds of thousands of unnecessary miles each year. In particular, Dow's Louisiana facilities are close to New Orleans, where the UP interchanges traffic with Eastern carriers. However, UP routes the majority of Dow's gateway traffic to East St. Louis, resulting in excessively long routes for some customers in the Eastern US. Access to competitive switching could eliminate a large portion of this unnecessary mileage. Dow also testifies that when a railroad does not have the resources to handle traffic levels, reciprocal switching would allow them to shift some traffic to another carrier to alleviate service challenges. And I, as, as a final point, I wanna emphasize that while ACC members eagerly await the opportunity to seek competitive service, their testimony demonstrates that they intend to be selective and thoughtful at where they request reciprocal switching. Like other shippers, they have a strong incentive to seek switching only where it does not create inefficient movements or impair rail service. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And of course, each of the uh, association. Jeff, Karen, Patrick had a quick question for Jeff. Uh, I, a question for uh, 
all the panelists that have spoken so far. Um, I, I'm just sort of wondering, is it your contention that the current rules, um, and, and particularly in light of the mid-tech precedent, um, do not allow for uh, a switching order when a complaint um, demonstrates inadequate service? I, th I think it's not an effective remedy to address the rail service problems. Um, yeah. But if a complainant were to show there was inadequate service, they could potentially win a switching order under the current rules. The current rules do permit that, but they also have to show anti-competitive use was associated with that. Uh, and frankly, the way the current rules are structured, it would be uh, very selective. Uh, the plaintiff uh, would have to wait until the rail service problem occurs, which is simply not practical. That's another reason why the board's emergency service orders have not been used uh, at, during this time. And that's even a faster, more effective way to, uh, uh, to get alternative service. Reciprocal switching puts everything in place ahead of time so that when the problem occurs, the response can be immediate. Otherwise, it does no good. Jeff, I want to make sure I'm understanding your point. Um, are you saying that, um, you know, when you show that, to show that a carrier has acted anti-competitively, that the inadequacy of service is not sufficient evidence to show that the carrier has uh, acted anti-competitively, but you would agree that it is powerful evidence of that fact? Uh, I do agree it's palpable evidence. And perhaps it, even if it is uh, adequate in and of itself to obtain uh, an alternative routing, my point really is that it's too late if you wait until after the service is inadequate. The point of reciprocal switching is being able to respond in real time to these service problems. Otherwise, it's really a, uh, a meaningless remedy. Right. Well, I, I want to separate, though, the timing versus if the, the inadequacy of service has occurred, what is it that makes the uh, uh, getting the remedy so challenging? So suppose, for example, a, the complainant could show that a carrier was providing inadequate service. What would be the barrier to the shipper getting a remedy? Uh, to getting a reciprocal or a through route or a reciprocal switch uh, remedy? To, to getting a reciprocal switching remedy. Uh, the barrier is really the need to bring the case uh, in, and the need for immediate relief. It's a timing issue, mo mo most of all. Well, so and I, I would add to that, Patrick, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but <clears throat> I think just historically, and again, uh, the way those prior precedents have existed, there was a burden to show more of a competitive abuse in conjunction with the inadequacy. And so that standard has been problematic. Um, and, and that's sort of the point here, right? That standard that was set, you know, 35 years ago imposes that higher burden. And the inadequacy is, you know, could be redefined, I guess you could even under the current rules, but that doesn't eliminate the um, additional problems that, you know, go along with all of the prior precedent. Well, I, I wanna, I wanna Marty, if I could just tease this out for a second. Let's go ahead. Um, Cause I, I wanna, I want to separate what's under mid tech versus the rules, but I just want to make sure I'm clear on this point. You know, the the circuit court that reviewed mid tech said that evidence of a carrier's actual conduct, such as the adequacy of service it provides to a captive shipper, is the most direct and probative evidence um, by which to say whether the carrier has acted anti-competitively. So I, I guess I'm still missing what is it that the shipper needs to show in addition to inadequate service to get the remedy. Is there any other? Uh, inadequate service and some degree of market power, but not market dominance, but some degree of market power. What else does the shipper need to, to, to do to meet the standard? Again, setting aside the timing issue, Jeff, I, I, I hear where you're coming from on that, but I'm just talking about meeting the standard. What, what else to show anti-competitive if that's, you know, if that is, as the uh, circuit court said, the most direct and probative evidence? Yeah, I think that's difficult for us to say because it's never there's never been a circumstance where the board has granted any reciprocal switching under that. So a lot of shippers simply aren't certain. We know the board has identified in hypothetically price squeeze, foreclosure. Really, foreclosure is the issue we're trying to address here, the foreclosure of downstream competition. But that's occurring. The very fact of the long haul statute constitutes foreclosure. Well, Jeff, you know, the 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 the, the actions that you took 
or that, that you cited are some of the items that the ICC said could show anti-competitive, but then in the next sentence, it said also inadequacy of service. And you know, when the circuit court reviewed it, it specifically looked at the adequacy of service. It looked at what MidTech alleged, uh, circuitous routing, but, but it said that you know, at the end of the day, MidTech requested that routing. Uh, failure to supply adequate cars, but, but MidTech didn't make the request. Um, and then that, that coal facility, uh, coal had to be trucked in, but um, you know, uh, MidTech didn't have rail facilities for coal. Those weren't, it, so it wasn't that MidTech couldn't show an adequate service. It was just that the particular way they tried to show an adequate service was not strong enough evidence because of problems of their own. But it, it, I, I guess I'm missing, um, you know, if, if you had a situation where say a chemical shipper showed that a railroad was habitually providing the wrong cars or missing switches, what under MidTech and the existing rules would stop a shipper from providing that evidence and using that as the most direct and probative evidence to show uh, uh, anti-competitive behavior? I, I don't think there's anything that would prevent the shipper from presenting that evidence. The qu big question mark is would that evidence in and of itself be sufficient? But, but there's nothing in MidTech that, that would say that it wouldn't be. There's nothing either way, you know, uh, that it would or it wouldn't. It just well, says, let, let me, let me ask right, Thank you. you. Sorry, Marty, thanks for your indulgence. That's okay, Patrick. I, I'm, I'm a little bit lost here. Uh, for Patrick or Karen, we've had a lot of complaints about poor service <laughs> uh, recently, mostly resulting from crew shortage, missed switches, late deliveries. Do you imagine that the railroads, if you put on a case that said, look, our shipper's getting bad service, there's, there's no crews, they're missing switches, our services are delayed, late and rested, that you have proven that the railroad was anti-competitive or just that the railroad was understaffed or incompetent? I mean, uh, I'm not sure why just the bad service proves anti-competitive intent as I read mid-tech, you have to show that they are trying to forestall competition as opposed to just being unable to run their own railroad. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we agree that 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 is how we interpret the mid-tech decision as well. Obviously, with that higher burden of showing there's anti-competitive intent in performing the way they do, as opposed to just... Um, incompetence, negligence, poor planning, whatever the, you know, other alternatives may be. Well, I think we'll have some fun asking the railroads attorneys if they think the shipper can rest after putting on evidence of poor service. I, I, have, to, I have to jump in here, Marty. Yeah. Where is intent? Um, I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, the, where, where is intent in that mid-tech decision? Um, you know, I, I, isn't the fact that there's just inadequate service shown that I think I think what MidTech stands for is if there's inadequate service, it shows that that is one of the ways that monopolist typically behaves, either through raising rates or or through providing bad service. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I'm still missing what 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 of the intent uh, part of the standard. I mean, wh where is that? Um, wh what does MidTech describe in order to show intent beyond inadequate service? Well. Uh, this is an interesting debate that maybe we could have. I would just say that by definition, the railroad that's involved here is a monopolist. Otherwise, the shipper wouldn't be in there asking for reciprocal switching. So it would seem to me that mid-tech requires that the railroad be something more than a monopolist by definition. Otherwise, everybody who was sole served would be automatically entitled to reciprocal switching under mid-tech. You have to show that they're acting in a way to forestall other competition. They've already forestalled competition by being in existence as a monopolist. So whether you have to show intent in some kind of usual legal sense or some other activity, just being sold the, a, a monopolist doesn't, uh, uh, to my way of thinking, wouldn't satisfy the mid-tech standard. No, right. I, I'm suggesting that inadequate service is what MidTech said, you know, MidTech and the, the circuit court said was the, the most direct and probative evidence. And when we're talking about why the bar is so high, clear, which is one of the, I think, underlying prerequisites for why we're engaged in this rulemaking, I think it's 
very important for us to get absolute clarity on what makes the bar so high. I, I don't disagree. I guess all I would say is, is that I read those statements by the MidTech Court of Dicta since they held they hadn't proved inadequate service. So we don't know how much inadequate service would have satisfied the court or for that matter, the board uh, going yeah. forward. And the one thing that seems clear from what Jeff and Kat, uh, Karen are saying and what other lawyers have said is the bar has assessed the fact that these cases can't be proven and that's why they aren't brought. We've heard that repeatedly, which is pretty powerful evidence of a, of a, high, a high hurdle, seems to me. Karen, well, and I, I, I do think, I think that's right. And, and that's, you know, as we know, there's been no recent cases. So we, we're talking about, you know, four cases that were basically decided back when these rules first were put into effect. And, and Patrick, you know, there's not clarity on what the burden of proof is for inadequate service. I believe it, you know, there, that is a little bit of a, of, a, of a question, but in each of those other four decisions, the denials otherwise are clear. And so, you know, obviously we're trying to address the whole package here. And so we don't, there, there is not a recent ruling on this and maybe this board would decide that differently, but there's no question that the bar in all of those prior decisions was set so high, there's never been relief granted under this statute or the rules. And you know, maybe, obviously maybe, that's why uh, we're here. Maybe one way of thinking about it is that in the uh, other service rules, 1147, there is no mention of anti-competitive impact. There's a mention only of bad service as the standard. And under those rules, service problems probably are sufficient if you could make that showing. Whereas the mid-tech rule expressly requires an anti-competitive showing. Karen had her hand up. Um, yes, uh, for Karen to maybe move over to the more practical realities uh, as opposed to the legal issues, which as a lawyer, I find fascinating. But um, could you talk about you know, what the actual obstacles are to the shippers bringing a case? Uh, are they concerned about the legal standard or the cost or the time or impairing whatever good relationships they have with their incumbent uh, carrier? And would uh, establishing a new rule uh, actually induce better relationships because uh, uh, they wouldn't have to bring a case. Uh, the, the railroads would be more responsive to a request for uh, voluntary reciprocal switching. Uh, I think you've hit on uh, that perfectly. I mean, I think it's all of the above. Uh, there's no question that as we've said from the outset, the, the bar of competitive abuse which is what the current standard is for reciprocal switching has never been met. And there's no question that to try and deal with that, given that history of the four cases I mentioned that we never, no relief has been granted. That was obviously, those are cases that had led to no other shipper even trying once those four cases shot everything down. And that of course was a very different time uh, than we have today. And so shippers are frankly not gonna Try to bring those cases. They don't think they can win them, and they're not going to invest the legal fees, the time, the expense to try to win something that, frankly, they believe is not winnable. Um, yeah, if I can, if I could add, um, or NGFA's members, it's um, there's a uh, fear of retaliation. There's the, the cost and time, as you said, um, and so to. Shippers in general are reluctant to bring cases to the STB for a variety of reasons. And so when they do, it's, it's important that they have clear standards you know, uh, to follow and so they can judge the, the outcome um, or potential outcome. And in, in the case of the competitive abuse standard, it's you know, 30 years of, of this standard uh, sitting out there, which does, um, the, you know, the four cases that have been decided, um, it requires something in addition to bad service. It, it requires a um, you know, some sort of intent, which is very hard to prove, as Vice Chairman Miller called it, you know, the smoking gun. Um, so um, I would agree with Karen and, and Jeff on that. 
And if I can just add in here, I, I don't want us to lose sight of the competitive forest for the service tree in, in this example. The ultimate goal of reciprocal switching is the enhancement of competition, of which one of many benefits from enhanced competition is the ability to uh, respond more quickly to service problems. But there are many other benefits. Uh, we've also talked about uh negotiating service terms and contracts, uh, having more leverage, a more level playing field when it comes to negotiating contracts. And of course, there's the rates that everyone has talked about as well, but there's no guarantee that any of this occurs without competition. And what we're trying to do is allow the market to make those decisions uh, and not the, uh, the regulator. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe just kind of Picking up on this point a little bit and then moving on, um, yeah. you know, it's very clear that the rail industry is very wedded to competitive abuse. And that tells you something in and of itself. I mean, they basically are telling this board, you don't have discretion. You, you've got to keep this standard. This is what you're obligated to keep for a variety of reasons. And that's, in our view, uh, ridiculous uh, because, of course, the statute itself does not mandate the competitive abuse standard. We, we all looked at the reciprocal switching statute. It's very broad. It's very flexible. You know, you just have to be able to find that the arrangement is practical and in the public interest, or it's an alternative or necessary to provide competitive rail service. And of course, we believe that competition has to exist for it to be abused, but, but not, not being uh, too slight here. I mean, under the board's proposal, only traffic that would benefit from reciprocal switching is traffic for which there is no competition at the origin or destination. So, so we're not talking about where competition exists, that there's got to be captivity shown under the board's proposal for the shipper to bring a case. And the structure of the reciprocal switching statute and the legislative history, which we've touched on, but it's you know, very detailed in all of our findings, provides this board with very broad discretion to modify this policy and basically find, as, as you have, that the competitive abuse standard is outdated today. Car now, Karen, the Karen, let me, Karen, just to be clear, are you saying that in your view, under the statute, a... Um, to be eligible for reciprocal switching, you have to be in a captive situation at both ends. We're not saying that under the statute, but we're saying that's the board's proposal. That was the okay. NIT League's proposal, and we agree with that. Okay, thank you. Just wanted okay. to be clear. Thank you. Yep. yep. Uh, Karen, now, can I just go back for a moment um, to a statement that was made earlier about the concern about retaliation. I wondered if, in, if you or any of your colleagues could speak to how the proposed rule uh, would address that, that fear, or is it just the fact that, that shippers would have a, a higher likelihood of prevailing under the proposed rule as compared to what it exists today? Yeah, I, the, the, the board's proposal doesn't expressly address retaliation, Michelle. I mean, that's a judgment that any shipper is gonna have to make when it chooses to bring a case uh, before the board. But I think certainly when the outcome of a case is competition that might motivate at least some captive shippers who think they can meet the standards of the rule to pursue that just because those benefits of competition would have hopefully, you know, such a big effect and not having to come to the board for a rate prescription or for other litigation, but rather to allow them to use those alternative carrier options to deal with rates and service. So it, it doesn't address retaliation specifically. There may be some shippers who choose not to come forward for that reason, even after the board adopts the rule, but we certainly think there will be others who would benefit and would and would give it a go. Yeah, and let me, if I could reinforce, since I'm the, uh, the one who mentioned the retaliation, um, it, the retaliation fears come when there, there's consideration of a formal proceeding, you know, um, whereas if you, if the board has pro-competitive -com policies in place where, where there's commercial solutions outside of the board by because you've got a good a valid regulatory backstop then the fear of retaliation drops considerably 
Tom, I want to speak to uh, the regulatory backstop and perhaps the distinction between the proposed rule as it compares to what's in existence today. In terms of the regulatory backstop? Yes, and how, how it differs. Well, there is really no backstop for uh, reciprocal switching orders or receiving a reciprocal switching order. And so, so therefore um, there is very little leverage for um, commercial um, solutions. You know, there's no threat, real threat to a reciprocal switching um, in terms of going through the board's processes. So the proposed rule would we believe provide that backstop because it provides a more realistic path with, that adheres to the statutes, you know, pro-competitive intent uh, to have reciprocal switching in place. And so when, when that real threat or possibility is there, then you have a greater chance of having uh, commercial solutions. Thank you. You know, I have to I have to circle back because I think it is really one of the most essential points. You know, Tom, you alluded to a smoking gun. And just reading from MidTech, MidTech says that they were attentive to the uh, classical categories of competitive abuse. And that's when they say foreclosure that. And we also considered whether there was any uh, uh, evidence of abuses under the competitive standards of the RTP including inadequate service or excessive prices under either approach. And so I, I'm wondering, and, and maybe not to put you on the spot, but at some point during the panel, could somebody kind of show me very clearly uh, where, um, the, where MidTech provided that uh, there needs to be something more be, be, besides inadequate service in some degree of market power? Not a, not a market dominant standard, but some degree of market power and adequate service. It, it would be helpful if, if you know, evidence that the carrier intended to provide an adequate service for some sort of you know, competition rigging purpose. If that's what MidTech stands for, I'd like, I'd like to hear it directly because Karen, to your point, I think what I'm hearing is the bar is central to the practical reality. So I don't think you can disentangle the two. We have to understand what exactly shippers view is the bar. Okay. Well, okay. Well, we can address your question in due course. It's just that, you know, we've had those, you know, the initial cases starting with MidTech, starting with the regulations, and you had not only the MidTech case, you had other cases where shippers tried to meet that standard, tried to see where the bar was, and nobody ever reached the bar. And so um, it was, you know, the, the overall conclusion after that was that the bar is unreachable without this type of in, right. uh, intent. But, but there are different approaches. One is you could clarify what's required under MidTech. Second is you could overrule MidTech and just rely on the regulations, which have different language, which has different language than MidTech. You could arguably, arguably say that MidTech was even narrower than the regulations, which you could argue is are even narrower than the statute. So you could not change the rules, but overturn MidTech. You could interpret MidTech such as providing more clarity to shippers about what evidence would be sufficient to show an adequate service, or you could change the rules. And so there's a there's <clears throat> options here, and we have to tease out what is causing the problem in order to, to figure out what exactly is the best option, I think. Understood. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of pick back up. We were talking about the board's discretion to, to change the competitive abuse standard. And I guess we just did want to focus very quickly on at least how we interpret the railroad's position, which is that your discretion is, is too, you know, is very narrow and that, that you really don't have much wiggle room to do that. We've talked about why we disagree from a statutory perspective, but they also rely upon another statutory provision, <clears throat> of course, the long haul statute that, um, you know, they really talk about the origin carriers almost right to the long haul under 10705A2, but they don't really focus on what we think is the most salient aspect of that statute. And that is that Congress expressly created 
a reciprocal switching exception to the long haul statute. And so obviously that's incredibly important when you're evaluating those arguments. <clears throat> um, and you know, I think the point of that is there was a recognition that despite the fact that the origin carrier has this, there's sort of this general favoritism toward that long haul, there was a recognition that the board would need to exercise discretion and draw those lines where it's more, you know, in certain cases where it's appropriate to promote competition and not only allow that long haul statute to, to take effect. <clears throat> and, you know, of course, and this gets a little bit, Patrick, to I think the debate we're having, you know, the board drew lines in a very different place. It was the ICC, of course, back in, you know, 1985, where the, the, the discretion was exercised to apply reciprocal switching in very limited circumstances. It created that high bar that we're debating here uh, to allow the railroads to engage in differential pricing over a larger volume of captive traffic. But that made sense in 1985. There were more than 30 class one railroads at that time. They were grappling with bankruptcies. There was financial distress. None of those carriers were revenue adequate. So we believe today the board is justified in making reciprocal switching more accessible based on these significant changes. We're gonna you know, get into those a little bit more detail um, <clears throat> and that you should draw the lines in a different place. And again, reciprocal switching allows competition to function where it already exists. Uh, we're not, you know, that competition's there, but it, it's just being foreclosed. <clears throat> now, the other point of that is the railroads like to call this artificial competition, but it's, it's quite real. And the statute, again, <clears throat> gives the board the authority to, to determine where to bring that out. Um, it reciprocal switching allows competition along that route to solve rate and service issues and maximize efficiency. And of course it reduces the need for regulatory protection in a rate case over that entire long haul movement and would limit your regulation just to the bottleneck portion. So it shrinks the need for board oversight by allowing competition to set rates, you know, create those efficiencies, spur innovation, lead to better contracts, all those broad benefits. <clears throat> the rail industry likes to rely upon more generalized studies, uh, the Christensen report, to talk about things are already very robustly competitive, but we've um, been able to point out some problems with those studies in terms of they look at aggregate data, um, you know, the studies include uh, competitive traffic and don't focus on really the most important subset of captive traffic, which is, of course, what we're talking about here. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of those arguments, but it is important to, to note when, when you're evaluating those arguments. And so with that, <clears throat> we were going to pause here for Q&A, but I think in the interest of time, and we've had a, a dialogue going, uh, I think, Jeff, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Karen. The rail industry has presented extensive testimony from multiple economists on many uh, different issues. The conclusions presented, however, are only as valid as the underlying assumptions. The, the most significant of these assumptions that pervades nearly every railroad witness's testimony is the projected scope of the proposed rules in terms of the volume of traffic that will be affected. That single assumption affects all the arguments with respect to revenue, investment, and operating impact assessments. By grossly misrepresenting the volume of traffic affected by the rules, the railroads and their witnesses similarly overstate all of these other impacts. The railroad industry is wrong to equate reciprocal switching as a statutory right with switching on demand. Shippers still must satisfy one of the two prongs uh, that, that are required to grant switching only to the most deserving of traffic. The prong one public interest standard requires a comprehensive cost benefit analysis among its three factors. This permits consideration 
of the men of any of the many detriments that the railroads allege will result from reciprocal switching, especially the impacts of a switch that has on the potential to create inefficiencies by increasing car handling or requiring switching where it currently does not occur. For this very reason, prong one is likely to be invoked sparingly where the switch truly enhances efficiency. Moreover, if a requested switch in the prong one is less efficient, there will have to be significant offsetting benefits for the board to grant such a request. Prong number two requires the equivalent of a market dominance showing. <clears throat> market dominance requires the shipper to prove the absence of effective inter and intramodal competition. Furthermore, because market dominance is lane specific, prong number two would have to be satisfied for individual movements in each origin destination pair. As demonstrated in ex parte 756, where the board adopted <laughs> rules on streamlined market dominance presentations, market dominance showings are complex. And by the way, those streamlined rules would not apply to the showing that has to be made under prong two. Thus, prong two is likely to be invoked only with the most compelling facts, and even then only where the volume of traffic merits the shipper's time and investment to pursue a reciprocal switching case. Now, the AAR in both its prior testimony and its most recent testimony has submitted a waybill study of what it calls potentially eligible reciprocal switch traffic. Potentially eligible is a pretty loaded term. I mean, you're either eligible or you're not, not just potentially eligible. That show, demonstrates that AAR is casting the widest net possible to create the misimpression that reciprocal switching will be widespread. AAR's analysis is meaningless, however, because it is not representative of a realistic universe of qualified traffic that will request and then use reciprocal switching. As a threshold matter, the AAR's updated Waybill stu study suffers from the same critiques we presented of the original study because it uses the same methodology which causes it to overstate even the potentially eligible universe of traffic. But let's put aside those criticisms for, uh, for a moment here. Uh, even accepting the AR analysis at face value, the measure of potentially eligible traffic is meaningless because shippers will not pursue or the STB will deny the vast majority of potentially eligible switches identified by the AAR. It, those will not occur because for many different reasons. One, the shipper may not be able to satisfy either prong one or prong number two. Number two, the shipper's traffic may be insufficient to justify the time, cost, and burden of a reciprocal switch case. Number three, the switch fee itself may be too uncertain for the shipper to bother bringing a case. And finally, an inefficient switch will be undesirable due to, to a, for a shipper due to its impact upon other costs for the shipper, such as rail car ownership and inventory costs. The rail industry throughout this hearing has not explained why shippers would choose routings that are less efficient, that such choices would be widespread if they should occur, or why the board itself could not reject such switching requests under the proposed standards. Frankly, the most significant conclusion in the AAR's updated waybill analysis is that less than 10% of all potentially eligible traffic entails the most likely switch scenarios, which are in also the most efficient switch scenarios. Those are switches that change the location of an interchange without increasing the number of car handlings. Those are switches at existing interchange locations, which occur via existing operations with existing crews and equipment, where the switch traffic is merely incremental to other traffic already interchanged between the rail carriers. Of that 10%, the traffic volume still must be sufficient to, uh, to justify pursuing switching. The shipper still must satisfy prongs one and two. And finally, the shipper must actually choose the alternate railroad all before any rail car actually is switched. In 2013, 
NITLE submitted an impact analysis to the board of its proposal, showing that just 4.6% of rail cars were likely to be affected. Because the NITLE proposal applied objective criteria that were easy, or it made it very easy for a shipper to identify its eligibility and claim reciprocal switching automatically. The impact analysis associated with the NITLE proposal would be greater than any impact affected by the board's proposal. Thus, it is reasonable to conclude that the AAR's own analysis demonstrates that the true universe of reciprocal switching will be less, probably much less, than the 10% of all rail traffic that AAR identifies fits within the most efficient switches. The bottom line is that AAR's analysis of potentially eligible traffic is irrelevant and meaningless because that is a far larger number than qualified traffic, which itself is larger than the amount of such traffic that actually will request reciprocal switching, which in turn is larger still than the volume of traffic that actually will use a switch. Once one takes a more rational and realistic view of the likely scope of reciprocal switching, it is obvious that the rail industry's hypothesized operating apocalypse is built on a house of cards. There is far less traffic at stake than the universe that the railroads claim. Nearly all those switches will occur at locations where interchange operations already exist. And just because the board may grant reciprocal switching does not mean that the incumbent will actually lose to traffic because the switch rate may be too high or the incumbent may offer better rate and service. Switches that increase car handling or require creation of new interchange locations will be disfavored by shippers due to the very inefficiencies that the railroads describe. And that is backed up by experience. The Canadian experience supports this fact. Where inner switching in Canada is virtually automatic, but very small percentage of the eligible cars actually are interswitched. Uh, there was analysis submitted in the pending merger of CP and KCS by uh, Dr. Robert Majure, the applicant's witness there. His empirical analysis showed that shippers, when offered a choice, prefer single line service, and the ability to offer fewer interchanges can significantly improve a railroad's ability to win the business of shippers and make a railroad service a more significant competitive force. And that's consistent with what the board has held in prior mergers that the public benefits of creating single line service were the major justification for approving those mergers. The railroads simply do not offer any explanation as to why shippers would flock to these allegedly inefficient interchanges. Despite recent rail industry focus upon the emergence of COVID related supply chain issues, those issues also do not alter the case for reciprocal switching. Railroads cite the COVID supply chain issues to illustrate vulnerability, supply chain vulnerabilities, and then to infer that reciprocal switching has the potential to cause the same types of problems or exacerbate the current problems. The potential to do either, however, exists only if shippers request and are granted less efficient forms of reciprocal switching. It's not an issue at all when reciprocal switching occurs at existing interchanges or as part of um, existing interchange operations. If a shipper makes such an irrational request, the board again can consider any such concerns when it reviews those individual switching requests. But probably most significantly, COVID-related supply chain issues are temporal and thus are not a reason to reject the proposed rules. Final adoption of any new rule realistically is a year or more in the future, and the first cases are even further down the road. If the COVID-related supply chain issue still exists when the board is presented with an actual case, it can factor any such impacts into its decision at that time. Because the rail industry has exaggerated the likely volume of reciprocal switching, they also have exaggerated the likely revenue and investment impacts. Differential pr pricing of switch traffic will continue to exist, but to a lesser degree for the subset of traffic that has reciprocal switching. That is because the resulting duopoly is not like a fully competitive market that prices 
to their marginal costs. Duopoly market power provides both carriers in a reciprocal switch with the ability to be disciplined in their pricing. The competing railroad has its own extensive infrastructure, for which it must be able to recover its own fixed and variable costs, plus it must pay a reasonable switch fee to the incumbent railroad, which, that will, which will be factored into the rate that the competing railroad offers. Thus, there's no reason to conclude of the railroad sphere that duopoly competition will entice, much less compel, either rail carrier in a switch arrangement to price even close to its marginal cost or below its total cost. As evidence of this very fact, I refer you to the testimony of a railroad economist in the CPKCS merger, Professor Stephen Salop, who is UP's uh, witness in the economic witness in that proceeding. At pages, at paragraph 66 to 67 of his testimony, explained very thoroughly the limits of duopoly competition. If marginal cost pricing were a realistic concern, one would expect the railroads to demonstrate that they currently already engage in marginal cost pricing on similarly competitive traffic, such as traffic with direct access or other traffic that does have reciprocal switching today. They have not done so. But yet, clearly, some degree of differential pricing has continued, even for that competitive traffic. Now, the rail industry, in their latest testimony, also attempt to undermine the STB's justifications for modifying the reciprocal switching rules. The first one is the effects of rail consolidation over the last three, three decades. The AAR attempts to rebut this justification with a waybill analysis to show the number of single served rail stations today is comparable to the number in 1992. But no one has claimed that reciprocal switching is needed because mergers created more single served locations. Indeed, the results of the AAR's analysis aren't all that surprising because the STB sought to preserve rail competition at all two to one locations and prior mergers. This is a straw man analysis created by the AAR that focuses upon the horizontal effects of mergers, whereas the proper focus is on the vertical effects. And the AAR cannot pretend to be enlightened by this statement. It's what we claimed in our comments back in 2017 it's what we claimed in all our ex parte meetings, yet the rail industry simply has ignored those claims. The vertical effects of rail consolidation over three decades have steadily and cumulatively extended the lengths of origin and destination bottlenecks and have facilitated the ability of bottleneck carriers to foreclose competition on downstream route segments. As bottlenecks grew longer, competitive segments necessarily grew shorter, making it easier for the bottleneck railroad to execute a price squeeze on the competitive segments. In prior mergers, the board invoked the so-called one month theory to conclude that there would be no anti-competitive vertical merger effects. The one month theory holds that because a bottleneck carrier is in a position to capture the entire monopoly profit, Integration with a connecting carrier on a competitive route segment normally does not enable that bottleneck carrier to raise the profit maximizing price as a result of that merger. Thus, for a movement from A to C, where one carrier has a bottleneck from segment A to B, and but two carriers compete between B and C, the board has held that a merger of the single AB carrier with one of the downstream BC carriers does not result in competitive harm because the bottleneck carrier already reached a monopoly profit for the entire A to C movement prior to the merger. But the board needs only to read the rail industry's own comments and request for conditions filed on February 28th in the pending CPKCS merger to comprehend the limits of the one lump theory. While all class one railroads raised foreclosure concerns to some extent in that proceeding, UP, BNSF, and CN are particularly strident. For the most comprehensive discussion of this problem, 
I again commend you to the testimony of UP's economic witness, Stephen Salad, in that proceeding, which thoroughly explains the probability of anti-competitive foreclosure resulting from past vertical mergers. He testifies that although the STB relied on the one lump theory as broadly accepted in economic circles when the last major mergers occurred in the late 1990s, he states the one lump theory, I quote, is not broadly accepted today, close quote, because it applies only under very limited market conditions. That comes from paragraph 21 of his testimony. Professor Salop also notes that the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission issued new vertical merger guidelines in June 2020 that did not adopt the one lump theory. He goes on to observe that pursuant to modern economic theory, unless both railroads pre-merger have perfect information about each other's costs and prices and, and are selling homogenous, undifferentiated products, Quote, foreclosure by the post-merger firm often is profitable and harmful to shippers. In paragraph 60, he states imperfect information and differentiated products are the norm, not the exception. Whether or not these essential conditions are satisfied for the one lump theory to apply will differ across movements and on merging railroads. Professor Salop notes that because carriers do not set uniform rates for all movements, a vertical merger can lead to a diversity of outcomes across commodity groups, routes, and specific shippers. He also goes on to state that the effects of a merger may differ across origin destination markets and commodities, even within a single origin destination market for a specific commodity the fact that the carriers do not set the same rate for every shipper and every movement means that a merger may harm some shippers while benefiting others with different demand characteristics on those on or whose shipments have different costs. Thus, the board's conclusions in prior mergers that there was no loss of competition from, uh, from vertical combinations were at worst completely wrong and at best, only partially correct for some traffic and wrong for all other traffic. Ultimately, it is not necessary to conclude that past mergers had anti-competitive vertical effects on every single affected movement. The fact that such impacts inevitably did occur on a multitude of movements and on a larger scale than previously imagined justifies the proposed rules. Rail, consoli rail consolidation is a rational justification to employ reciprocal switching as a tool to mitigate the cumulative effects of foreclosure from those prior mergers. Now, AAR also presents an analysis of truck competition to argue that there also is an abundant intermodal competition to rail. Uh, that analysis suffers from multiple flaws, of which the most notable are by measuring the revenue per ton mile across the entire rail industry, the analysis reveals nothing about the captive rail traffic. And I say that stands in stark contrast to prong number two of the board standard, which accounts for truck competition in the context of specific moves as part of a market dominance determination. And that is the relevant analysis. But also note that the measure of revenue per ton mile is misleading because revenue per ton mile decreases with distance. And it is particularly notable that the average haul length for the rail industry has increased by 56% from 1985 to 2020, thereby suppressing the revenue per ton mile in this graph that you see in the slide uh, from the AAR's analysis. Revenue per ton mile also doesn't reflect the shifting transportation costs from railroads to shippers over the past three decades, of which rail car ownership has been the most pronounced. For example, private rail car ownership is far more prevalent today 
than in 1995, uh, 1985, especially for the most captive traffic, as this slide shows. Now, this particular slide stops at 2013 because that's when AAR stopped publishing this information. However, if you refer to the rulemaking petition uh, in ex parte 768, that estimates the current level of private rail car ownership in North America at more than 73% of all rail cars, which is more than twice the rail car ownership percentage in 1985. This has depressed the revenue per ton mile showing that we saw in the previous slide and in the AR's analysis. The uh, AR truck rate analysis, however, is instructive in other areas. Uh, while truck rates have fluctuated with economic conditions, uh, the analysis shows that rail rates have not. Uh, although rail revenue per ton mile has risen uh, only slightly since 2004, it certainly would have been steeper, but for the cost shifting associated with rail car ownership. More significantly, however, revenue per ton file hides the fact that the rail industry has been able to exert since 2004, uh, hides the fact that the market power the rail industry has been able to exert since 2004. Uh, it's a more informative analysis is the inflation adjusted spread between revenues and operating expenses per ton mile. In 2008, the Christensen report observed that 2004 appeared to mark a pivotal change in railroad pricing that merited continued observation. Well, we're now 18 years beyond that. Uh, and that's proven quite prescient. From 1985 to 2004, this graph shows that changes in real rail operating revenue per ton mile track changes in real expenses per ton mile. Since 2004, real revenue per ton mile for railroads has increased 54% compared to only a 20% increase for rail expenses. Now, I'm sure that AR will be quick to point out that uh, Despite 29, uh, despite the increasing spreads, uh, since 2019, rail revenue per ton mile remains below 1985 even today. But remember that the railroads are also dramatically shifted car ownership costs during this time and increased the length of haul. Consequently, revenue in 2019 does not need to recover this major cost, and it is spread over a much greater distance. Taking this slide a step further, this shows the change in the inflation adjusted spread between revenue per ton mile and operating expenses per ton mile. And what is significant here is that there has been a 313% increase in that spread since 2004. And even since 1985, the increase in that spread has been 239%. So why did 2004 mark this dramatic shift? Well, I think it's important to note that the last major rail merger was approved by the board in 1998. That was the Conrail transaction. There were extensive service issues and integration took some time uh, to, uh, to resolve some of those service issues. Several years were also needed for legacy contracts to expire before the railroads could fully exercise their expanded market power. By 2004, we're now all, we're now clicking on all cylinders. The ability that these mergers created to observe market power was now in full force and we saw the railroads hit the accelerator and that's the steep increase that you now see in this graph. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Karen, who's going to talk about the financial and uh, justifications. Great, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> and of course, you know, what are the bottom line implications from, from all these market changes that Jeff has kind of worked through? That's that the rail industry's financial strength today relative to 1985 was another rational basis uh, for adopting the proposed rules that the board identified in its decision. The dire financial state of the rail industry in 1985, as we've already 
touched on, establish that need at that time for that exercise of differential pricing over the largest segment of captive traffic. And that's, of course, why the ICC adopted that very high bar, which we've been talking about, the competitive abuse standard in mid-tech. But the rail industry is much stronger financially today, and the board rationally concluded that it can and should achieve a greater balance between the different rail transportation policies that it administers and needs to find that reasonable accommodation. And the key issues here, of course, is balancing the policy to promote revenue adequacy and maximizing the reliance upon competition. Four class one railroads have been revenue adequate through an entire business cycle based on the board's own high bar. And we have detailed all of the history uh, over the past decade of revenue adequacy of each of the class one carriers. I'm not gonna walk through all that specifically, you have that information. But again, in contrast, in 1985, there were 32 class one railroads, none of which were revenue adequate. And of course, Wall Street metrics that we also attach to our written testimony as exhibit two, make an even more compelling case. Railroad finances have strengthened despite the pandemic and despite fluctuating traffic volumes. Therefore, as Congress envisioned in the Staggers Act, the board has proposed to employ reciprocal switching to remove obstacles to competition over that non-bottleneck segment where that competition already exists. Now, the railroad attempts to undermine the board's assessment uh, by comparing railroad finances to S&P 500 are irrelevant. Uh, there's been a lot of detail about that, of course, in the ex parte 766 comments, and we have reproduced some of that uh, in our written testimony showing that that's a, a very flawed uh, presentation. But regardless, the financial condition of rail shippers is not a relevant factor in the reciprocal switching statute and the competition, of course, uh, brings benefits well beyond just rates. <clears throat> and of course, we've touched upon reciprocal switching is needed to address non-rate issues, uh, providing shippers with the ability to access alternative carriers in response to service disruptions, which we heard uh, Jeff Sloan talk about earlier, uh, allowing traffic to be diverted to routes where the greatest ability is to handle it efficiently. Greater competition would require the railroads to consider the impacts of their operating decisions on their customers that today they can take for granted. Competition provides the incentives for railroads to negotiate with their customers. Uh, service terms and contracts, that's something that was very common shortly after the Staggers Act brought in contracts between carriers and their customer. And those have all but disappeared in most agreements today. And so I did want to turn briefly to Justin Blaukheim with TFI, who did just also want to touch on these non-rate benefits of reciprocal switching. Uh, Karen, before you do that, Patrick had a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Karen, in reference to your previous slide on revenue adequacy, you would agree, though, that the current rules explicitly state that uh, a railroad being revenue inadequate is not the basis for denying a switching order. Correct. Yes, we, we, and, we, we do. Yep. And would you also agree that even under, that's under the rules, but then the precedent, which again could be argued, is even more stringent than, than the rules could be argued. Um, is there anything in the precedent that would suggest that shippers need to show any evidence about a railroad's adequacy, uh, revenue adequacy? No, no, not that they have to show evidence. It was, it was a factor, Patrick. It was obviously a, a, an important factor that the ICC uh, looked to, of course, in reaching its uh, decision and where to draw the lines, where to create the standards, et cetera. I, I agree with your characterization about the ICC's emphasis on, on trying to protect differential pricing. I agree with that. I just wanted to be clear about what, you know, what's part of the bar and what's not. It's sort of picking up. That. So I appreciate that. Okay. I'm glad we're in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks, Karen. And, um, 
Hey everyone, this is just Justin Lockheim with the Fertilizer Institute. So um, appreciate the questions in the back and forth a lot. Um, I have a, a case example I'll, I'll just share um, and I'll begin reiterating a little bit of what uh, Karen, Jeff and others have, have stated, which is um, I think it's important to begin with the presumption um, that uh, should the board adopt uh, this proceeding and finalize it, I think it's more than reasonable to presume that it would work well. Um, it does work well in Canada. That's been discussed. Uh, TFI's members have extensive operations in Canada with the Canadian railroads, and it works very well up there. Um, they also have extensive operations and experience with a couple uh, unique locations in the United States where uh, reciprocal switching has been grandfathered into those uh, locations. Um, as was well documented in 2017, CSX uh, implemented uh, PSR, and I'm not trying to pick on CSX uh, for those with CSX who are watching right now, uh, but uh, it's illustrative. Um, you know, there was, there was a service meltdown, and uh, our, our one of our members has uh, two locations on the network where they were, um, have grandfathered situations where they can get reciprocal switching uh, today and back in 2017 and prior to 2017. And um, they exercised those, uh, uh, that ability in those locations during that service meltdown. They were able to switch some of the traffic to NS. And um, uh, that, was, that didn't completely resolve all of their problems with CSX. They have lots of other locations, but it was extremely helpful in those locations. Um, and that, to some extent, provided a little bit of a pressure relief valve there during, that, um, during those challenges. And, today, and to this day, uh, still does it in certain instances, as it does in Canada for our members. Um, so I wanted to kind of focus on, you know, just, just sort of cite that example. And I think as a general principle, I think, you know, the idea that I think everyone accepts that a little bit of competition injected into the rail marketplace is a positive way to, um, I'll, I'll just say, uh, perhaps uh, make the rail industry a little more customer focused. Um, it doesn't mean that our members are going to, uh, you know, jump all, trip all over themselves to, uh, to want to switch traffic all over the place. But um, as Jeff Moreno pointed out, uh, car ownership has, has radically shifted over the um, recent decades. And uh, for our members as well, those cars are being very inefficiently utilized right now for shippers. Those are shipper assets. And there's really not much incentive uh, given the lack of competition in the rail marketplace for those assets to be better utilized. Um, you know, and our, our members right now for fertilizer distribution, actually cycle times are down. Uh, our members, there's a lot of supply chain challenges. They're not able to move as much product right now because of poor cycle times. Uh, and so that's, that's just an ongoing problem. Um, if, if this rulemaking were finalized right now, it wouldn't completely absolve everything, but it would certainly be very helpful. And it has been, and it was in this particular case in 2017. So sorry, it took a little more time than I intended. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you, Justin. If, if you don't mind, I want to be back on, on uh, what Justin was talking about and, and sort of open it up to everybody else in the group. Uh, you know, you, Justin, you alluded to 2016 and, and not just CSX, but just PSR in general. And I, I'd like to, to gain a better understanding from the group um, if PSR has actually exacerbated or, or even accelerated the need for, for this. And uh, if you can you know, you know, explain uh, each of your reasons why you think that, that that's so. I would, yeah, I would definitely say it has, um, I think it's underscored the need for this. I, what I, I refer to this as, a, as an update to existing regulations that uh, govern reciprocal switching. So I think it underscores the need to modernize uh, the current regulations. I think it can be done. I think the way it's kind of laid out, I think the board members can carefully analyze case by case as laid out if they, if, you know, so as they, as they'd like, but yeah, PSR has definitely underscored uh, a greater need, I think today than, um, just five years ago. Anybody else want to comment on that? I, I would. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so like currently we have some shippers, you know, they're calling us and uh, telling us about uh, issues they're having with getting corn and so forth um, into their facilities. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're captive to one, one railroad and they had the option be able to do a switch with a nearby railroad, you know, that would help them out. So in the event that you have one railroad that's, uh, you know, suffering, uh, you know, having troubles for whatever reason, um, shippers would like to have the option to, you know, kind of have, have the ability to use another facility or another railroad. So um, that, that's, I guess, one of the main arguments from our standpoint is just that 
options are good. And especially when service is, is not the best, it's, it's very good to have options. So Max, just, just to follow up on that, so you, you, your, your folks are seeing, since uh, the introduction of PSR, you know, you've seen uh, you know, greater reasons as to why th this should happen. Is that, is that basically what you're, what, uh, you're hearing from your folks? So it's yes. than others? Okay. Yes. It, it, this is Jeff Sloan. I'd just reiterate that. I mean, I, I think our members see the, the increasing need for this. And I, I think it goes to the fact that, um, you know, you know, the decisions that go into how PSR is implemented and, and you know, the kind of um, reductions that are made to improve efficiency, there has to be a counterbalance of, you know, the ability to still meet the customer's needs. And if there's not a legitimate fear of losing that traffic, I think that alters the decisions uh, that are made as far as uh, investments in, in employment levels and, uh, and service levels. Mr. Primus, uh, this is Michael McBride. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I just wanted to add that uh, based on my experience with my shipper clients, it wasn't just PSR. You know, when they reduced crews and power, voluntarily, the board didn't make them do it, the shippers didn't make them do it. Then they did that again in COVID. And because of collective bargaining agreement issues or because of just general labor shortages, now they're having trouble getting enough crews. Those were actions they, they brought on themselves. Some of us didn't get rid of employees during COVID, the railroads did. And for that reason, if they've now created service problems for shippers and another railroad can provide some relief seems to me it's a strong justification for you to loosen up these reciprocal switching rules. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ross Quarthel with the National Industrial Transportation League. I would, I would add that the financial pressures that have come along with the implementation of PSR have really put a lot of pressure on the railroads you know, to scale in the event that there is some sort of uh, abnormal activity like a pandemic. And they were they were very quick to scale. And I would say that scaling was under the same pressure that they, they themselves created by the implementation and the expectations set under PSR of both physical and human resource uh, optimization. And, 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 you know, the, as we all know, the volumes came back faster than anybody expected. Uh, but the slack had been taken out based, based on the principles of PSR. Um, and so they just, you know, aren't able to recover. And to, to the chairman's earlier point, your own uh, customer assistance office has been inundated with phone calls. And this was discussed around the time that we were, we were talking about, you know, whether that precipitated any shippers actually seeking relief under this, the current set of rules. I would advocate that, you know, if there was ever, ever a time for shippers to pursue this, it would have been in the last 18 months, but they were so uh, skeptical of any kind of positive outcome that you just didn't see any action taken in the face of tremendous uh, service disruptions in, uh, in the U.S. supply chains um, caused by uh, the, the lack of human and physical resources needed to service the business. Well, I, I, again, if, if, uh, unless someone else has something to say, I, I'd like to follow up with that, uh, uh, Ross. I appreciate uh, those comments. And I want to open it again up to everyone. You know, we often hear the economic benefits of, uh, uh, of, the, of the railroads today, you know, PSR and everything that they're doing. Um, but, but what's the economic fallout for some of your membership? And again, it's for, for everyone as, as a result of, of uh, the conditions for us that you just described. I mean, you know, that to me is, is just as important. You know, their success is, is, is very important, but your success is, is just as important and it should be not cast aside what I'm looking at. So, you know, I see reciprocal switching as sort of that dire, you know, sort of life preserver that, that we're throwing out to help. And so, but I want to understand sort of that, you know, the economic situation that you guys are put in because of it. it, it uh, thanks, Board Member Primus. I would just, this is Justin again. I, it just, it varies by the member, but in, in a general sense, um, you know, you got 
uh, fewer days with pickups or uh, deliveries. Uh, I know I'm using some of my lingo probably inappropriate or using the wrong words perhaps, but I think you know what I mean. Um, uh, you, there's been issues with bunching or, you know, the, the chipper facilities where they are properly configured to deal with the new, the sudden change in uh, operate, sudden operational changes. I would generally say too with PSR implementation, um, I think a more customer focused rail industry would probably have rolled out PSR a good bit differently is my guess. Um, I think that at the moment, I, I'm sure rail labor would agree that um, uh, they, they shed far too much staff and they've, um, I think Ross was touching on it. Um, their operational elasticity is how I refer to it is now vastly diminished or non-existent. So every time there's a minor issue pops up and I don't want to say that every issue is minor. Uh, there's some serious issues that are, are, are real legitimate challenge for the rail industry. Let's take uh, the COVID pandemic, for example, or, or, or endemic or whatever we want to call it right now. Um, I don't mean to make light of it either. <laughs> um, that has affected, uh, just like TFI's members, uh, railroads have lost some staff because of the pandemic, because they, they got COVID. Uh, eventually they returned. But they don't have enough backup crews or backup staff uh, to provide, you know, um, I would say acceptable service levels. So in the first quarter of this year, our members, like to go back to cycle time, cycle times really is uh, seriously diminished right now. And so as we go into the spring season for, for planting, uh, our members are not able to pre-position uh, product for farmers uh, um, to the degree they need that it needs to be done. Um, and that's partly because they don't have enough rail cars that they own uh, because they're not getting their cars back in time to ship the same volume of product anymore. Um, they can't always, you know, you, you know, the question I guess becomes is how many millions of dollars should shippers have to invest to have what cars sitting on the side just in case the railroads can't perform the job they said they were going to perform when the contracts were, were signed. Um, it, it's a real challenge and it's, it's pervasive and it is just getting worse. So, I mean, um, there needs to be some kind of, I, I don't know how we want to characterize it. I don't want to like sidetrack this proceeding. I think this is perhaps the most important proceeding before the board right now, because I do think there needs to be a little bit of a cultural shift uh, for the rail industry that as again, to put it again, to be a little more customer focused. I think this is a real key way to get at that a little bit. I think market competition is the number one way to, 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 make that happen without having to um, interject um, regulation, regulatory intervention into the market, if that makes it. I hope everyone's tracking with that. And this is Jeff Sloan. I would just add um, that, I mean, you know, a service, you know, service challenges, service meltdowns, um, you know, on the railroads do have real impacts on rail customers. The, the most extreme example is, is if um, a facility, uh, either a production facility or a uh, a customer facility has to shut down because of uh, not getting the supplies they need to keep operating. But short of that, uh, there's a lot of costs to the shippers in just modifying their business operations to deal with the rail service challenges. Uh, you know, spot using spot market for trucks to uh, for emergency supplies, just additional staffing to track and manage the cars. Uh, all of this is, is a significant burden that might not be uh, you know, obvious uh, to everyone while it's happening, but it's certainly felt by a, a wide range of members. Jeff, uh, I'm going to follow up on, I think, some questioning that uh, Patrick had with Jeff Marino a little bit ago. I want to make sure this is articulated as I understand it. If you look either at 1147 or the possibility of using service failures to win a mid-tech case. Are you saying that in the biz real world of business of shippers, if you have to wait until you can amass enough of evidence that might meet a mid-tech standard or an 1147 standard of service failures, by that time, the shipper has already suffered significant harm and losses. Uh, you have to first wait some, you know, it can't be just a, a miss switch today and you run in on a, on a case under 1147 or reciprocal switching, some meaningful continuation of service problems. And then you've got to wait to the period of, till the litigation ends before you get relief all the while you're suffering these service problems. So in that sense, 
it may be a theoretical legal option, but it isn't much of an option for an actual shipper in, a, in the real world. Is that a fair way to understand the problem? Uh, yes, Chairman Oberman, I, I think you've uh, articulated in a better than I was trying to articulate it in response to Patrick <laughs> earlier, uh, the timing issue here. Uh, this is, and, and we have, we, these associations, my clients, have been in to visit the board uh, in ex parte meetings uh, in a different proceeding uh, where we have attempted to uh, explain to you why even the board's emergency service orders, which are meant to be applied on an expedited basis, uh, are insufficient to address shipper service concerns, uh, let alone reciprocal switching, which is by no means an expedited process, even under what the board's proposal is now, uh, it's not clear, it, it would be longer than an ex emergency service order proceeding. So the damage is done. The whole point of reciprocal switching and competition that it engenders is to be prophylactic and it's prophylactic in two ways. Uh, the shipper who can actually take advantage of reciprocal switching obviously has the, benefit, the ability to shift its traffic to a carrier that may be more capable of handling uh, the business at that particular time. But in addition, even the shipper who doesn't have access to reciprocal switching and is, remains captive to the carrier having service problems will benefit because by one shipper shifting its traffic away, that frees up capacity on the congested carrier and therefore will help uh, that carrier uh, recover more quickly and be able to serve the traffic that doesn't have the option to reciprocal switching. So absolutely, I agree with what you said 100%. Yeah, I suppose one way to think of this is on the other side of the uh, ledger in terms of the time is money aspect of this world of railroads and shippers, we just approved uh, a rule uh, speeding up the emergency trackage rights situation when there are problems with a rail network, a washout or fire or whatever, because the railroads wanna get the situation back up and running as fast as they can. So it seems to me it's kind of, this is the other side of the coin that if you have a meaningful service problem, you want to get it solved immediately and not win a case a year from now, is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Patrick? Oh, Marty, uh, Marty, well, I want, ahead, to, I, want to, I want to explore the uh, timing point a little bit. Jeff, how long under the proposed rule, if it were adopted, how long would a case take? In your estimate? Uh, well, the, the, the board doesn't have a timeline. Now, we, in our comments back in uh, 2016, did propose a procedural schedule for reciprocal switching, which was seven months. So in some sense, if the situations that you're describing, um, you know, I think in Justin described a plan shutdown and you talk about the damage already be done, even under the proposed rule, it would take seven months. Uh, uh -huh. And so wouldn't the damage already be done in that instance? And, and, and so, you know, so that's kind of the, the first point. And the second point is just on a practical level, do you really expect a shipper under the proposed rule to come in for a switching order if their rate is reasonable and their service is adequate? Let me take your first question uh, and answer that. Uh, I don't anticipate that a shipper is going to wait to request reciprocal switching in response to a current service problem. The benefit of reciprocal switching lies in the fact that the shipper already has that switching access when the service problem occurs. And to the examples that uh, Justin presented for a TFI switch uh, shipper who was able to do that with the CSX PSR, they already had the switching, so they made the switch. We're not, we're advocating competition. We're not advocating this for the purpose, sole purpose of uh, addressing service. And, and so, uh, so, so that's the, the first question. Now, uh, remind me, what was your second question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I think you in part answered it, but I was, I was wondering whether or not you, you would expect, say, a shipper in a market dominant situation, but was getting reasonable rates, uh, according to the board's definition, and, and, and had generally not had service failures, so could not, you would not be able to bring evidence of inadequate service, would you expect that shipper to try and 
pursue something under the proposed rule as the pro as the prophylactic as you describe it. I think uh, what Justin, did you want to say something on that? Because, uh, because the proposed rule is not really a right, you know, because you still have to win that case. You have to beat the carrier's argument about trying to when the carrier is trying to show unduly hinder operations. So it's not as though the proposed rule gives the shipper an unmitigated right where they know for we'll certain. Case. That's what I'm sort of getting at is how realistic is it that a shipper would get the prophylactic as you describe it, even under the proposed rule? I'll let Jeff Moreno do cleanup duty and I'll, I'll give a, an initial thought. One, I'll just go back to efficient utilization of shipper assets. Uh, there are situations where uh, cars get routed a thousand miles um, in the wrong directions to get to an end location where if it had just switched, at, like, you know, you would have saved a thousand miles of track usage. And that was just because the incumbent, I, I believe I'm saying this right, the incumbent railroad didn't want to allow a switch. So therefore it didn't switch to another railroad to get it to that destination point. That's, um, I, there's a lot of things to say when, you're, when you send something a thousand miles out of the way, just so that um, people don't have to play together as much. Um, yeah, and Patrick, I'll just chime in too. I mean, I don't think it's an either or scenario. I, I think, you know, the reality is if these rules took effect, you're going to have different scenarios. You, you know, how long a case is, is going to depend on the facts. Um, you know, when the shipper seeks the remedy, it is going to potentially vary. You have shippers who have inconsistent service, right? It, it might not be just one major meltdown issue that leads a shipper to, you know, seek a remedy specific to, you know, a major meltdown, but they might be experiencing, and this happens actually pretty much very frequently, uh, unreliable service, inconsistent service over time. And that may be enough, depending upon the facts and their ability to, to you know, bring forth the evidence to, to win the case. So I, I just don't think it's always going to be proactive or always going to be reactive to some major catastrophic event. It, it's really going to vary. Yeah, and, and I know Karen's got a question, so I'll just this might make a <laughs> remark and um, conclude. Um, I, I just want to, Jeff, you mentioned the emergency service regulations. I, I think you're referring to 1146, and then there's kind of an intermediate step at 1147, and we're, of course, talking about permanent 1144. I say that all I understand those options not to be mutually exclusive. So you could pursue an emergency service, you know, and I understand the critique about those things, uh, those rules being too slow, right? I get that. But I, I just want to point out that you could pursue an emergency service while an 1147 case was pending or an 1144 case was pending. I just wanted to, to, to make that point. Sorry, Karen. Yeah, and we, and we fully comprehend that, but uh, it really just doesn't address the issue for our I, I hear you. I hear you. Let me... Uh... Just before Karen has her question, just to follow up on this discussion, I think what I'm hearing, Jeff, you and Karen saying is that the desire or motivation for a shipper to seek relief under a looser rule is going to vary widely with that shipper's circumstance. In other words, I assume some shippers have a much more of a tolerance to be able to survive service interruptions. Others may be much more delicate and don't have the kind of cushion. So they may be more motivated to seek the competitive option in advance of a problem. Or they may see their neighbor starting to get bad service and that might clue them in to say, this railroad's having trouble, I wanna come in. So I, I can see a wide variety of fact situations and they may not be perfect. The shipper may suffer some loss while the case is pending, but uh, it may be better than waiting until the disaster strikes before they even start a case. I, I gather that's a picture you're trying to paint for us. Yes. 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 All right, well, Karen? Um, going to Patrick's point about bringing a case will still take months and you know cost and expense. But isn't the fact that a shipper with a real complaint would have an adequate remedy before the board encourage the incumbent railroad to negotiate a switch on a much quicker basis voluntarily? That it, um, it'll, it'll make the railroads a little bit more uh, willing to consider a switch when you know, they have to recognize there's a real problem there. Board member Hedlund, yes, we agree with that as well. Uh, just 
the mere fact that the rule changes, you know, we would hope would change behavior in the industry, not in all cases. Uh, there's going to be different facts, as, as Chairman Oberman said. But in general, you, we see that all the time. When, when policy shifts and changes are made, the industry will, will respond to that. And they will self-regulate. At least some carriers will in some circumstances. There'll be others where they want to contest. But we do think there'll be benefits simply from the policy change in and of itself. Yes. A hey, board member, have me, a, uh, just jump right. I wonder if I could Go just ahead, Mike. Yeah. add something. I've been doing this for 46 years, and I can tell you that I think the thing the railroads may fear more than anything else is the board setting an adverse precedent that may invite other shippers to come in. So under the circumstances that I think the chairman and you were asking about him and board member Fuchs, if a shipper has, let's say, spotty, uh, inconsistent, you know, inferior service, but it's not yet a disaster, the railroad is probably going to respond out of fear thinking they may lose that case. And they're either going to up their game to come in and show services improved, or they're going to cut a commercial deal with the shipper and get, get rid of the case. And there are just many, many examples over the decades before the ICC and the board, where when a shipper puts on an arguably meritorious case, it gets settled. And that's the reason. Uh I, I, I want to just sort of uh, underscore the points that were made, just speaking on my own view of what this whole proceeding is about, as well as some of our other rulemakings. To me, if we determine that we're going to adopt a different rule for reciprocal switching, the purpose is not to deluge the board with cases. Uh, the better outcome would be that by modifying the balance between shippers and railroads, better private behavior will be encouraged and so that cases won't be brought. That would be the ideal outcome in my view, assuming we can figure out how to strike the right balance, which is why we're having these hearings and the challenge <clears throat> for all of us. Um, so I think um, I just wanted to underscore that as a matter of policy. Now, I, and by the way, this is not new. I have said this repeatedly to railroad groups and uh, investor groups that our goal is not for the board to be stepping in every day and giving orders for how the party should behave, but rather the party settle their own cases. Patrick, you had a, do you have a question you wanted to ask now or you wanted to hold it? Well, I, I don't, I, I'm, uh, unless the panelists have, have more in their presentation, but I have, I guess one more. All right, cause I have a few too, whenever we find out that their presentation ends, <laughs> I'm not sure when that is. But I have a few I want to go back to. Uh, we can't see the clock with uh, the way the, the clock slides is, are. The clock has exploded, so don't worry about that. <laughs> we 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 uh, we are prepared to abridge our uh, our testimony significantly. There are three topics we would like to make sure we have time to cover. One is the efficiency argument to the railroads, and the other two are the reasonable distance and the switch fee issues. All right. Well, those are all quite important, and there are a lot of where my questions are. So, Jeff, why don't you? Yeah, mine too, Marty. Yeah, okay. <laughs> why don't you go ahead with that, then we'll ask our questions. All right, then we will uh, <laughs> proceed. Uh, just to wrap up the topic that we had been talking about in terms of justifications, uh, I want to point out the- uh, Actually, Jeff, let me interrupt you for a second. I see by this exploded clock that we've been going for two hours and 15 minutes. Does anybody feel the need for a 10 minute break? Particularly my fellow board members, the only ones I- I say let's power through, Marty. Um, actually, actually, Marty, this is the court reporter. If we could just have a quick break, that would be great. Right. That'd be great. Thank I just you. thought that the youngest person on the on the panel says it was power. <laughs> there, there are differences. All right, we will take a ten minute, a ten minute recess, and we will be back at eleven uh, fifty five uh, East Coast time. Thank you. Thanks.
All right, it is 11.55, is everybody back? Yes, we are back at the Coalition Associations. All right. GFA is back. All right, are all my board members back? I'm here. Okay, very good. All right, Jeff, do you wanna pick up where you left off there? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Overman. Uh, I want to address the rail industry's focus on economic efficiency and the fact that it's a very uh, myopic focus because it's solely focused on alleged inefficiencies for them. Uh, reciprocal switching, uh, well, first of all, economic efficiency is defined in terms of net societal costs and benefits. Reciprocal switching fosters greater economic efficiency by facilitating consideration of both railroad and shipper costs in routing decisions instead of just the railroad's costs. Uh, and significantly, to a point we made earlier, it adds the cost of rail car ownership back into consideration following the shifting of those costs to shippers over the past three decades. Uh, as I noted earlier, private rail car ownership has more than doubled since 1985 to account to for 73% of all rail cars in North America today. And although rail car ownership costs would factor into routing assessments if incurred by the railroad, there's no incentive for the railroad to consider those costs when borne by the shipper. And I also allude to uh, Mr. Sloan's earlier testimony about Dow Chemical, uh, which has uh, over... Uh, uh, an estimated 335,000 excess miles due to less efficient uh, routing. Therefore, be, because economic efficiency is defined in terms of net societal costs and benefits, what may be most efficient for the railroad may not be most efficient on that for society. And reciprocal switching brings these other costs and benefits into the equation. Jeff, this is a good uh, uh, point to pause for my question. Is there ever a situation where um, a, a, a shipper receiving sole service from a railroad is the economically most efficient outcome? Sure, sure, sure. sure. I, 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 I wouldn't uh, presume to say that would never be the case. In uh, fact, it may often be if it's single serve versus a joint serve. Now, the necessary to provide competitive service prong provides for competition for, you know, basically any market dominant in any market dominant situation. And so I'm wondering is because, you know, as, as you identified, there, there might be a situation where the economically efficient outcome is for a market dominant carrier. Is there any need for the board to tease out the situations where a market dominant carrier is most efficient versus the ones that are not? Well, I think some of that gets teased out in the uh, operating effects uh, factor where the board Is, has to consider that. Well, maybe, um, but suppose there weren't, undo it didn't unduly impair carrier operations. Is there anything else that you think would protect the economically efficient service that, that is needed under the rules? I, well, I'm struggling to ascertain why the shipper would not favor that service if it is more economically efficient. Well, it, uh, it, it could be because a particular shipper might, especially depending on what the board does in compensation, which I know you'll address, it could be that the shipper could want a lower rate than they have, even if that's not the overall most economically efficient for society. Well, if we're talking about the uh, getting a lower rate, uh, those other costs are going to be associated. For example, if that is an inefficient routing for the shipper and the shipper is using private rail cars, uh, the shipper is going to have to maintain a larger fleet that increases both its ownership and its maintenance costs of the railroad. So the shipper also, in, in many cases, will have to carry more inventory costs. Uh, take uh, plastic shippers, for example. Uh, their inventory is stored in their rail car the moment it's produced before they ever even have a customer. Uh, yeah. And Jeff, given, given what you've previously articulated in other proceedings about the difficulty and cost benefit analysis within our economic regulatory sphere, would you agree that the more likely prong to actually be used is the necessary to provide competitive service under the proposed rule than the practical and public interest? 
Uh, I mean, my personal opinion is it's probably going to be used more simply because of the cost benefit analysis uh, difficulties that we've mm -hmm. talked about. But that also, I think, makes the uh, prong two, the competitive service prong, uh, the less impactful in terms of the volume, volume of traffic. Because recall, under prong one, a shipper could come in and seek reciprocal switching for an entire facility or for subsets of commodities. And prong two, that market dominance showing has to be made on each individual origin destination pair. So a shipper is not going to come in with every single uh, lane that they have. They're going to focus on the lanes that are high volume, that have high return associated with that. Got it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now I'd like to uh, talk about the reasonable distance factor, because I, I know that's something the board has specifically requested comments upon. Uh, our definition of reasonable distance uh, is that it should be defined by the actual operations of the incumbent between the facility for which switching is sought and the nearest working interchange. Now, the rail industry has insisted that the statute restricts reciprocal switching to terminal areas. Uh, I point out, however, that nothing in the relevant portion of the statute even refers to terminals in the <coughs> reciprocal switching context. Uh, our reply comments also go into detail about how the railroads have misrepresented the STB precedent or ignored STB precedent that conflicts with their position. Uh, nevertheless, uh, despite our differences on this interpretation of the statute and the precedent, there really isn't all that much daylight between our proposal and the railroad position as has been portrayed in the comments. In our opening comments back in October 2016, we offered a detailed explanation of our, how our definition would work. Our proposal determines reasonable distance based on the functions of a terminal. Now, according to STB precedent, a terminal area must contain and cannot extend significantly beyond recognized terminal facilities, such as freight or classification yards or team tracks. And, and a cohesive commercial area immediately served by those facilities. Now, according to precedent, terminal facilities consist of any property of a carrier which assists in the performance of the functions of a terminal. And the nature of the facilities and the character of the area in which they are located are as important as the use of the facility. Thus, it's our belief that by identifying terminal facilities, a reasonable distance would encompass any shipper location served by trains operating out of those facilities. Now, in most instances, that's going to result in a general rule of thumb that will allow the board to determine a reasonable distance by whether reciprocal switching can occur without movement in a road train as opposed to a local train. This is because local trains tend to perform most of the terminal functions. There essentially are two switching scenarios, therefore, that should always fall within this definition of reasonable distance. I'm going to lay out both a simple scenario and what I call the more complex scenario. In a simple scenario, the local train that serves a customer facility operates out of the very same yard where the interchange occurred. So all that happens in that situation is at the yard, the rail car gets switched into the competitor's interchange train as opposed to uh, the incumbent's uh, line haul or road train. Now let's talk about the more complex scenario. There in larger areas, you may have terminals with multiple yards and uh, shippers may be served by local trains out of, out of one yard, but yet the classification yards where uh, trains are built uh, and interchange occurs maybe in a different location yard within the terminal. Here, our position would be that the local train that serves a customer facility operates through a yard that is served by another local train that connects to the yard where the interchange occurs. That would be another automatic reasonable distance definition. Such operations are plainly terminal functions that would qualify them for reciprocal switching, even under the rail industry's definition of reasonable distance. 
In contrast, most switches that would require transportation on a road train to reach the interchange point would not constitute a reasonable distance. This is a presumption. Hey, go ahead, go ahead Marty. No, I wanted to, to, I did have a question, but I was waiting for Jeff to finish. Okay, I, I'm just about at a good stopping point for that question. Uh, I'd say uh, this presumption with respect to road trains should be rebuttable because there may be switches involving road trains that also function as local trains for some movements. A shipper, therefore, should at least have the opportunity to make that showing or present other, other evidence that the switch operation would be consistent uh, with terminal functions. So, go ahead, Chairman. Over. Well, well, Jeff, uh, I have been uh, exploring this idea of trying to define what a terminal is. <clears throat> you seem to be farther along than my research has shown. I think there's a lot of uncertainty. There could be a lot of uncertainty in a litigation setting as to what, what's a terminal. But there doesn't seem to be much uncertainty about yards where reciprocal switching now takes place. Uh, uh, it it appears to me that all of the class ones have a fair, fairly large number of places, and I'm going to get into the later with them, where they're already doing reciprocal switching. Have, have you thought about defining the place where reciprocal switching could take place under a board order to be limited to places where it's already taking place by the class one railroad that's involved? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't limit, you mean uh, reciprocal switching or do you mean interchange of traffic is already taking place? No, I'm talking about reciprocal switching. In other words, from what I can tell, there's a fair amount of reciprocal switching already either going on or at least agreed to by the class ones because they have elaborate tariffs setting that out. And all, all of that switching, from what I can tell, takes place in some yard someplace. It may or, that yard may or may not be inside what we would all think of as a terminal. I, thing, I, you seem to be saying if switching is taking place there, that by definition makes it a terminal. I, well, I, well I, I think we're taking a function-based approach because we uh, agree with you. Uh, we don't want the litigation to turn into whether something's a terminal. Um, the a definition of a terminal that is locked into fixed geographic boundaries is amenable to gaming by the railroads, frankly, under this rule. Uh, and, and even today, I, I, I'm hard pressed to find any clear definition of a terminal boundary in any public railroad documents. Me too. Uh, so uh, our focus on how switching operation would align with terminal functions avoids reliance upon what we consider to be vaguely defined and arbitrary geographic boundaries. But, but coming back to your question, uh, therefore, therefore, we're not saying that terminal should be the determining factor. We're saying terminal functions should be the determining factor. And, and basically, if it moves on a local train and doesn't have to move on a road train, that should always constitute qualification of a reasonable distance for reciprocal switching. The rule of thumb that we have up here on the screen should be, uh, should always be, I mean, regard to put aside whether, whether the railroads call the terminal or not. And so you seem to be saying, I think, and this is what has perplexed me, that if you were trying to draft a rule for the entire United States, there are so many variations in where shippers are located vis-a-vis -vis their local yard that it would be a, sort of a fool's errand to try to come up with a mileage which made sense. So you're saying, how does the traffic from the shipper get sorted out in the first place to get to where it's going? And however far that is from that yard is a reasonable distance. So That's right. I mean, there, there are situations I've come across where a local train runs out of a yard uh, up to 100 miles in some cases. So it could be. Now, that's probably not the norm. It's probably going to be shorter in most cases, but that 100 miles uh, switch, if it wouldn't change the way that operates in terms of the yards it has to access, uh, why shouldn't that switch? Why shouldn't that customer be eligible? Well, when you get up to 100 miles or more, are you not getting into a what's more 
accurately described as a bottleneck situation, though? That's why we were drawing the distinction between whether it is served by the shipper is served by a local train or a road train. If it is served by a road train, I think you are straight into the bottleneck situation. If it's served by a local train, that's performing terminal function. It's switching, it's gathering and distributing traffic. That's a terminal function. And, and therefore, it should be included. You are saying that there are some places where a road train doubles as a local train? There may be circumstances where a road train may stop at a, uh, at a shipper facility to pick up traffic uh, where ordinarily would not. I mean, uh, 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 where most road trains would not stop in the middle of, uh, of their journey. And that should at least be an opportunity for the shipper to demonstrate that that is providing a terminal function should be included. So it would be, to, if we were to approach it the way you're suggesting, it would just be a question of defining this function, really, how it's performed rather than the name of the train. <laughs> right, and I think the, the, the first question you ask is, is it on a local train or is it on a road train? And if it's on a local train, end of, end of inquiry. If it's on a road train, you got to take a, you, you, you may have to do a little deeper dive. Hey, Marty, if I, if I could just chime in. So yeah, go, go right ahead. Uh, Robert, it, sorry. It, it's on the same line of thinking. Uh, so Jeff, how would you, cause again, Marty alluded to that, that, you know, we've got, you know, uh, places all over the country that, that cannot necessarily be classified one way or another, but especially I'm looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, from the ag side of the world, you know, you've got these farms and these facilities that are like that you're saying, you know, probably maybe a hundred miles apart or, or more, and and they don't operate necessarily from a local standpoint. So, how would you would your would, would what you're saying apply to areas, you know, out in the in the Midwest, you know, in the south in the Dakotas and the Idaho's? I mean, how would that that play out for 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 the ag customer there? It has the potential, but honestly, without knowing the facts, I couldn't say exactly how it would apply to any particular shipper. But our our standard for reasonable definition of reasonable distance is flexible enough that uh, it, that if the operations support it, you could uh, argue that those longer distances are switches. I'm not saying they definitely would in every situation, but I'm saying that the possibility is still present. No, I, I, I understand. I, I just inquiring because again that's that's one of the challenges that we have i mean everyone could say could look at uh more populated and and, and busier areas and, and find those those uh those terminals or or those those areas where you have like i said you have local lines and you have road but you know what are some of these other folks these uh, again um um the grain folks are on the call if you want to chime in you can do that but the challenge is there is sort of finding where you can interchange the spots to do it not confining them saying oh well you know it's just a certain radius. And so we can't do it because we don't have, you know, folks uh, 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 within those radiuses. It's a lot further. So just, I think the flexibility is important. Uh, and point to if you guys considered that aspect of it as well. I, I just like to add one other thing before uh, NGFA chimes in there. And I think uh, there is a distinction uh, that perhaps needs to be drawn between a, an existing interchange where there is an, ex an existing interchange or where there can be an interchange because the rule does draw a distinction between the two. Uh, where, if it's an existing interchange, we're not changing the geography of anything. Well, I was gonna add that in terms of the, um, you know, the, the, the authority to be flexible, um, I, I think Jeff, what the reason he was discussing terminals so much is because he's trying to make the argument and successfully that even if you use the railroads um, position that you have to have a terminal, it, it's still what we proposed or what the shipper co coalition has proposed still makes sense. But the statute again says nothing about um, terminals and the legislative history provides the flexibility uh, to go beyond terminals and so for the in the ag realm um that you know with ngfa as max said and as ngfa has said in its testimony um the, the relief particularly out west is available up to 100 miles and so we believe the board has 
the flexibility to put standards in, play, in place to let those type of shippers make their case that they have um, an existing interchange or an interchange can be feasibly created and that switching can occur um, subject to the other aspects of the rule on efficiency and, and so forth. Tom, uh, if you didn't use a mileage limitation, but you used a functional description, as Jeff just talked about, uh, would that provide relief to ag shippers out, out in the reaches of the West? I'm sorry, Marty, could you repeat the first part of that? Yeah, you know, instead of using a mileage limitation, you've suggested that you could be eligible for switching if you were within 100 miles of an interchange. If instead the reasonable distance was not defined by mileage, was but defined by how far the shipper is from the sorting yard or classification yard, whatever you want to call it, where its traffic is taken without saying how far that distance is because everybody's different. Would that right. provide relief for ag shippers? Yes. Um, you know, the 100 miles is, it was put in in GFA submissions to show that's where a, a big part of their relief would come. But the, the functionality test that the shipper coalition groups have is proposed would, would work um, a lot of to uh, board member Primus's point um, in question, a lot of um, reciprocal switching opportunities for ag, particularly out west, are, are at existing interchanges where they could, um, for example, receive uh, transportation from another origin. Uh, one, one point that NGFA has, has made throughout this is that the grain industry um, is much, they need much more flexibility. They have changing markets, uh, global markets. You know, so um, that there are a lot of existing interchanges, I'm staying away from the use of the word terminal, but it, existing interchanges in yards where they could switch to uh, another carrier, but are prevented from doing so. Um, uh, Jeff, let me ask a question. You had talked earlier about the AAR's um, overstating how much traffic might be eligible for switching. Or you remember that that yes. topic? As I understand it, their calculation is based on just using a mileage ring around an, any interchange point on the planet. Have you tried, or anybody either at the coalition or Tom with your clients? tried to estimate if you allowed switching based on this concept of a functional terminal. I'll just use that. I'm not sure I like, like that term, but I understand it's a shorthand and a, we all know what you were talking about. Have you done any calculation to indicate how the magnitude of traffic that would fall within such a definition? No, it, it, that would be uh, a Herculean task if not if, if impossible altogether, especially since we don't have access to uh, no. the operations of every single movement out there. But, uh, okay. uh, but, I, but I, I, I would like to, I, I think you can take some comfort in what the NIT League had uh, in, analysis of what it had proposed at a 30 mile mark uh, in, in its proposal, because the NIT League proposal hit 4.6% of traffic uh, and that was a far more expansive proposal in terms of its applicability and the ease at which shippers could take advantage of that proposal. So I think you can look at that as an outlier. And let me, Marty, let me add, um, NGFA participated with a number of agricultural groups and actually took a stab at that, um, those type of statistics in response to the board's re request for data back in so long ago, 2014, 12, whenever. And uh, there is some data, some analysis based on uh, waybill data, um, but it's just that it's very, very difficult to do um, with a lot of detail considering um, the, the data mostly resides in the railroads. 
All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, Chairman Overman, I, I don't think I ever actually answered the specific question you asked to kick this discussion off. And, and that was about limiting reciprocal switching to areas where it already occurs. And I do wanna make it very clear, uh, that would not be beneficial from our point. I mean, it's already occurring in those areas. Now, perhaps it's not reaching every single shipper in those particular areas, but uh, in order for this to have the desired uh, benefits, uh, this has to be more widespread to, uh, to, to interchanges more generally. If there are no more questions on reasonable distance, I can proceed to talk about the switch fee. Jeff, Jeff let me, um, I think I inarticulately asked the question. What I'm positing is a situation where a shipper who is now not, does not have reciprocal switching available is served by a serving yard or switching yard or classification yard where other shippers do have reciprocal switching based on current tariffs. And if you defined shippers who would now be eligible as those whose traffic is already going to a yard that is otherwise where it could be reciprocally switched. It's just that the class one isn't allowing it. Would that cover, you know, a, a similar number of shippers to the way you've defined it in terms of within a reasonable distance of a serving yard? Because I assume we're talking about the same thing. The shippers traffic has got to go to a switching yard before it moves on to its final destination. I, I think my answer would have to be the same. I don't think it expands it enough uh, unless we're still talking past one another. Uh, we're focused on anywhere, any location where an interchange occurs, whether the, it involves reciprocal switching or just the interchange of traffic. Uh, that's our point because that's uh, all you're doing is getting to the closest point at which you can put the switch traffic onto the competing railroads train. And since that competing railroad is already building a train in that location, uh, and there's already track cars being switched between the two railroads in that location, there's, it's just an incremental addition to the existing operation. Well, it's not incremental if there aren't trains going over to another railroad from that interchange. Well, that's our point. Uh, if it's an interchange, by definition, there has to be trains going to another area. Uh, you, maybe our definitions of interchange are a little different. You may be no. thinking of interchange as interchanging between any set of trains uh, within the same railroad. I'm not including interchanges of train uh, where uh, railroads switch cars between their own trains. I'm talking about interchanges where they switch cars between their trains and another railroad. Well, isn't that almost always going to be a yard someplace? Yes. Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about. But, but in right, those, but you said, but you said uh, where they're all engaged in reciprocal switching of traffic, and I'm talking about it, there's a difference between reciprocal switching of traffic and interchange of traffic, and that's where I think we're we're uh, we're talking past one another. Uh, yes, uh, well, not necessarily. What I am saying is that it occurs to me that there are a very large number of places in this country where reciprocal switching is permitted by tariff at the local yard already. And that if you examine all those locations, which I have only briefly looked at, I'm just gonna get into this with the railroads when they testify, um, you would have a pretty far reaching availability of reciprocal switching, it strikes me. I, I can't answer your question. I, I, I do not believe that that's gonna be significant enough uh, from our perspective. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's as broad, uh, as broad as you say, but I can't say for sure because I haven't done that story, that study. So. Yeah, I, I, would, I would be interested when you have time, and I think we, we're going to be having some ex parte discussions, T take a look at all the current locations where railroads have existing tariffs for reciprocal switching. And 
see if you you and your clients, and I would say this time to your the same, could come back to us as to what benefit if it, you would see in having those locations be the places where you could a, a shipper could uh, be eligible to file a, a petition for ship, for reciprocal switching. Okay. Take a look at that. But Chairman Oberman, this is uh, Karen. Uh, are you, yeah. when you raise that issue, are you thinking about like you, that the board would potentially freeze those locations because no. the tariff can change, of course, and the carriers can decide not to perform reciprocal switching any longer where it may exist today in a tariff? And you're, you're a couple of steps ahead of me. I'm only thinking conceptually at this point. <laughs> okay. I, okay. I'm only my thinking to start out is if reciprocal switching is already permitted in location X, then it would not seem to be, a, a, I'm asking really, whether it would add any congestion if they're already doing it there for shippers in the general neighborhood, it wouldn't be much to add another shipper who doesn't have a reciprocal switching tariff right now. I think we agree with that 100%, but we also would agree that uh, if they're doing any interchanging, it shouldn't be adding anything to their operations. So that's why we take a broader, uh, a wider view than you do. Yeah, well, there may, but it may be that it is a, a very general overlap. That's what I'd like you to look at, okay. what these locations are. If it's a good idea, Karen, and I don't know that it is, then the next question would be, well, Local switching yards at what point in time? Right. Because okay. you raise you raise an appropriate question that it uh, could be a changing situation. Are there any other uh, reasonable distance questions? Want to wrap up with a discussion of the uh, switch fee methodology. And I'd like to point out, first of all, that the board has a concrete proposal for setting the switch fee in this proceeding. It's one that we presented in our October 2016 testimony through the verified statement of uh, Thomas Crowley and Dan Fapp. Uh, we supported the SSW method that was um, offered up in the board's original notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, with specific modifications to, uh, number one, modify it from a trackage rights uh, methodology to reciprocal switching, given that in trackage rights situations, uh, there's actually another carrier operating over the track, whereas in a reciprocal switch, the incumbent is still performing all the operations, so certain uh, recognitions of that fact were required and to modify the methodology. And, and, and secondly, we we uh, offered some modifications to reduce the complexity because uh, applying SSW based on the precedent would uh, uh, require uh, access to either information that is simply not available in the broader context would be required for reciprocal switching and or would require the equivalent of a, of a standalone cost uh, type of analysis, which is obviously undesirable for reasons we expressed in many other proceedings. The, um, uh, the rail industry has criticized our proposal on various grounds that boil down to the fact that it doesn't preserve differential pricing uh, for reasons we previously addressed already. Uh, one reason for revising the reciprocal switch rules is because differential pricing is not needed to the same degree uh, as it was in 1985 when the board adopted the current competitive abuse standard. Uh, our proposal under SSW, therefore, is, focuses upon uh, cost recovery uh, by the incumbent. Uh, I note that the, uh, the rail industry and, and no one else has really put forth a, uh, a complete proposal for switching in this. The rail industry has basically um, settled into taking pot shots at our proposal and saying whatever the board adopted must in include uh, efficient component pricing. And for reasons we've expressed in our many ex parte meetings, efficient component pricing is a non-starter. I mean, it protects the market power that the railroad has and therefore forecloses the benefits of switching. So if the board were to consider efficient component pricing as the, the means of setting the switch fee, uh, 
it would completely blow up uh, every everything else that the board's doing with respect to granting reciprocal switching. Uh, ultimately, however, I want to point out that the board doesn't need to settle upon any methodology for setting a switching fee in this proceeding. Most notably, I want to point out that the current rules don't have any methodology and they've been in place for 30 some odd years. So any notion that uh, we have to do it, uh, set one in this proceeding uh, would be misplaced. Uh, Secondly, I would note that the statute only calls for the board to set the switch fee when there is no agreement. So uh, there's first has to be an opportunity and only then if there's a, a lack of agreement does the board have to apply any methodology. And, and that permits any reciprocal switch fee uh, dispute that arises to be addressed on a case by case basis. Now, I, I will say ultimately in the long run, yeah, I, we think it is beneficial to have a uh, understandable, uh, predictable methodology for determining the switch fee, because uh, without that methodology, that's an additional risk that any shipper who requests switching it, it is undertaking. Uh, but uh, the board doesn't have to do so in this proceeding. Uh, and frankly, uh, any early switch fee disputes that might arise could in fact become a laboratory for uh, the board to be test uh, different theories of how switching uh, might in fact work. Uh, so I, I would say, uh, I, I think we've offered something for the board to, to use if the board is not comfortable with what we have offered, it can conduct uh, subsequent uh, rulemaking and sub number two, I guess would be the case, uh, while after it grants reciprocal switching in sub number one. Uh, Jeff, I uh, am hoping to get this rulemaking finished while I'm still alive. So <laughs> I'm not looking for a sub two if I don't have to. Uh, let, let me ask you uh, a couple of questions about the uh, fee. Uh, you know, the, uh, the lawyer in me likes common law, uh, lawmaking case by case. It has a lot of merit. We all learned that in law school, but I'm wondering if we set no methodology, who's the shipper is going to be the first one out of the box because what I have wondered if a client comes to, if we change the rule to, uh, you know, along the lines that you're recommending to make it, uh, to remove some of the hurdles. And a client comes to you and says, I'd like to get a reciprocal switching agreement with my carrier and they won't agree, bring a case. And they ask you how much it's gonna cost and you're gonna give them a number and I'm not gonna presume what that number will be, but it's not gonna be cheap, particularly it's the first case. And the client says to you, and if I win, what have I won? It troubles me if you're going to have to say, oh, I don't know what you're going to win because I don't know what the fee is going to be. The fee could be prohibitive. So isn't it a disincentive for the client to bring the first case, not knowing whether it's going to benefit them? Uh, I, I can't disagree with that at all. That's like, I do agree with it. Uh, I, I can't tell the client what that rate is going to be. I, I would point out a couple things. One is We've already, uh, as we've enumerated throughout this proceeding, there are benefits to reciprocal switching aside from the rate uh, element to this. Uh, and, and I do think uh, the absence of a rate is going to be a chilling factor on uh, someone being uh, the guinea pig. Uh, frankly, any client, any shipper who's the guinea pig in the first case is probably gonna have to litigate more issues uh, than might be required down the road. Uh, but that is exactly why I've said I don't think the board, uh, I, I believe in the long run, there is a strong benefit to having a predictable methodology. And I think the board should proceed with that. The message I want to send is don't hold up granting reciprocal switching until that happens. What I fear more than anything else is that if there's a delay to continue figuring out the switch fee at this point, uh, then what we're going to have is, is the potential that we're, we're back here another decade from now. Uh, and I, I think we need to resolve the standard for access, uh, even if we don't have a standard for the fee now. And, and if 
I think you do. I think we've given you a standard. We, I think you can adopt that in this proceeding. There's been enough to, uh, presentation and opportunity for uh, notice and comment on that. But if, and only if you should have any uh, reservations about doing so based on the current record, then grant reciprocal switching, uh, changing the rules as we suggested here, and then continue on, continue this proceeding for the purpose of determining the switch fee methodology. Well, let me uh, shift gears slightly and address both you and Tom, because Tom mentioned this, I think, specifically in his opening remarks. I think, Tom, you said something about the shipper having an ability to weigh in on the fee if the railroads agree on a fee that they don't like. And I'm trying, I'm perplexed under the statute of how that happens. In other words, what what is both of your and I don't mean to leave out Karen re reactions to a situation where the railroads get together and agree on a fee that's prohibitive, and so the shipper has won the reciprocal switching order, but the fee they're presented with makes it uneconomical. How do how do how do we deal? Should we deal with that situation? Well, I'll go first. NGFA position and it's it's reflected by the comments of other shippers in the um, you know in these proceedings is that in in today's concentrated rail market um, there are concerns that if reciprocal switching is ordered really the extent to which you have the duopolis in the east and the west will actually um, compete and achieve the desired result that's uh, we're not the only part of it that, that said that. And so one of the issues is uh, it's just the statute clearly gives the railroads to the, op the uh, right, I guess, to set um, compensation if they are ordered to order or ordered to enter into a reciprocal switch arrangement. Um, but and then so a lot of the discussion is so what should that methodology be if they don't don't agree? But NGFA's belief is that that same process should apply if they, if they do agree. And I think there is under the general, you know, authority that rates and charges must be reasonable that the board would have authority to look at that and should include that as part of this, this process. Well, uh, now we've also said, uh, quick to say that we would think that those uh, those instances would be very rare. Uh, we would hope they'd be rare, but it's it's a possibility that can't be ignored in today's concentrated rail uh, market. Yeah, I'll just uh, add on uh, just what Tom has been saying is there is uh, always a concern that even two shippers won't compete. I mean, two railroads won't compete. Uh, and if the railroads get together and agree upon a rate that the shipper believes is not reasonable, we think the shipper should have the right to challenge that rate under the very same methodology uh, that, the, that would apply in a dispute between the two railroads. Well, here, my question is, uh, under what statute would we hear such a matter? Because the reciprocal switching statute <laughs> under which we'd be granting the petition is very clear that it says only if the carriers cannot agree does the board step in. So would you have to bring a rate case if you uh, thought the fee was too high, set by collusion or however it was reached? Well, that's... And then, and then would we be in the rate case arena? Well, that's the, that's the issue is, you know, how would right would, would it you have to have a different standard and have a full rate case in a situation where they did agree versus when they didn't agree under the same you know 11 102 order to require reciprocal switching and our preference obviously would be not to go into the rate case realm use the same standard for both but what, what is our statutory authority, I guess, is my question, to hear a challenge to a rate, a reciprocal 
switch fee, which has been agreed upon by the two car carriers. Well, I, 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 think don't, I don't find anything in that statute that gives us authority to hear that such a case. Let, let's even assume for sake of argument that you do have to bring it under 10701 uh, as a rate case. That doesn't mean that you're still, that the standard you have to apply is SAC or any of the existing standards. You could say that in a switch case, uh, a shipper who challenges a rate under 10701 must meet the same standard uh, as you apply in the reciprocal switching disputes no, between carriers. No, I don't disagree. I think you could. I don't know why you couldn't establish a particular methodology for rate challenges to switching fees. I think you, I don't see why we couldn't. We, we haven't yet. Um, uh, and I suppose you could even, if we ever adopt arbitration or final offers, put, put it under there as well. But I think what you're saying, Jeff, is that we probably have to use a different statutory authority to allow a shipper to challenge an agreed upon rate. Uh, I'm not prepared to concede that point at this time. Sure. I mean, I have to. <laughs> well, I'd, I'm perplexed. I, I'm not, I shouldn't say, by the way, that I don't think we have the authority. I don't see it on the face of the statute, but you know, I'm not as creative as you guys. And I, I would, uh, if, if there is any further legal enlightenment that you can provide to us, about how to uh, how we deal with that situation. You know, I, I will say, and I've said this publicly in, in speeches, uh, I don't know that the class ones are all that anxious to compete with each other. And so I am concerned about the potential for a shipper to satisfy all the standards that we may enact in any rule or modification of a rule or whatever and yet the competing carrier is not really interested uh, and he agrees to you know, a rate that's not practical because they don't want to do it. I don't know that that's going to happen. I'm just concerned that it could happen and I don't know how we would deal with that situation. That's what I would say ultimately uh, the issue between the statutory authority question may be a more form over substance because uh, recall the prompt, uh, the really the only true difference is going to be that on, to exercise your rate regulatory authority, you have to prove market dominance. Well, if you bring your reciprocal switching request under prong two, you're proving market dominance in that context already. So that, that you clear that hurdle. Uh, it, it might be, it might raise a little bit more, uh, an additional step in a prong one scenario. But uh, as I said earlier, I think prong two is going to be the more uh, uh, dominant, uh, more predominantly used uh, of the two standards. Yeah, and I, I would just add um, a little bit of a different angle on this. I mean, obviously we would, we expect and we would hope that the rail industry will um, give meaning to any change that the board does in a, in a fair way. If there was, for whatever reason, something along the lines of gaming where in every case, the railroads agree on switch pricing that never allows um, a shipper to benefit. I, I think you know, you'll be hearing a lot from the shipper community about that. And, and if it meant that your authority um, you know, just wasn't able to address that effectively for whatever reason, then I'm pretty certain that that would lead to other calls for changes in that authority to allow this to work as intended. Um, hopefully well, we never have to get there, um, but I, I suspect that's what would happen. Well, I would hope we wouldn't get there either if we issued an order to require reciprocal switching that the railroads mm -hmm. wouldn't try to under, undermine it. Um, I will say we have some guidance by the vast number of switching fees that they already specify in their reciprocal switching tariffs. Yeah. And so I think the uh, rail and the shipper world both have an idea of the general uh, limits on what switching fees are. Some of them are, there's a, a, a wide variety, but there's still a range that are are in existing tariffs that give you a starting point to think about it anyway. Well, that, that raises the possibility of developing a methodology that's pegged to uh, 
existing voluntary reciprocal switching fees? Well, I'm not going to opine on telling you what kind of a rule to apply for, but it certainly is an obvious idea to think about. You know, Mr. Chairman, this is Mike McBride. I just wanted to give you some reasons for hope that there might be some competition out there. In, in the UPSP docket, uh, we had a case a few years ago for G3 Enterprises, and uh, BN was uh, shoulder to shoulder with G3, which is the logistics arm for Gallo, uh, trying to get uh, business uh, away from UP in the Central Valley of California. You also see in that same um, proceeding, uh, BN competing for traffic down in the Gulf Coast against uh, UP and KCS. And then I would cite to you the fact that AAR filed 612 pages of comments in the most recent round here. I would submit to you, if they're not worried about these rules ever being used, those comments might have been six pages long and not 612 pages long. And then finally, let me point you back to the CPKCS merger proceeding where the other five class ones that are not the applicants have all raised competitive issues and they're trying to preserve uh, existing competition and not lose it. So there, there is some reason to believe that there's really some competition out there in the rail industry. Well, Mike, I hope you are correct. And I hope my cynicism is proven wrong. Um, and I think there are probably places in the country where there's some competition and there are places where there isn't. Um, so it may be a problem that doesn't co ever come into existence. I would hope that it would not. Uh, it seems to me the, um, the bigger challenge for the board now is the one that Jeff was addressing, and that is whether we say in advance what the methodology or the measuring stick would be for a fee in those cases where the railroads do not agree. So the parties all know what they what happens if they don't work it out. And I, and I, I think that is an open question, Jeff, I think defined it quite accurately. Okay, I think you had one other topic, Jeff, right? Actually, that, that, was, that was it. Uh, I, I had a rather pithy closing, but in the interest of time, I will, uh, I will rest. <laughs> well, the, the next topic is lunch, but I don't want to cut anybody off who has questions. So uh, any board members um, have any questions? All right, I, I will say, by the way, that... Um, and I don't know what the board uh, consensus will be on timing. You know, I've made it clear. I would like to move this whole process ahead expeditiously, but we do anticipate, and I think there are some that are already scheduled, uh, some additional ex parte opportunities for stakeholders. Um, so some of the open questions can be dealt with further, but we want to do it soon sooner rather than later, I'm not putting a date on it, to get whatever whatever other input any, any of you have. And of course that applies to all the other uh, stakeholders who are gonna appear here. But uh, I will say uh, to the speakers today, this was uh, very enlightening, very, very well prepared. Uh, I think I can say for all five of us, we really appreciate your putting the effort into it. You know, it's say this now and, and for everybody else, I have come to really value over my previous career, the value of the contestants educating the decision maker. You know, we're good, but we're not perfect. And we really need the stakeholders to responsibly enlighten us. And uh, we just can't make a good decision without it. And I think this panel has really done its done its share, and I'm confident the other panels will too, but it's really crucial to the decision-making process. So appreciate it. So if there is no other um, questioning, it is now 12, just about 1250. Mm -hmm. Is a half hour for a lunch break for folks. So we've got a pretty big agenda for this afternoon. We will uh, recess and reconvene at 120 Eastern. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Much. Chairman.
All right, I think we are back in session. I hope everybody had their indigestion over the last half hour, bracing to get back here in time. Welcome back. So we will proceed with panel two, uh, which is BN, CP, and UP. And specifically, I want to make sure everybody is here. On behalf of BNSF, uh, we have Joe Mulligan. Adam White, Weiskill, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Stephen Hub. Are you all here? Commissioner Overman, sure. Yeah. There you sure are. Over here. Here. Yep. Okay, very good. And Excellent. for Canadian Pacific, we have uh, Witterbrood. Am I saying that right? Uh, yeah, and it's actually pronounced Tama. Pronounced how? It's pronounced Tama, but I, I'll Tama. answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to be phonetic here, but thank you. And David Meyer, I see. I apologize for that, Tama. Um, and for Union Pacific, Jennifer Heyman, Kenny Rocker, Eric Geringer, and Michael Rosenthal. We're all here. You're all here. Okay. Let's begin. Uh, Jill, we have you up first, if you want to start. Great. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to share BNSF's perspective on the board switching proposal. Uh, I'm Jill Mulligan, General Counsel for BNSF. I'm joined by Steve Bob, our Chief Marketing Officer, and my colleague Adam Weiskittle, uh, Associate General Counsel. BNSF will use our time to describe our role as a strong competitor in the dynamic markets we serve and the important role that the board plays supporting that. Regulatory action by the board can either reward that competitive behavior or it can undercut it. While it is important that the board serve as a meaningful backstop when markets don't function, we would like to explain why we think the 2016 proposal lacks sufficient safeguards to ensure that existing competition is rewarded or at least left intact. Where regulation holds out the potential or even the promise of intervention in functioning markets, that carries significant consequences for shippers and railroads. At BNSF, our financial performance is not driven by returns we earn on solely served shippers. As Steve will describe, BNSF's success comes from offering market responsive services into competitive dynamic markets, including in areas that the STD's framework would label as captive. Retaining and growing volume in all our markets has been the hallmark of our success and it's our imperative going forward. That's reflected in our growth story. Our volume has outpaced the industry. That's also reflected in our rate structure. For example, the board's own annual measures show that the majority of our revenue is earned on traffic that moves at rates below 180. We also compete on service. Steve will discuss how we design our service to be responsive to market needs and that recently we haven't met our customers' expectations. He will describe the measures that we are taking currently to drive step level improvements, regain our customers' confidence and keep their business. NSF understands that the role the board does have a role to play between customers and railroads. The board does that by letting competition in dynamic markets set transportation rates and drive service innovations, and by being ready to put regulatory intervention up against market failures. BNSF acknowledges our shipper concerns that the board's existing rate mechanisms fall short, especially for small shippers. And we've long supported regulatory reform aimed at effective oversight of the highest rates, including the board's recent ADR proposal. However, the board's 2016 proposal carries with it the high potential to disrupt functioning markets while also falling short on accomplishing the board's goals. Steve is now going to talk about BNSF's experience in our markets and the role we serve there for our customers before Adam walks through the specifics of the 2016 proposal. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, BNSF is, uh, is really a company that is focused on growth. And as BNSF's chief marketing officer, it's my job to grow our existing customers business on BNSF and attract new customers that are currently served by other railroads or other modes. We also grow by developing innovative service options to open new markets and cultivate railroad volumes that didn't previously exist. Our track record of volume growth illustrates a result of our growth strategy. 
My primary message to you today is please carefully consider the unintended impacts your proposal will have on BNSF's ability to compete for new business. Our growth disproportionately comes from success in markets that are replete with direct modal competition and are heavily influenced by geographic competition as well as product competition. Our growth is not driven by maximizing returns from solely served customers. Further, the suggestion that our rates to solely serve customers are not generally subject to significant competitive forces is wrong. Likewise, any suggestion that we don't vigorously compete with other railroads or other modes is also wrong. We think our growth model matches the vision this agency has for how the rail industry can meet our country's increasing freight demands. But I worry that the current switching proposal works against that vision because it promises blunt board intervention where none is needed. That will impede BNSF and our customers' ability to do what the markets want us to do. Let me talk about how this might happen. Our green shuttle network is a million dollars over the past 21 years to build a shuttle network that expanded our customers' access to regional and global markets. Those customers have invested alongside us and the results have been impressive. For instance, since 2010, we have increased our grain volumes to California markets by 40%, and that was at a time when the consumption market was shrinking. Before BNSF shuttle service destinations in those California markets were primarily supplied by origins that were solely served by the Union Pacific and head shoulder links of Hall. Together with our customers, we invested in the resources necessary to support an efficient unit train operation with market brace pricing that allows our BNSF origin elevators to compete even when our length of haul is longer. That pattern is reflected on an international scale by growing BNSF agricultural volumes into Mexico and to export elevators in the Pacific Northwest that serve Asian markets. For our customers to compete in those international markets, we must consider all the dynamics that impact the delivered price of their grain when we set our rates, such as ocean freight costs, commodity prices, geopolitics, and world supply and demand. For example, we stay nimble and adjust our rates to keep our customers competitive against facilities. Served by UP that actually compete against origin countries for business into Asian destinations as well. And finally, we often compete with more local markets, such as processors or feedlots to originate the grain that we move to California, Mexico, and Asia. That's geographic competition, and we can't ignore it in our pricing and service decisions, or we will lose the volume. This is the kind of market responsive behavior that a balanced regulatory structure should reward. Instead of jeopardizing with an indiscriminate framework that doesn't allow the regulator to fully understand whether intervention is even warranted. The current proposal doesn't consider the most relevant and significant market factors impacting our behaviors. Yes, it might sometimes lead to an artificial reduction for one shipper who gets the benefit of a below market rate vis-a-vis -vis its own competitors, but that won't help BNSF or our broader customer base grow. The ripple effect of that subsidy would instead make competing origins less competitive and devalue our customers' transportation investments. BNSF's growth is also dependent upon competitive service offerings, and I fear the board's proposal will lead to capacity degradation. I understand that some shipper associations are advocating that reciprocal switching be used in a way that resembles open routing. History has unequivocally taught us that open routing is a bad idea for the rail industry and for our customers. Over time, markets drive naturally efficient transportation flows, which mature and become institutionalized within those markets. If the board empowers shippers to drive routing decisions, it will be very difficult to effectively plan our interchange activity and infrastructure needs. Pursuing inefficient routes and the idea of lower rates or better service for one shipper will result in less frequent interchanges at points where market forces and sound operating principles would otherwise dictate. Again, perhaps one shipper benefits for a time from that, but our customers as a whole would ultimately be left with higher rates and less available capacity. The service offerings that have driven our growth over time would be incompatible with the switching regime that ignores common sense operational efficiencies and market realities. The markets in which we compete provide the answer to the routing and the right questions we have before us. 
forcing BNSF to establish new interchange locations that are 30, 50, or even 100 plus miles from origin will negatively impact capacity in the immediate area and unnaturally draw capacity away from other parts of our network. The success of our agricultural shuttle network is only possible because it generates enough traffic density to justify allocating locomotives and maintaining crew bases at more remote parts of the BNSF network than otherwise might make sense. The market-based returns we achieve there allow us to make the investments that drive further efficiencies as well as capacity and keep our customers competitive. Our service approach is that all shippers are treated with the same uh, service and, and rate packages so as to maximize their competitiveness in the global market. A small farmer's co-op purchasing a shuttle train receives the same rate and service levels that a multi-billion dollar multinational processor receives. The board's proposal would upset that equilibrium by unfairly advantaging those shippers who have the time and resources to pursue complex regulatory relief that will subsidize its product and degrade service for its competitors. Regarding service, I also want to take a moment to address our current service performance and what we are doing to improve it. The supply chain difficulties that occurred last year were hard on our network, and we struggled to recover from those as we entered difficult winter conditions. You may hear comments over the next two days that BNSF service isn't very good right now, and those comments would be correct. We are not meeting our customers' expectations, but we are taking steps to fix that, including increasing our active locomotive fleet, and available train crew personnel while also reallocating resources to areas experiencing more critical service challenges. A force switching regime that allocates resources and capacity by regulatory mandate would only make it harder to do what is necessary to recover from intermittent service difficulties. Given the expected downsides to the board's proposal, I think BNSF's customers would be better served if the board instead made better use of the tools it already has available to support growth. The history of our industry shows that the best thing the board can do is to foster growth by allowing markets to function and limit its interventions to identifiable market failures. I'm not suggesting there is no role for the board in our industry. BNSF absolutely believes that you should exercise your authority where market failures make it necessary to protect competitive conditions. The highest of the high rates should be subject to scrutiny. Mergers must be carefully evaluated and merger rights must be enforced. Unfortunately, BNSF's experience at the board on competitive access issues is largely a story of missed opportunity. For example, with our customers, we have asked the board to enforce our merger access rights in Lake Charles, Louisiana. But after nearly a decade, we still haven't been able to directly serve a single new customer there. Faced with a regulatory process that takes years of time, I can understand why it's hard for customers to commit to us. BNSF made suggestions in that case for how the board's process could work better, and we've been supportive of the board's efforts to improve its other processes. I believe that is the path the board should pursue instead of the current switching proposal. Thank you for your time today. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to talk about some specific aspects of the board's proposal. Mr. Bob just described the likely negative impacts on our growth strategy from the board accidentally interfering with our well-functioning market-based customer relationships. BNSF's biggest concern is that the proposal lacks structural safeguards to prevent that unnecessary intervention from happening. This issue shows up in both prongs, albeit in slightly different ways. The, the practicable and in the public interest prong or prong one seems to be the most potentially problematic because it has no gatekeeping standards to prevent a shipper who already has the full benefit of competition from pursuing relief. Under prong one, a shipper could get relief even if it already had access to multiple railroads, to non-rail transportation options, and has a market-based rate shaped by these competitive forces, maybe even a rate that's below 180 RBC. In other types of cases, those elements are a screen to prevent unnecessary board intervention, but here they are not. In this way, the board's 2016 proposal goes farther than NITLEAG's 2011 proposal, which recognized the need to assess competition proxies before board action occurred, including an implicit acknowledgement that the highest rates, those above 240 RBC, are what should be targeted. The necessary to provide competitive rail service prong or prong two 
does at least include a market dominance analysis. But we're concerned that it transforms market dominance from the gatekeeping function it serves in rate cases to an actionable conclusion about the need for board intervention in a switching case. We think that if the board decides to change its switching standards, an RBC significantly higher than 180 should be used as a screen to start the inquiry, not a conclusion that ends it. The lack of safeguards is extra concerning to us because the proposal rejects consideration of product and geographic competition. Failing to account for such competition ignores some of the biggest elements influencing our rates and service in the real world. The existing switching regulations at least let railroads submit evidence of geographic competition, but the current proposal eliminates any reference to indirect competition of any type. When the board rejected the AR's request to consider indirect competition in coal cases about a decade ago, it did so in part because the board assumed that if indirect competition actually existed, the challenge rate would likely be found reasonable, a sort of no harm, no foul approach. But if shippers intend to use switching as a shortcut to rate relief, nothing in this proposal provides a similar safeguard of further rate analysis. In fact, once a location is eligible for switching under either prong, it appears there would be no additional STB inquiry at all, no follow-up on whether rates have been driven below market levels or on the impact to operation or service to other shippers. To me, it's hard to square this approach with Congress's mandate to allow competition and demand to establish rates and service to the maximum extent possible. The second point we'd ask the board to consider is whether the proposal is likely to actually solve any of the perceived problems the board is trying to address. We recognize the board wants to give uh, shippers a less complex, complex path to rate or service relief, but based on BNSF's experience, the juice from the board's current proposal might not be worth the squeeze for most shippers, especially smaller ones. From the beginning of this proceeding, shipper associations seemed driven by a desire to create a more efficient regulatory path to lower rates. The board has done a lot of work to reform its rate case processes since 2016, and now appears poised to make even more significant positive changes with its ADR proposal. We think the board should continue focusing on ADR because it seems unlikely that a complex operational remedy could be a more efficient path to rate relief for a deserving shipper. As one example, under prong one, the board would consider evidence on about a dozen different complex issues, plus the 15 RTP factors. <clears throat> we agree that those should all be considered, but as Commissioner Begeman pointed out in her 2016 dissent, several other fundamental questions about the proposal remain unanswered. If BNSF's history at the board is any guide, it may take years and millions of dollars in lawyer and consultant fees to work through a switching case under the 2016 proposal. More recently, some shippers have turned their focus to service issues, but it seems equally unlikely that the board's proposal would be a more effective remedy for that. As you heard from Mr. Bob, and you might hear from other railroad witnesses, the proposal feels more likely to make service issues worse, not better. If the board wants to address rate case complexity or the availability of service relief, we think the board and its staff would be better served by focusing its limited resources on initiatives that have a chance to actually achieve those goals. BNSF has always appreciated that the board and its staff works incredibly hard to tackle the issues brought before it. We've had particularly productive experience working through issues with the help of the board's RCPA staff. We have seen ADR processes, including our Montana program, be very effective tools for resolving rate disputes. Instead of this switching proposal, we would encourage the board to continue focusing on its existing tools and pursuing reform as it has for the last several years. Thank you for the chance to offer these comments. We'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. Um, the, uh, I have a, a number of questions I'd like to, uh, to ask. I'm not sure which of the three of you I can answer them, so I'll throw them out. And Jill, you can sure. perhaps uh, direct me to to the correct person. Uh, like the other railroads, BN in its written comments has argued that the uh, reciprocal switching should 
is legally limited to taking place in terminal areas. What, what, what is the authority for that proposition? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. The uh, so a couple of things. I mean, I think you can you'll get some very sophisticated legal answers from some outside counsel here. But you know, from from a sort of practical standpoint, there is a reference in the title of the of the statute to terminal, and then also there's a concept that's built in in terms of the idea of reciprocal switching. And so there does really seem to be an element here of of aiming at a remedy that's based in, in terminal areas. And I think there's also a practical policy justification for that as well, despite, you know, the kind of stricter legal argument. And I do think, you know, some Kajel, of the things- Kajel, that, Kajel, can yeah. we, I don't want to cut you off from that. Sure. Being the strict constructionist that I am, um, uh, I'd like to stick to the words of the statute first. Sure. So other than the title, of the whole section, uh, I'm just wondering what, how, where you get any statutory authority. Policy question is a separate issue, which I want to hear. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out how to read the words of the statute. Yeah, I mean, I, the title, like you referenced, is use of terminal facilities, uh, and so this is this falls within that area. There is not a specific reference again in the subsection dealing with reciprocal switching that talks about use of terminal facilities in addition to what's in, in the title. But it does talk about this idea of reciprocal switching. And so in terms of, you know, kind of general railroad understanding and just a sort of a, a common sense element, there is this, when, when you're talking about it's a place where you're gonna be doing reciprocal switching, that is likely gonna be inside a terminal area where there are multiple carriers with the prospect of switching in between them. Something that's you know 100 miles away in the middle of nowhere is un, doesn't doesn't practically fit the idea of what a reciprocal switch is. Are, are so, there are there interchanges with multiple carriers that are not inside a terminal as you understand it? Uh, there could be. Uh, I think practically most of those are going to be within terminal areas, and certainly the places where we have historically done switching would predominantly be within those terminal areas, the traditional kind of terminal areas that the rail, railroaders think of, our shippers think of, uh, and I think if the board has thought of too. Well, you know, I know what railroads think. I don't know what railroads think. I don't know what board members think. I've talked about it with a lot of people, and, you know, a lot of people think they know what a terminal is, and then you ask them, well, is this particular location in or outside of that terminal? They say, well, I don't know. I have to see the map, you know, and then you look at the map. There's no line. So if we're limited to terminal facilities, I'm trying to figure out how we determine what's in or out of a terminal facility. <clears throat> but by definition, if you have switch reciprocal switching, you use, and I'm not sure I disagree, there has to be more than one railroad there. Otherwise, there's nobody to switch it to. Yeah, right? practically, absolutely. Yeah. So if you have an interchange that has more than one railroad operating there, whether it's in a terminal facility or not, you could have reciprocal switching. So uh, I don't see that the word reciprocal by itself <clears throat> carries with it the terminal limitation. So, so one, one I, I, maybe reciprocal is not the word to focus on there, Mr. Chairman. Maybe it's the word switching. Um, because at some point, if you get to a place where you're, you know, as we've heard this morning, 100 miles out, you're really not talking about a switch, in, in my view. You're talking about a line haul movement that's part of a two-carrier move. So, and also well, one other uh, comment. Yeah. About let's leave the mileage out of it for a minute. I'm trying to focus on the words first, just to how to understand terminal. I mean, if you and the others are urging us if we move ahead to limit this to within terminals. I, I assume both you and the shipping world would like to know what we mean by terminal. And the word terminal itself, unless you tell me otherwise, doesn't tell me whether a shipper is in or out of a terminal. Just the use of the word terminal. How do, how do we know whether the shipper is eligible? Well, I think I think there's certainly a lot of places across the national rail network that, that everyone would would agree are constitute terminal areas. And then I think on an individual case by case basis, that's not to suggest that there should be a, a, 
uh, a strict definition of a terminal that would have to apply in every case. I think you could certainly envision a world where you have some very obvious accepted places that are considered terminals, and then you have and some. What, so have what, about to, the, what about the ones that don't? Are we going to litigate whether the locations in or out of the terminal? I think, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I think there's ways that you could come up with setting clear standards in terms of what terminal is. Um, I think that you even referenced with the with the prior panel, the fact that we have publications of where switching takes place. We obviously know uh, in terms of where we have high volume switch locations, low volume switch locations. I mean, this is this is it's it's something that's infinitely knowable. Uh, whether you, whether there's you know work on the front end to identify that or handled on a case by case basis, look, I do I do think for us we are concerned that the board anytime they have a, a regulatory option for customers that it's something that's usable. And so I get that you know I, I identify <laughs> with the instinct in terms of what you're what you're asking for here. I think one of the things about coming up with a definition of terminals um, that is usable also helps in terms of cutting down some of the complexity of the proposal. One of the things that we've thought about is obviously with our experience and some of the other competitive access proceedings before the board, there's a, you can get hung up in litigation on a lot of items. And that's, that's not our goal. We're here to talk about how to prevent that. Not my the, goal either. <laughs> yeah, and when, you, and when you focus on a terminal area, I think there's other, this is kind of the policy item I wanted to mention. I think there are, benefits to when you focus the remedy on a terminal area, which you could spend more time defining what that is, it will simplify a lot of the operational questions. It'll simplify a lot of the issues of operating plans. There's something there that I think by, by focusing on terminal areas, especially places where switching currently takes place, the showing that a shipper has to make gets simplified because there oh, is yeah. switching. Uh, yeah. let, let me take you up on that idea because it's something I've been thinking about and I really would get enlightened by you and the other rail representatives, but you're uh, uh, up now, so I'm going to ask you. I took a look at your tariff 8005D. I'm looking at the document now, BNSF switching book 8005D, which is as I understand it, according to what it says, industries are listed in alphabetical order by rail station and are open to reciprocal switch via junction at that station unless otherwise noted. It's about 16 pages long and it has 126, I'll call them towns, locations, whatever, Maybe it's state is the word, but they all look like towns to me. The first one is Aberdeen, South Dakota, and so on, so on. There are 126 places in your half of the country where it appears that you have a reciprocal switching tariff available to ship one or more shippers in those areas. Are you with? You agree? Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, and you've obviously read it more recently than I have, but it, it sounds it sounds like it works the way our, our switching tariffs work. Yes. I'm reading it now. I'm looking at it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <ahead> <laughs> so I don't know. And so in every one of these locations, you have a tariff for a named shipper and a rate for a switch and the name of the railroad that you will switch them to. Would I be right to say that you can't tell from looking at the tariff that every one of these shippers is actually using the switching? They just have the tariff rate if they choose to ask you to make the switch. Is that a fair statement? Yes, there would be our tariff would just be the the offering that's available right. to the customer to make use of. It wouldn't indicate, you know, the, density of usage. Yeah, that's yeah. that's. But when we say open, I mean that's the terminology I've come to learn. That means if the customer is on this list as having a tariff, and they call up BN and say, "I want to use that tariff rate to make this switch," you will do it. Is that a fair understanding of how the system works? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now 
as I said, I counted up 126 <coughs> locations, and I want to pick up on what Adam said, because I don't disagree that there are many places in the country that most of us would agree are terminals, although we might not agree what the outer boundaries of the terminal are. That's one of the things I find mystifying. I mean, I think about the Chicago terminal. We had a case, which you know about, doesn't involve your railroad involving CN and CP about an interchange in Spalding. And there was a debate uh, at some level, was Spalding in or out of the Chicago terminal? Because it's an intersection of CP, CN and Metra. And, you know, as the chairman of Metro, I might have said, well, yes, if we go there, it must be in the Chicago terminal. But there were plenty of people said, no, it's not in the Chicago terminal. It's too far out. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to have a rule in which we have to litigate that. So let me just ask you a question to give me an example. I've circled some small towns. And you tell me if you think everyone would agree these are terminals. Maybe they would. In your... Um, Tariff, I find uh, two shippers in Muskegee, Oklahoma. Does anybody think Muskegee, Oklahoma is a terminal? Chairman, I am going to have a hard time <laughs> going location by location. Certainly, well, I'm, some, I'm some not going to ask about all 126. Yeah. I just picked out ones that struck me. Yeah. You know, there's another one. There are two shippers in Grand Island, Nebraska who have tariffs. My only point here is, is that I wonder if the word terminal is the most useful piece of syntax to put in a rule, since you seem to permit switching at many, many locations that I doubt we would define as, quote, terminals, but yet you're doing and, switching there, reciprocal. Yeah, switching there. And one thing I would point out is the uh, we have we have various types of switching arrangements so some locations are open because of merger conditions and i believe they would appear in our rule book as well some are because of traditional you know commercial reciprocal switching and so the it, there are better people at the railroad who could talk about the sort of oh, geographic location but, you know, and nature know, of the operations yeah the reason i'm asking this is that you and your railroad and others have talked about, and you talked about it again today, that um, switching, if we ordered cigarette switching, there'd be a capacity degradation and we'd be inefficient and so forth and so on. However you got there, you're doing switching or you're at least open to doing switching at 126 locations as I read your tariff. Can, can we at least agree on that? Yeah, and, and I go further. I mean, I, I, I would not say that BNSF thinks that switching is something that, that, you know, when it's done in the way that we do it currently or that we fight to get in terms of exercising our, our merger rights that we have with our customers, that that is something that's going to cause a catastrophic failure. Um, we, we've shown that we've been able to take a switch and be competitive and, 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 and actually, you know, have it be something that's used by a customer in a in a world real world commercial environment. I think one of the things that troubles us about the SDV's proposal, and I do think it's good that the board's talking about ways to define where this is available, because as it's currently proposed, it is not limited in terms of geography. It's very broad. And so well, it does I'm hold gonna... open the possibility of a whole lot of switching and a whole lot of switching in places where we've never done it before. There's not sufficient right. interchange. There's not sufficient infrastructure. It's you know, well, out, it's, let, yeah. let, let's try, let me see if we can help each other make some progress. Put, put yeah. aside the current draft for the moment, because one of the purposes of this hearing is to see if the current draft should be enacted or scrapped or never dealt with or come up with something new. And that's what I'd like to explore as part of my education into this industry. So let, let me, uh, I, I've got some slides that I prepared and it will be helpful to my, I'm not a good abstract thinker. So I'd like to show you a, a slide and then ask you about it. So I could ask Ian to put up the first slide, which is a page out of your tariff for the Denver area. 
And this is just one of the pages I was just reading from, and it's for, for Denver. It says it's for Denver. And I've just, we put an arrow next to Owens Corning, which, uh, you know, is one of the open locations, right? The way you look at this slide, can you see it with me? Yeah. Okay. Now let me put, let me ask Ian to put up the next slide. So here's, let me say this, by the way, I've got a few slides here, which will be put in the record. All of the things that I, we, I'm asking you to look at, we're in the public domain, and we picked a few examples, mostly random, just so I could ask some questions and you could walk me through without having to do it in the abstract, but actually looking at a picture. So this is a Google Earth. So this is a picture of part of Denver, and there is Owings Corning. Uh, I guess that must be your line there, which is, uh, there's the highlighter, which is the location that's open to reciprocal switching. And it looks like a yard there where they go in and out to perform the switching. All those, all the pink lines are railroad tracks. But then up above there, not very far away, couldn't be more than an eighth of a mile, is a univar site, which is not with the reciprocal switching by BN. So, and by the way, I haven't talked to Univar. They haven't filed any petitions. I just picked them out of a hat to ask this question. If you had a rule that said that if you are a shipper whose traffic is now taken to a yard where you're already performing reciprocal switching, for another shipper like Owens, you become eligible in terms of the geography. Leave aside the standards, whether it's market dominant and service problems and so forth. Just in terms of the geography, rather than putting the number of miles down, what, what would be the interference with the uh, congestion? How, how could it cause any congestion when you take Univar's cars to the same yard where you're taking the Owen cars to allow Univar to be switched to be switched to UP. It's, so so it, I'll start by saying it's a little hard to see this, but but um, we'll do our best. And, and if we okay. want to talk any specific examples later, we'd be happy to do that. Um, yeah, and by the way, there are, in your in your tariff, I didn't count up all the shippers. There's got to be several hundred, maybe a few thousand locations in those 120 shippers in those 126 locations. So you could this you could pick any example. This was one we sort of picked at, at random. But go go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, sure, sure, of course. So so it, you know when you think about, I think the premise here. I think if I understand where you're going, Mr. Chairman, is why wouldn't it be just as easy to switch um, the other facility as it is the Owens Corning facility? It might be. Uh, it also might not be. Um, it would depend on a lot of things. You may have a, if this is in the Denver terminal area, you may have an already maximum capacity terminal area. You may be thinking about a specific uh, type of commodity that's being moved by Unibar. You might think about their particular um, capacity at their facility, um, different types of cars. I mean, there's a lot of operational considerations you have to think about here. Um, and, and, you know, there are reasons, and if you look at our switching book, there are reasons, as Jill said, that many of these facilities are included there. There's lots of different reasons. It could be merger rights. It could be commercial negotiations. Um, th there may be a reason that Unibar is not included in that. I don't know. We have to well, investigate. I'm, I'm, I'm going past how you got there, whether mm -hmm. it was a merger or a voluntary agreement or whatever. I'm only talking about that component of this issue, which keeps being raised by the railroads about inefficient congestions and messing up the, the terminal area. The Univar cars have got to go from their plant to your yard to get on a, even if they're going on a BM train, they don't go directly from the plant to the ultimate destination. They go to the yard, don't they? And get made into a train. I actually don't know that yeah. that's necessarily the case. It depends on the kind of service that we've designed with them. There are scenarios where local operations would bypass the yard and, and you know, Unitrain, other types of kind of block shipments. So, and that's not to, uh, 
let me just step back and say, I do think you did hear me say earlier, hopefully, that I do think that when you're in an existing terminal area where there is switching that is that takes place, that is a simpler case for the board. That is yeah. that is that is definitely a, a lighter showing in terms of the things that that a shipper needs to would that the board has asked the parties to present and discussion. Um, and so I do think there is there is something about being in a terminal area that definitely takes out a lot of the complexity of compared to say creating a switching remedy at an interchange where there's never been that type of, of movement being well, handled. So how did you feel if we had a rule which said we would only entertain petitions for reciprocal switching, at least as a starting point, maybe someday we'd have a broader rule. Uh, if the shipper who's asking for the switching uh, is uh, cars are already going to a yard where other shippers are getting reciprocal switching. Yeah, you've got I mean, 120 I, those locations. What if yeah, we just I mean, I do think, yeah, the sorry. rule to those 106 locations? I think that would. I, I think that would be an appropriate limitation. I think I, I don't think you just you agree with me on the statute, but I think it's more consistent with the statute. I think it also ends up being a, a methodology that that functions better ultimately because of some of the 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 elements that because you're in a terminal area are, are less complex. So right. I, I think that that would be a a meaningful limitation that would have good reason for the board to do it. Well, I appreciate that, Jill. I, I would say the lawyer in me has the idea that if the board were to choose this approach, it doesn't have to make a decision if we're limited to terminal areas or not. We could simply have a rule that says whether we are or not, we're only going to entertain switching applications if you are being switched at a yard where there already is switching because bypasses the question of whether Muskegee, Oklahoma is a terminal. If you're doing switching there, that's one of the 126 locations. That's why I asked the question the way I did. So I think you appreciated the point and that's all I was trying to get at. And I am looking for some way to deal with the practical concerns that the railroads keep raising. I'm not sure I agree with them, but if I can avoid the discussion, then maybe we can proceed to the other issues, which are also we'd have to resolve if we are going to have a rule at all. So, uh, that, Mr. That, Chairman, that was, yeah, that was Mr. All Chairman, I had excuse on this me, subject, but yeah, go ahead, Steve. Um, well, one thing I wanted to add to this this example, um, when we broaden out to have the conversation about open routing, I would be very concerned if one customer could choose to go from Denver to a place in the eastern U.S. over Chicago. And another customer would say, I'm going from Denver to the same location in the Eastern US and I wanna go by Kansas City. I think the open routing isn't, is as this proposal, as I understand it, um, does cause incredible complexity and impacts on capacity. So I think this, this example still calls into question concerns about the open routing possibilities. Uh, I didn't say anything about open routing, so I'm not sure what you're talking about. Can you elaborate on that? What, what are you talking about? Well, the panels this morning talked about open routing from a point, in essentially reciprocal switching growing to an open routing example. I just wanted to point out that, that for a straight up reciprocal switch, I understood your point, but to the open routing, I think that still is a, a concern. That's a separate, that's a separate issue. I, I, I'm, I like to take things apart piece by piece, Steve. So all I'm trying to deal with right now is trying to define, you know, we, we're, we're all over the place in terms of the stakeholders as to where we can have switching. GFA wants it 100 miles from any interchange. Uh, I think the uh, coalition folks said a reasonable distance from any interchange. Most of the railroads say it has to be in a terminal area, a completely undefined piece of language. And I'm just trying to focus in on that aspect of this discussion right now. And I think we made some progress here. So I finish with my question on this point. I'd turn it over to the other board members. Well, Marty, I, I was, if, if no one else wants to go, I'll go. Um, 
uh, you know, I want to say thank you for uh, to, to everyone at BNSF for uh, taking the time to, to sit through this. Uh, it is important. And, you know, I, I also want to, want to acknowledge the fact that uh, you did admit uh, on on more than one occasion that that, um, you know, there is an issue between yourself and the customers. Um, you know, I, I do appreciate that. I think it's good that uh, that um, folks are owning up to, to the reality that there are issues in the network and, and that your customers, uh, you know, and, and stakeholders are, are coming to us uh, to, to demand this type of uh, change and, and uh, to look at this, this issue. Um, I keep reminding and just about every uh, ex parte and every meeting I have with everybody, including the railroads that, you know, this is not, uh, um, you know, a board initiative. This is not something that the board came up with. Uh, this came up uh, as a result uh, of, of um, concerns by your customers uh, more than a decade ago. And so I, I, whenever I hear, you know, the talk and, and it was said during uh, um, um, your presentation that there are perceived problems uh, and that as if to say that that there really isn't a problem, I think I think it's wrong. I think you guys have to acknowledge that there is a problem. And you said there was. Uh, and, you know, we hear about it uh, almost on a daily and weekly basis with, uh, within our, uh, uh, the agency. Um, you know, with, with respect to, to, uh, to, to your service, you know, we've got, I've heard of uh, the problems with, uh, with metering out of, out of Idaho and, and going over to the Pacific Northwest, uh, the issues there, uh, and there, and we've had conversations about that and other issues. So, you know, this is not something that we just sort of came out of, out of nowhere uh, about, and, and, you know, we're just looking at this you know, putting our finger to the air and figuring out, you know, which way the wind's blowing going to make that decision. I think we, we are, we are challenged, you know, in terms of where we're going to go. I think the chairman made a number of, of very key points uh, about how we're going to get there um, and, and some of the methodology we're using and some of the issues. I mean, again, this has been around for, for a while and yes, uh, you know, 2016 and, and proposed rulemaking back then, uh, you know, is out there, but that may not be the map that we're going to use to go forward. I think there are a lot of things we're going to have to consider. Um, I know, you know, we, we were talking about uh, sort of sort of meeting expectations and, and the levels, you know, talking about uh, from 2016 forward, you know, we have to raise the, the issue of, of what's been going on since then uh, with labor issues, with, with, with the like. And, and, I, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, I appreciate you guys coming in and what you're saying, but I think, you know, uh, you know, I, I hope that you guys understand, you know, you know, where this is coming from and, and where we're trying to go. Uh, you know, you guys has been, have said that, you know, you're waiting for, you, you'd rather have the market, uh, uh, you know, make the changes and, 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 uh, you know, determine how best to move forward. Well, I think, uh, you know, we've sort of exhausted that point. Uh, you know, we, we aren't at a good point now with service. Uh, we're not at a good point, as you heard this morning, with uh, from your customers and stakeholders that you know they're they're still wanting to move forward. And I think you know we owe it to them, and we owe it to honestly to the network to to do that. And um, you know, I, I hope that you know after these meetings that we can continue to have that dialogue and figure out the best way the best way forward. Uh, Commissioner Primus, we appreciate that and we hear that. And I and I, I hope I hope that the board understands that you know the place that we start from is 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 a place that says to the board, we do recognize that there's a role for the board. And and we do recognize that there are shippers who are asking the board to to become more involved. And the the message that we would leave with the board is those that it's important in those individual circumstances, that the board does consider that there are situations where there are competitive forces, and that's not an area where the board should be should be putting in place disruptive regulatory intervention. But there are potentially places where there aren't and making sure that there are mechanisms that work in those instances. And so, you know, I think our message to the board is there's an important sorting function that the board does in terms of, of when it when it is when it acts and when it creates remedies. And, and we do not dispute that there should be remedies. We talk about high rates, we talk about you know, service remedies. Um, and so we definitely 
meet the board in that space and meet our customers in that space. Um, but we do think it's important that when the board is considering remedies, especially new remedies that have the impact of reworking networks and also impact other shippers too, that they're being put in place when, when there's an understanding of a need and they're tailored to be responsive to that need too. That's, that's really where we'd like to engage with the board on this. I think Patrick had a question. Robert, are you good? Good. Thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> Um, well, I want to actually pick up where uh, Robert left off, you know, raising important points about uh, the service and, and rate environment. And, you know, and, and I also want to echo his point about, you know, Jill, uh, you and, and BNSF often come with constructive suggestions. And so I appreciate your engagement on the definitional issue that Marty covered. Um, uh, you know, thinking about rates and service, you know, one of the things that strikes me about the proposed rule, particularly the market dominance prong or the necessary to provide competitive service prong, is it doesn't appear to me that there needs to be any showing of a rate or service problem in order to succeed under that prompt. Now, the shippers have made the argument about a prophylactic and the timing issue that, uh, that they put forward um, and the potential for there to be a service problem and not waiting for that to occur. That being said, I, I, I'm wondering if there's anything that you would add to the prong the necessary to provide competitive service beyond the market dominance standard or sort of standard that you express discomfort about um, that in your view would make the prong uh, uh, less detrimental and potentially more effective, uh, but while also preserving um, an effective mechanism for shippers. And I think we highlighted a few of those in our testimony, but to, to, to go back to them, I mean, I think, you know, you talked about with, you heard Steve talk about in our markets, geographic competition is a real thing. And in fact, the ICC recognized that, the board has recognized that that product ge uh, product competition, sorry, geographic competition is a, is a real influence. They've decided in rate cases, it's too difficult. It feels like something that here, where the board is is putting in place a remedy that involves interchange, all the, all the sort of restructuring of, of, of the uh, network that could occur here that, it's something more than straight traditional market dominance is required. And we but, would say but, looking at geographic competition is, is part until of it. You would agree, yeah. you would agree under the existing rule that geographic competition is considered. It is. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So do you have a problem with the burden being on the carriers? No, I, I think the rule was fairly clear that it's the carriers are able to bring in evidence and, and show that. Um, I think that that's appropriate to retain. Uh, I think both parties have information to offer in terms of product and geographic competition. But in terms of the structure of the rule, we'd, we'd live with that. <laughs> so Having in, that opportunity to at least bring, bring the evidence to the board on that. And then the other items you mentioned, of course, raising the RVC a little higher and, and product competition. It strikes me that while product competition, which the board excluded under the current rules, you know, um, it, it, it strikes me that that gets at an, an indirect competitive force and that um, you know, a 240 RVC might suggest that rates are certainly on the higher end compared to maybe some others, but it doesn't actually establish that there's a rate or service problem per se. So if um, imagine a, uh, a rule in which product competition were added with the burden on the, on the carrier, just like geographic competition, and it was a market dominance threshold, but 240 instead of 180, that to, would that to you be sufficient to mitigate much of the downside impact? I think it takes a big step towards doing that. I, I, I think there's a good reason why Knit League's proposal before the 2016 proposal talked about some of these presumptions that were intended to show, look, are we getting closer to a situation where there is actually an indication that there may be some, some abusive market power? And so they used 240, they used other indicators in terms of how much of the traffic uh, a carrier had for a period of time. And that was because they felt the need to fill this space of, is there an actual need for the regulation? And so I think that there's 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 some some things that we could look back in, the, in that record. Um, and I think, like you said, certainly geographic competition, product competition, those are things that that look they're very relevant to the rates that we establish in the marketplace. And so when the board doesn't consider those, it's really getting half of a you know half of the picture of of, of what's going on. Um, and there's downside to that. You know, I mean, it's it. it there's downside to railroads, but there's also downside to other customers who are in those same competitive markets where 
one of the customers, because they've got the time and, and energy to pursue this remedy, may get a below market rate, and then that's taken into their marketplace as a subsidy. And so there's there's good reason to try to focus more and more narrowly on situations that really require action. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't sound to me that you find the coalition associations, and correct me if this is not the right interpretation, that you find the coalition associations points about the, let's call it the prophylactic point, okay? You know, um, y- y- it doesn't sound to me that you don't find that objectionable. But, oh, no, yeah. no, no. You're, t- you're talking about when Mr. Moreno said, let's put the remedy in place before there's a problem. We would absolutely have an issue. Well, with- I'm tr- I mean, but, but, <laughs> but, but if, if all we look at is, for, let's say they're necessary to provide a bit of service. If all we look at is a market, your market dominant, you and let's say we continue to con, we, we continue to consider geographic competition. We add product competition. Those are all competitive forces. Yeah. So it all goes to competition. And then the other thing I hear you say is you know just raise the RVC threshold a bit. But that doesn't that doesn't necessarily show you that the doesn't definitively tell you that the railroad has done something wrong. Absolutely yes, I completely so, agree. So with what that. I, I didn't hear as part of your proposal to make that prong better, let's say, or while maintaining an effective remedy for a shipper while minimizing detrimental impact to the railroad, what aspect of it would actually, you'd actually have to show that a railroad has done something, you know, wrong. I'm using shorthand, of course, but, but what, what aspect, I don't, I don't hear that in, in your proposal, which led me to, you know, sort of, which suggested to me that, that maybe the, the, the delta between what the coalition was saying and what you're saying is not, you want more competitive forces considered and you want a higher hire RBC, but what else? And I think it's I think it's really goes back to the need to show that there's an abusive market power that's showing up in the form of of you know rate or service that's making the shipper non-competitive. And what would be I know Karen's got a question, so I'll, I'll just um, what what to you would be the a service issue that would meet a threshold for ordering a switch? I mean a concrete example. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, it's a little, This, is, it's interesting because the shift to the service focus is recent. So there's, you know, in terms of what MidTech was originally focused on, it was more rate than service. There's not a huge record before the board in terms of either the prior cases or currently how this, how these rules apply to service. I don't know that they were actually designed thinking about service. Um, and so I think that there's maybe some uh, some room there to fill in. I don't know that doing it in <laughs> live on the fly in this hearing is maybe the best approach, but I do think that there is, I mean, if you look back, put aside arguing whether mid-tech anti-competitive, because I know there's a lot of, of, of discussion and disagreement on that. I do think that in the DC circuit case talking about mid-tech, they did identify a pathway where shippers who were experience, experiencing service failures that were a result of the market uh, the market abuse of the carrier that served them had a path to a remedy under service. And so I do think, and, and there were actually fairly specific, and I'm far enough away from it now, but there's, there's guidance, there's principles that the DC circuit articulated separate and apart from the kind of single rule that everyone talks about as being anti, has to be show anti-competitive conduct. I mean, there is a real set of principles that the that the DC circuit articulated there that I think are really good guiding principles in terms of when they thought that the agency would be going too far and when they thought there was conduct that would be concerning. Um, none of that is worked into the board's current proposal. And that's one of the things that that we you know struggle with it as a as a proposal. And one of the things we would encourage the board and parties to go back and look at is is you know what really was what was the DC circuit talking about in terms of principles? Because I do well, think that there's some good concepts. I would, encourage, I would encourage, and not just for you, but for other railroad panelists to provide a concrete example of a type of service inadequacy that would pass muster under me. That would be great. Thank uh, just you. To, uh, I'd like to just add on to that and then I'm gonna call on Karen. I guess the question that I, I, I think what Patrick is suggesting, well, let me phrase what my question was this morning. What would a shipper have to show beyond just inadequate service, if anything, to get relief under mid-tech? Yeah, I think a couple of things. Number one, a shipper has a several different mechanisms already at the board in terms of if they think that there's a, a service issue. There's, you've, you've spoke about some of them earlier, common carrier, emergency service order. And so you're really talking about kind of an additional remedy that's additive to that. The- yes, But if they're bringing, I'm specifically asking Jill, 
Yeah. You're bringing a reciprocal switching case. Yeah. Under the doctrine as it now exists under mid-tech, if, if the shipper's argument is that they're getting bad service, would the shipper, as you understand, have to show anything other than that the service was bad? I do think they'll have to show more than that. I do think but, that there's- well, What is it that- Yeah, there's plus show. factors to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think there's a difference between if a shipper is experiencing poor service because of you know any number of things, a surge in, in the number of shipments that are being tendered, a derailment, all the things that can end up being service interruptions. That should not be a basis for a remedy of switching. But if there's an element of there's a shipper, there's a railroad that is providing subpar service in order to compromise the competitiveness of, of the shipper uh, in order to, um, because they're in, in a sense that's they're abusing their power, they're not trying to be responsive. They're, they're you know, I, I do think that's someplace where MidTech speaks to already. Jill, I understand that concept. What's the actual evidence that the shipper would have to come up with? What, what, what does a lawyer have to go out there and find to put on in a case before the board to meet that standard? That's what I'm trying to find. So you have to take the deposition of the chief marketing officer and say, I don't really care about this shipper and I don't have to because I'm the only railroad there. I mean, you're never going to get that evidence. So what, what will the shipper show? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great question. I think it highlights something Jill was talking about before, which is, um, there's just not a history in the case law under under the uh, 11102 that deals with these service issues um, and could answer that question necessarily. Like Jill was saying, this is a new concept um, that shippers have really brought um, into this discussion since 2000 since 2016. Actually, in the last year or two, really. Um, so, could we theorize what what some facts are, or might lead to a successful claim? I, I guess you could do that. Um, but I think it sort of comes back to the, the the point we were making, which is there's a lot of uncertainty around this proposal, and I don't think the the mechanics of the current okay. proposal answer that question. Um, I'm, I'm not so well, I'm not so sure how new it is. I mean, there's a there's a heading in the circuit court decision about the adequacy of service yeah. as one of the things that they examined, and then they go through three examples that MidTech alleged, and also point out that part of MidTech's original complaint was about service and additional rates. So I'm not so sure that service sort of comes. I, I think service was, you know, and, and even if you look at the text of the rule itself, it talks about the efficiency of routing, looking at costs, but, but all, you know, overall efficiency, which was part of mid text complaints. I'm not so sure that service is a completely new concept in terms of animating competitive access, even under mid tech, but Marty, I, no, I, 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 well, I, I think I, 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 I a number of times, Marty. No, no, Patrick, I'm glad you said it. Cause that's exactly what I, I was going to point out. The only thing I would say, and I did, Karen's been very patient. I want to get to her, whether we, keep the play, current rule in place, have no rule, have a new rule. I don't want to have a rule which puts a burden of producing evidence on a litigant that's impossible to get. That serves no one's purpose except for those people who don't want us to do anything. So if, if anybody wants to promote the idea that a shipper can win a case under the current mid-tech case law, I'd like to hear how that happens in the real world of litigation. Um, so with that, uh, Karen, you're up. Karen, you're muted. Um, this is not so much a question perhaps as a comment um, in various places in considering whether there is adequate competition, it's been suggested that uh, we should look at whether uh, the shipper can be adequately served by trucking. Does trucking serve as uh, a reasonable alternative and cheaper alternative? And my concern is in this day and age, uh, should we be forcing shippers uh, to put their product on trucks? We all know, and all the railroads uh, uh, talk about the fact that the advantage of railroading is that we are removing product from trucks and we are reducing uh, emissions as a result of that. Uh, so should we be taking into account 
the fact that trucking might serve as an adequate competitive factor when we're looking at these cases? So I think there's maybe two concepts there to break apart. I think number one, we agree completely in terms of the vision of bringing freight to rail. That is, you know, Steve Bob's team wakes up every day <laughs> trying to figure out how to make that happen. That's what has driven our growth that we talked about. That's what's going to drive our growth going forward. And so for us, it's extremely important that we are positioning ourselves in the marketplace to beat truck when it comes to service, when it comes to rate. So agree with you there. I think your question, though, is talking about our trucks relevant in terms of the competitive landscape and we would say absolutely yes the fact that we that our opportunity is to lose traffic to truck and our opportunity is to take more freight off of the highways and onto our rail means very much that when we're in a pricing environment those are extremely relevant factors and those ultimately serve as constraints on the rates that we put into the marketplace to win that traffic. And so we certainly wouldn't want, we, we agree completely with the board that anything in the regulatory sphere that is has the tendency to drive things back to the truck is a really bad idea. And we think actually building in and understanding more how those forces inform our rates is, is something that you know, improves the decision-making of the board. Um, so I, I, I fully agree with the premise of your question uh, in terms of, you know, our, our vision vis-a-vis um, -vis competing with truck too. Well, thank you for your very thoughtful answer. Well, Jill, let me just follow up on that. If in order to win a reciprocal switching case, a shipper might have to prove that the carrier was market dominant and the railroad comes in and says, well, we're not because you have trucks. Our service is bad, you should use trucks. Aren't you driving the shipper to the highways? If that's First the of all, you're allowed to make? I, yeah, I can I can see Steve wanting to jump in here. We would never say to someone, our service is bad, so go use truck. We'd say, no, we're, 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 we're going to improve our service so that you stick with us instead of truck. But I'll let Steve <laughs> jump in there. You, you might oh. say it to the board, Jill. That's what I'm talking about, not yeah. to the shipper. Go ahead, Steve. Well, well certainly trucks are a... Uh, are a competitive threat to us. And, and I, I, think, I think one one thing that has crossed my mind as we've been having the conversation today about service is that, is that our customers in a very short period of time have a different set of options than they do over a longer period of time. And, and the, the goal for BNSF is to cure whatever service circumstance we may find at a point in time quickly because uh, we certainly don't want to lose that traffic. But we also know that if we repetitively don't meet our customer service needs, they will find other alternatives, be shifting their manufacturing to a different location, making investments at different locations. And so, um, and I think we have to think about this in both the here and now of the service situation, as well as what the implications are for us long-term. And, and we don't want to lose the freight in the here and now or in the long-term. And and we can lose it to truck or we can lose it to our customers not making investments on our railroad. But Steve, you would agree it's not so easy for every customer to make those shifts. It's on an individual customer, no, it's not. But we can't take that for granted. And to Marty's question, you know, he he had asked, you know, what in addition besides inadequate service? I think that MidTech and I think MidTech is probably more narrow than the, the rules, or at least it interprets the rules in a certain way. Um th that that you also have to show some degree of market power short of market dominance. But you know, I, I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about wh what do we say to the shipper that experiences that uh, experiences inadequate service over a time, not talking about the derailment, you know, or a wildfire or what have you, but you know, a, a, a month, quarter of, of missed switches and can't shift the production to truck and can't open up a new facility elsewhere, these types of things. Um, you know, uh, uh, why is switching uh, why, why ought switching not be available to that customer? I, I think that we have long said that if we are unable to resolve that circumstance, that that is something for the board to, to step in and, and take a look at. That's not a, that's not a new statement by me being a, no, 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 no. I, I appreciate before. that. I'm just sort of, I'm teasing out the whole intent, you know, and conduct and trying to drive to another shipper and these types of, I think, overlays to service inadequacy that is maybe not what, what you just suggested. 
All right, does anybody else have questions for our friends at BM? I have one. Um, you spoke- Michelle, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> you spoke to um, unintended consequences of the proposed rule. I was wondering if perhaps you could highlight what you believe um, the, the biggest unintended consequences could be and whether or not the board should actually consider those uh, consequences when considering uh, a request for a reciprocal switch. Sure. I'll, I'll, yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Well, I was gonna start and, and then you can, uh, you can clean me up, uh, which is what lawyers do for me a lot. But what, what I would say is that the biggest unintended consequences again, go to um, our perspective and concern that this is not just a, a rulemaking that that is about reciprocal switching, but it could potentially move to open routing. And the unintended consequences that, that I was talking about with, with uh, Chairman Overman are about the potential unintended consequences to network operations, to density, to interchange, um, and ultimately to capacity and service. So that, that, that was the first point that I'd wanna make around unintended consequences. Uh, the, the second unintended consequence is to essentially, in, uh, in the case of agricultural markets, you could have larger customers who are capable of pursuing remedies that others aren't gain an advantage that in, in cases where the market is fully functioning, but a larger customer might, might want to seek some kind of advantage in that, in that environment. So those are, those are two that... Uh, that I was addressing in my testimony and Adam and Jill may have some that, that I uh, should be mentioning, but, but didn't. Steve, could you just maybe follow up for a second and explain a little bit further as to how perhaps an agricultural shipper could have uh, gain a, a, a bigger advantage? <clears throat> in the case of the reciprocal switching or in the case of open routing? Um, I, I guess in the case of reciprocal switching, and I suppose if it would lead to open routing as well. Okay. Well, I'll I'll talk a little bit generally about it. But if you have if you have a market that we believe is functioning, where our economics are providing uh, competitive alternatives, competing against either other origins, competing to move our origins into competitive destinations or competing at origin to pull that grain into elevators that are served by BNSF. And so we, we believe that there are, there are competitive circumstances in play. Likewise, uh, we don't believe that our, our uh, grain rates are the highest of the high rates by any stretch. And so in, in that environment, you could have a, a larger um, grain company choose to come in and pursue making a case in, in, in this uh, switching proposal that has a lot of open-endedness to it as we see it today, that, uh, that the board should intervene and have a, uh, a solution that may fit their unique set of circumstances. Meanwhile, they're competing in either that origin set of markets or in a destination set of markets against other customers who may not get that, that advantage. I, I think Steve covered the uh, the largest unintended consequences. I think also, you know, we balance that as well with what I think we've we've been worried about in this context is that there's a willingness to to entertain some of those unintended consequences because it's an easier path than other regulatory remedies that are available. And from our own experience, and Steve and Adam both reference this, our own experience in these types of cases is that they're extremely fact intensive. They're very expensive. And you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out if we're gonna get to take advantage of a lot of those rights. And so the idea that this is a sort of a, 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 an easy button compared to some of the rate reasonableness or common carrier or other types of, of, of remedies that are out there that we know the board has been very serious about improving in terms of the availability, the functionality, the time to decision for shippers, this really, this, this doesn't feel like a step forward in terms of, of, of that mission of the board. 
Yeah, and I think, if Commissioner Schultz, I think part of your question was, is this something we think the board should consider um, as part of this process? And I think that unequivocally the answer is yes. And I think the suggestions we've made about considering things like product and geographic competition on the front end, thinking about possible screens, those are things that would allow uh, the board to speak to those issues and consider those issues in a in a structured way on the front end of a case. And then obviously, if you get into a case, you can think about those as well, but just wanted to make sure we hit that part of your question as well. Yeah, thank you. So Steve, at the risk, of, I thought we were just about finished. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask Steve, if uh, walk me through this fear that you're raising about open routing from this rule. Uh, I'm really having trouble following how, how we get from here to there, depending on some version of the reciprocal switching rule. But what is your sure. yeah, Mr. Sure. Steve? Why don't you? It, and I'm sorry to interrupt, Steve, but, but I, I I wanted to maybe point out something, and then Steve, you can you can get to your actual substantive fear about it. But how did how has that come up? Because I think that Steve mentioned it earlier, and you maybe Mr. Chairman had a question about that. Then, if you go back and look at some of the ex parte meetings that the shipper associations have had with the board since 2016. Um, you look at some of their written comments, there's very specific suggestions in there and the, I think it's in the coalition association comments about um, you're not going to be creating new switches, you're just going to be shifting the location where a current interchange occurs from being perhaps somewhere out here or to somewhere closer or something like that. If you look at the charts that they've put in their ex parte meetings, there's, there's a lot of concern we have when we see that, that they're really not talking about what we consider reciprocal switching, but really are pushing more into what feels like a return to open routing. So let me just with that background, Steve, maybe that'll help explain it. <clears throat> well, I, I don't know that I could add much to that. Uh, I guess, Chairman, it, it's because it's not excluded uh, in the in the proposal as as certainly I'm not an attorney, but as as our attorneys describe it to me, it's not off the table. Well, <laughs> I, I guess I'm I'm not I'm not understanding it. You're arguing uh, for. You know, we talked about the idea of limiting the switching to places where you're already doing reciprocal switching. If if that happened, that would solve your open routing concern, wouldn't it? I would go back to the Denver example that that you showed of, of two customers in the Denver terminal. If uh, one of those customers wanted to go to some place in in North Carolina uh, from Denver, and they wanted to go via Chicago. And the other customer said that I want to go to someplace in North Carolina, but I want to go via St. Louis. That would require us handling those two cars who are originated proximate going to the same place. They would actually have to handle multiple times across our network to make different connections in different geographies. That's the downside of open routing. Well, are you, you're saying the switch would take place in St. Louis. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that potentially okay. one one car would need to be classified to move to Chicago. The other car would need to be classified to move to St. Louis. And so they would move do, on do separate under, trains. Do you understand the, your reciprocal switching tariffs to allow the shipper to tell you which gateway to go through? If, it, if it's moved in reciprocal service, it's gonna go on those other carriers to those destinations. I don't, I don't really understand you. If they're switched at the yard in Denver, they're going on BN. They're not going on UP. And we're going to determine which gateway we take them to the carrier, given the destination, because we work with the connecting carriers to make sure we have the proper blocking. Aren't you going to shift them to BN right in the Denver yard if they have a reciprocal switch? We are. And we're going to take them to North Carolina to a connecting carrier, given where that carrier and us have agreed to do a interchange. I'm sorry, you're gonna, I'm, I'm getting it backwards. You're gonna switch them to UP in the Denver yard. You're not taking them to St. Louis at all. If, if they're going on the UP, then the routing, that, that's not yeah. what I'm talking about. I'm well, talking that's about what reciprocal switching is. If the, if the other shipper in Denver says, I also want a reciprocal switch. I want to go wherever I'm going on UP. You're done with them when they get to your yard in Denver. So what does that have to do with open routing? Yeah, and open routing, is, as I understand it, would be they're saying they want to go to North Carolina. And one customer says, I want to go by BNSF via Chicago and connect with an Eastern carrier in Chicago. 
and the other customer says, I want to go via St. Louis and connect with an Eastern carrier in St. Louis. That's the open routing concern. Well, but that's not what the reciprocal switching concept is about. It's about switching at the terminal in Denver, not in Chicago or St. Louis. I think you're setting up a straw man that doesn't exist. That's why I'm troubled following it. So, Mr. Chairman, maybe I'll offer this comment. The way you're describing it certainly um, sounds more like the way we've in, interpreted the concept. I think the concern that we have is if you look at where shipper uh, association comments seem to have been taking this in their last couple of filings and in their ex parte meetings, it has greatly expanded it behind, beyond what you're describing there. So, so your perspective that it should be more limited and, and work the way reciprocal switching typically works is certainly consistent with what our our well, perspective. I, I don't know what it should be. I'm just trying to understand how the yeah. railroads. You know, I'm still trying to learn this business, okay? So all I ask is, is that if Univar was allowed to go to the same yard in Denver that Owens is already allowed to and switch to UP, that's not open routing because they're leaving Denver on UP, not on BN. And, and, it, and it only really becomes open routing when the shipper starts to designate how the railroads operate with each other and how they want routing to, there, to go and, forward, which should not be a part of this rule. And it's and it's encouraging that you seem to recognize that as well. But I do think well, that that's something that the I, shippers have encouraged the board to do. Whether that should or should not be, is there anything in any part of anybody's reciprocal switching proposals that would permit open routing? I, I think if you, if you, um, if you look back at some of the things that the, I think it's the coalition associations have said, it, it does sound an awful lot like like open routing, where they're talking about changing the, the location of an interchange to be further or closer, depending on where they could negotiate it. Yeah, they provided um, some some visuals of that that would just encourage the board to look back at, and we will do the same because if, if there's something. Well, okay, I, I think we're spent a lot of time on an issue that doesn't belong in this rule, but I understand your. Your concern, and let me just say this: I'm expressing no opinion of my own about whether open routing is a good idea, a bad idea. We should do something about the bottleneck rules. We shouldn't. Those are additional potential issues that, we, that perhaps the board should deal with. I just don't know that they belong in this rule. And I'd like to keep this. I'd like to keep the discussion about reciprocal switching. On you know, you, you said we all know what a terminal is. I'm not sure that's true. I thought we all knew what reciprocal switching was. So <laughs> let's, 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 let's keep it there. All right, gang. Uh, are, are we done with these five, our fine friends from BN now? They're very good natured about it. <laughs> all right. Uh, I think uh, we can keep going with that. How's our court reporter's hands doing? Can you keep going or do you need a break? We can go for a little while longer. Thank you right. for asking. All right. Let's call up UP, uh, CP, I'm sorry. Uh, and that's, I'm going to hope to get it right, this tame, Tama Wh Whitabrew. Did I get it right? Yeah, and, that's uh, perfect. Yeah. And uh, David Meyer. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Canadian Pacific, uh, I am David Meyer, outside counsel to CP. And with me is Tama. You've pronounced his name very well. It took me a lot longer to get it right. Uh, he's CP's Director of Regulatory Finance based in Calgary. Uh, CP supports the comments and evidence submitted by the Association of American Railroads. You'll hear from them later today, I expect. Um, we're here independently, primarily to share CP's perspective and experience with the Canadian statutory and regulatory framework that supports so-called regulated interest switching in Canada. As Mr. Witterbrood will explain, the ability of the Canadian rail network to function with regulated interswitching should not be seen as evidence that the regulatory proposals at issue in this proceeding could be implemented in the United States without having severe impacts on the strength of the US rail network. The lessons from the Canadian experience are first, that the conditions we see today in Canada are entirely dependent on the unique historical context of regulated interswitching and the unique rail geography and economy of Canada. And second, even with those features, forced switching in Canada still causes significant challenges that the regulatory framework and private initiative have had to deal with flexibly. I'll turn it over now to Mr. Witterbrew to speak to these issues in more detail. Thank you, David. 
And thank you, um, everybody, for your, uh, this opportunity to provide some of my thoughts. CP believes that open market competition in the transportation sector has been critical to the renaissance of North America's railroad industry, and it continues to be a key factor in CP's own success. We believe that America's transportation industry greatly benefits when railway companies have the incentive and the ability to bring initiative and creativity to the markets to solve transportation problems and to improve service to our customers. Transportation regulations are an important piece of this puzzle because they can work to either to support or to diminish this competitive spirit. In CP's experience, economic regulations work best when they provide an incentive to invest and to compete, and when market participants are allowed a degree of flexibility to develop solutions and best practices within the rules. In this proceeding, uh, we've heard a number of references to the Canadian inter-switching regulations as a potential guide to understand how a U.S. inter-switching program might operate. Um, since CP has more than a century of experience with these inter-switching regulations, I'm here to offer some of our learnings and observations in the hope that it might assist the board with its deliberations. Um, we've already heard Canada's rail industry um, has been shaped by inter-switching since its infancy. Canada adopted inter-switching regulations in 1904. Just for context, that was four years before Mr. Henry Ford began to produce the Model T. So this was truly still the days of the horse and buggy. And since that time, every decision made by shippers and railways has been made with inter-switching regulations as a backdrop. Shippers have decided where and how to develop their production facilities with the knowledge that inter-switching uh, the inter-switching regulations would be available to them. And railway decisions about developing new markets, retiring redundant assets, and improving network capacity have all considered the influence of inter-switching. Even significant decisions made by regulators, such as permitting CN to assume control of North America's, of, uh, sorry, of the North Shore of Canada's largest marine harbor in Vancouver, was made with the knowledge that these inter-switching regulations would provide shippers with continuing access to those terminals. The inter-switching regulations have shaped Canada's rail industry through the cumulative impact of all of these decisions. And for example, we estimate that 88% of the customers that CP serves directly in Canada are sole served by CP. It is likely that this number would be much lower if shippers were not able to rely on the inter-switching regulations for access to their key shipping destinations. In addition to shaping the physical structure of Canada's rail network, inter-switching has also influenced how Canada's railways operate every day. A railway network is a complex thing on its own and inter-switching magnifies this complexity by increasing the amount of interaction between separate railroads. Canada's class one railroads have had years to develop solutions that help to reduce this complexity and to help to mitigate some of the inefficiencies inherent in inter-switching. Canada's regulators have permitted CP and CN to apply creativity and ingenuity to resolve operational problems as the volume of inter-switching traffic has grown beyond anything that was contemplated when Canada's regulated interchanges were first established. For example, we've developed integrate, integrate agreements in Vancouver and in Thunder Bay, which are two of Canada's busiest marine terminal areas, which allow us to streamline operations and avoid running large unit trains through constrained interchanges while protecting every, ac every customer's access to inter-switching. These types of agreements require years of experience as well as ongoing negotiations and cooperation between independent companies who are otherwise fierce competitors. If inter-switching were adopted in the US, it would be impossible to expect such arrangements to appear overnight. It will take years for railways to learn how best to cooperate in order to mitigate the operational challenges caused by regulated inter-switching. In the meantime, there will be a real risk of significant operational disruption. Whatever the board decides to do in this proceeding, we urge you to protect the railroad's ability and incentive to effectively manage such operational challenges in creative ways. And we urge you to move slowly so that rail carriers have time to understand the operational impacts and to react. Now in Canada, 
Um, with Canadian interswitching, there may be a common misconception that all interswitching in Canada is regulated, and that's not true. There is a significant amount of activity that is not subject to the regulations at all, such as when a shipper doesn't have facilities within a 30 kilometer radius of an interchange. But even the vast majority of interswitching activity that is ostensibly subject to the regulations is not a result, uh, does not a result of direct regulatory intervention. An interswitch move is truly a capital R regulated movement only if it results from a shipper application and an agency order. And in the last 10 years, there's only been one order to the best of my knowledge instructing CP to interchange a specific customer's traffic. The vast majority of interswitching in Canada occurs with no direct involvement of the agency. CP and CN build each other for approximately 355,000 interswitched carloads at the regulatory rates in 2021. Most of this is what I refer to as structural interswitching activity. It's simply required in order to complete the movement because of how the Canadian rail network is structured. Regulated interswitching is rarely used by Canadian shippers as a rate remedy. Canada's experience with interswitching does not inform us about how interswitching might be applied as a rate remedy in the United States. I'll talk a little bit about some of the costs um, of interswitching. Interswitching imposes various types of costs um, imposed on the Canadian transportation system. Some of those are directly observable and some are more insidious. One of the more insidious costs is caused by a loss in the quantity and quality of information available about, about the traffic moving on the network. Interswitching involves the exchange of carloads between two or more otherwise independent rail carriers with independent operations. Even when there's only one other carrier involved, CP cannot see the traffic that is being originated by other carriers today, which CP will receive at the interchange tomorrow. Therefore, when it comes to interchange traffic, it is difficult to proactively act to reduce operational problems when they arise. For example, because CP cannot see both the origin and the destination for interswitch traffic, we can't predict congestion problems before they happen. We're not able to react to congestion until it's already a problem. This was a contributing factor to an instance of widespread and long lasting congestion in the Vancouver area in 2018. In that case, both CP and CN issued embargoes on interchanges and certain dual serve facilities so that we could work to resolve the congestion. These embargoes were required because the railways were unable to work directly with shippers to avoid congestion before it became a problem. So whatever the benefits may be, it may be said that the interswitching regulations in Canada have created a rail network that is at least somewhat more fragile and prone to congestion and other disruptions. Uh, interswitching incurs more tangible costs as well. Um, we've heard elsewhere interswitching requires at least two extra assignments in order to complete the movement. Uh, there's a significant amount of dwell time at the interchange as cars wait for receiving carrier to come and collect them. And interswitching also creates significant overhead costs for railways. The employees of the railroads involved must be in constant communication in order to efficiently execute interchange traffic and avoid delays and congestion. Managers must maintain interswitching agreements and billing and executives have to spend time negotiating interswitching agreements and operating practices. Fortunately, our Canadian regulators have allowed the industry to develop creative solutions in order to minimize the delays and congestion caused by interswitching while preserving shippers' rights. CP will continue to compete vigorously by providing exceptional service and value to our customers, no matter how the regulatory environment evolves. But we urge the board to consider carefully not only excuse me, not only the anticipated benefits, but also the potential costs and consequences of any rule changes. We hope that our input will assist the board to do this. And we hope that our experience illustrates that the Canadian rail industry is in a very different place as regards the ongoing impact of inner switching after more than hundred years of experience with this regulation. So in conclusion, we urge the board to move carefully. Thank you, Tim. I just have a couple of questions. You said that uh, inter, uh, 
reciprocal switching requires more touches or more moves and so forth. If you follow the question I was asking of BEN, if, you, if we were to decide to limit reciprocal switching to the yard where the cars are going anyway, it wouldn't be an extra move, it'd just be which track you put them on. Um, well, I mean, that helps um, to keep it in the, the area where the customer is being served and if there's an interchange in that location. The reality is though that, um, and I'm not an operations expert, but I've been involved in, in uh, some of these types of operations and reviewing them. Um, even where the, the traffic originates very close to the interchange, um, there's often a separate assignment that will move the traffic from the um, classification yard, which is the railway's main yard, main serving yard, to the interchange. The interchange may be physically um, connected to the railway's main yard or maybe um, somewhat separated. And so there's a, quite a few examples where we do have an extra assignment specifically to, uh, to complete the interchange portion of the move. But that's not for every reciprocal switch, right? Just for some. I, I couldn't say with 100%, I would tend to agree with you. It's not for every switch. Uh, the only other thing I would say is I understand you urge us to move slowly. I would say on this docket, the board has taken slowly to an art form. 11 years is uh, it, just like I, we, we said, we all know what a terminal is. We all know what moving slowly is. And I would say 11 <laughs> years is slow. Uh, I didn't have anything else, Tim. I appreciate your comments. Your point on that is taken, uh, Mr. Oberman. Um, I would just add, though, that I'm more talking about after we begin, if we begin to enact regulations, after we begin to enact them, um, not to open the floodgates all at once. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I've taken to heart what many of the shippers have said, and that is that uh, the likelihood that the floodgates are going to be open, no matter what kind of rule you have, is small because of the cost and complexity of any kind of case that might be brought. Uh, so anyway, th thank you. Are there other uh, other uh, board members who have any questions for Tama? Hey, I just have a quick one, Tama. Again, I appreciate uh, your 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 comments, um, and I agree. I do agree, uh, as the chairman did also about uh, not opening opening the floodgates uh, uh, all at all at once. Um, I want to ask about that 2018 uh, problem in Vancouver, and I. I think it's also sort of symbolic. I mean, if, if you're if um, switching's been in, in engaged for over a hundred years and you're having a problem in 2018, that tells you that well, it's been working for long enough that maybe there was just a hiccup. And you know, if you could comment on that hiccup, uh, obviously you guys solved that problem and you continue to switch uh, successfully. So, what? How did you solve that problem? Um. I wasn't directly involved in solving that problem, but I would say we solved the problem by working together as much as possible with shippers and with our partner railways in the inner switching in order to smooth out those traffic flows. Um, we focused on the areas where the congestion was and we stopped sending traffic there for uh, as long as it took in order to relieve that congestion. Because um, in the railway world, once you have congestion in one location, it tends to stack up. It gets worse, not better, until you take proactive action. Um, I appreciate your question, and I don't think I'm here to tell you that Canadian inner switching is a nightmare scenario in Canada, the way that it's been enacted. Um, you think it's, it's successful? I, I don't know how to qualify whether it's successful. It, we inner switch every day. With, uh, with our partner railways, with uh, primarily with CN and uh, with some of the US class ones. And we do inner switch primarily um, without major congestion issues. Um, does inner switching apply costs, overhead costs, dwell time costs, the information problem that, that I discussed? Yes, it does. There are those downsides to it. Um, the initial objective in Canada um, of applying, of, of creating those regulations back in 1904, uh, as I understand it, was to prevent railways from having to build in, um, you know, multiple 
network lines into the same facilities. <clears throat> so um, the railway and the shipper could rely on the inter-switching regulation to take care of that for them. That aspect of it, I think, was successful. We see, um, as has been pointed out before, we see that CP and CN's networks are relatively parallel. And I think that might be partly due to the, the, the inter-switching uh, regulations. Um, but as to say whether it was successful in the long run in terms of are we in a better place today than we would have been without the inter-switching regulations, I don't know. I do feel that the network is somewhat more fragile. Um, I did point out that, as I said, we estimate that 88% of our own Canadian customers are sole served by CP. And yes, many of those have access to the inter-switching regulations, but it kind of implies that in Canada, um, we're more or less married to those inter-switching regulations. We couldn't ever get rid of them or, or change them too drastically because the network has, has evolved with those inter-switching regulations as a basic tenet of how we right. uh, operate. And it has evolved. And, and at the same time, not all of your customers utilize it. Is that correct? No, that's correct. They don't, they don't all utilize it. Okay. Okay. And the last time I checked, both uh, CP and CN seem to be doing pretty well financially. Um, yes, I think that's fair. Okay. Good. Thank you. Appreciate that. If I, if I may just say a few closing, closing thoughts. Chairman, you're muted. Or you do. Did anybody else have questions for Tama? I did. No? Uh, just Michelle? One, yes, just one quick question. Um, you indicated that switching, um, if implemented as, as, as we've set forth, would in fact potentially increase costs. I was wondering if you could speak to uh, how CP would handle those costs and would it be possible that they would be passed on to the shippers? Uh, I mean, to the first part of your question, I think we would try to handle them in much the same way that we handle them in Canada. And that is to work with our inner switching partners in order to come up with arrangements, whether it's formal agreements or more informal operational practices, whatever they might be. Um, inner switching does complicate the operational landscape and you're going to have um, different circumstances to deal with everywhere that, that it occurs. Um, so every time that we, we get into an inner switching um, scenario, we'll probably have to spend some time working with our inner switching partner in order to, to um, maximize the efficiency of those, those movements. And that's what we would do. And again, I would hope that the, any regulations that we had would, would permit that flexibility. In terms of passing the cost on to customers, I mean, at CP, we're generally, not generally, always pretty much opposed to um, cost-based pricing. We don't price our service in order to hit a specific margin above cost. Um, we do price our service in order to, um, to achieve optimal market outcomes. We price our service in order to compete. Um, we price our service in order to maximize the amount of traffic that we're able to move. Um, so I, we're not going to directly pass on those costs, I don't think. Um, I, I, I don't think I have the, the authority to specifically speak for CP and, and promise that's the case, but the way that CP operates, I don't believe we're going to look at the cost um, calculation and say, okay, our, our cost to move this car has gone up by 10% and therefore, at least for that inner switching portion of the move, and therefore our rate will go up by 10%. Um, however, at the end of the day, the costs have to land somewhere. And, um, you know, in, in my limited studies of economics as a science, I think realistically, some of it will land on the, the railways and some of it will land on um, sort of the broader public stakeholder as a whole, and some of it will probably land on shippers. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Tama? David, you're on. Thank, thank you. I just, just wanted to sh uh, share a very brief thought before we go. Um, you know, I think what you've heard from Tama is that the Canadian regulatory environment really is a regulatory environment that the railroads there, railways, they say, uh, have adapted to for over a century. And 
our, our main point is whatever you see in, in Canada today is, is not evidence of what would happen if you flipped a switch and turned on the same regulatory environment in the United States. You see the end result of 100 years. You don't see the adjustments necessary that would occur in a system that's grown up without the kind of regulation that is being proposed here. Um, now CP is an enthusiastic supporter of marketplace competition, just like Congress was when it adopted the, or enacted the Staggers Act and ICTA. Uh, and competition, Congress has said, is the best way, the best means to ensure that the benefits of a, a strong and effective rail ne network are brought to rail customers and the broader economy. As the board knows, CP is in the midst of a transaction of our own that we believe will inject significant new competition into the rail marketplace. Uh, this is not the time, obviously, to discuss that transaction. I, but I can say that CP intends to use whatever tools are available to it in the marketplace to compete aggressively for the transportation for customers that we're able to serve, including whatever new tools the board might end up creating as a result of this proceeding. But respectfully, uh, we, we share the view that you're going to hear from AAR much more about, which is that the forced access rights that are being discussed in this proceeding really are going to inject new regulation, not real marketplace competition into the U.S. rail network. And, and we respectfully urge the board not to take that step. Thank you for your, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, anybody have any questions for David? Uh, okay, so it is now 3.07. We have to hear from UP and we are scheduled to hear from AAR. So let's see if we can't make a stab at doing that, but I think we all need a break. So let's take a 10 minute break and reconvene at 3.17. Thank you all.
All right, we are back in session. And our next uh, group, same panel, uh, is uh, Union Pacific. Uh, there are four people, Jennifer Hayman, Kenny Rocker, Eric Geringer, and Michael Rosenthal. Are you all there? We are. Yeah. Okay, who wants to lead off? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the lead off batter today. Uh, so, all right. good afternoon. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Oh, okay. Well, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Oberman, Vice Chairman Schultz, members Fuchs, Primus, and Headland, and board staff. My name is Jennifer Heyman. I am the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Union Pacific Railroad. I, along with Eric Geringer, Executive Vice President of Operations, Kenny Rocker, Executive Vice President of Marketing and Sales, and our Council, Mike Rosenthal, want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Union Pacific about the reciprocal switching proposal currently before the board. My colleagues and I are here today to discuss how the switching proposal would financially and operationally impact what we have all learned over the last year or so is a very fragile and complex global supply chain. And more directly, how it would impact Union Pacific's customers. Specifically, let me outline how forced reciprocal switching adversely affects current and future capital investments along the railroad. Without a doubt, our goals and our customers' goals are intrinsically linked. Our customers want their products delivered safely and on time with minimal variability. And Union Pacific is committed to meeting those expectations. Beyond that immediate alignment, it is in Union Pacific's long-term strategic interest to grow the amount of traffic on our rails and to be the partner of choice for our customers. The current switching proposal appears intended to provide customers with increased carrier flexibility. However, I can unequivocally state that this increased flexibility will distort crucial signals that help us allocate capital effectively and will disrupt the fundamental investment model of the rail network, a model that has produced the safest, most efficient, and most effective national rail network in American history. The impact of that distortion would limit or hinder the rail's ability to invest for growth, which in turn attracts investment to our industry. During my 30-year tenure, Union Pacific has consistently established and communicated its desire to grow car loadings, setting annual growth targets and releasing multi-year plans that are rooted in a commitment to growth. We want to grow and invest for the future, and in fact, our owners want us to grow as well and we must prudently allocate our dollars based on the information that is available to us and the certainty of that information. Our investment priority first and foremost is our infrastructure. Beyond that, Union Pacific is committed to a competitive dividend as well as responsible share repurchases. We have been quite consistent in this capital allocation strategy, which is necessary for us to compete for capital against other publicly traded companies, including many of our customers, but also to compensate our shareholders for their investment. To support our growth plans, Union Pacific routinely seeks areas of improvement along our rail to increase throughput and reliability. With our capital investments, we specifically target nodes with rising demand and operational delays. These capital investments serve as the catalyst to ensure our network is flowing efficiently and meeting our customers' needs. Unfortunately, the switching proposal alters these crucial dynamics and creates uncertainty. The risk of switch traffic reduces our incentive to allocate valuable capital dollars to areas where we could lose traffic, where there's uncertainty about traffic growth, or where we could be forced to handle traffic for a competitor without adequate compensation. Specifically, the proposal interferes with our ability to forecast and allocate resources. We are responsible for both network investments and investments benefiting individual customers. Under this proposal, a customer can focus on its own short-term interests without regard to the needs and demands of other customers or the network. To its credit, the SCB has said that it would act in each case to safeguard the interests of those other customers and the shared interest of all stakeholders in a fluid, well-functioning and capable network. However, Union Pacific cannot invest under the assumption that the STB will successfully defend those interests in every case, nor will investors assume that level of success. As currently proposed, reciprocal switching would limit UP's ability to proactively invest in the network and must then be accounted for by Union Pacific and its investors. This is especially concerning 
because it will inherently limit prospective investment needed to both maintain and grow an ever burdened supply chain. It would particularly impact the rail link in the chain, which funds its own infrastructure investments and is one of the most emissions friendly transportation modes. My concern about investment is not merely speculative or hypothetical. For example, we partner with our plastic customers to support their growth initiatives. In just the last five years, which includes the start of an industrial recession and a global pandemic, Union Pacific invested around $115 million in storage and transit facilities in Texas and Louisiana. Here, Union Pacific evaluated both the gain in business and whether that investment would lead to an increase in network capacity. This strategic investment has helped us and will continue to help us serve our customers and improve network fluidity. However, these investments are not made without careful planning and consideration, working with our customers to understand their long-term goals and objectives. And the phrase long-term is important here. The average life of our rail assets is more than 40 years. If Union Pacific were performing this evaluation in a switching proposal environment with no certainty about returns, we would have needed to consider whether the infrastructure investment would result instead in decreased fluidity and loss contribution to the benefit of a competitor. I liken it to allowing Burger King to use the grill at McDonald's. Would McDonald's invest in a larger grill with better cooking technology if there was a real possibility that Burger King would co-opt the use of that grill? This is the added risk of the switching proposal and would almost certainly have changed Union Pacific's cost benefit analysis for the storage and transit facilities negating the viability of an investment that is helping our customers grow and improving network fluidity. In addition, because of the network nature of our business, capital investments in one area directly impact the system as a whole. Thus, the switching proposal changes the paradigm across the network and makes all capital investments riskier. The proposal degrades our ability to evaluate a project's margins and impedes identification of capital expenditures that would benefit our customers, the global supply chain, and our commitment to zero carbon emissions by 2050. If our underlying financial investment is hindered by this proposal, our ability to make investments like, in President Biden's words, the largest purchase of American-made battery electric locomotives in all of history would also be hindered. I encourage the STB to maintain an environment where the US rails are successful and are supporting a booming American economy through massive investments for growth, better service, and lower emissions. Change is often valuable and should be welcomed as an opportunity. However, increased risk equates to less activity and a more conservative approach to network investment. This switching proposal limits the rail industry's ability and motivation to flex resources and make capital investments in the network, and ultimately, will become another source of inflation in the US for the US consumer. I now pass the remainder of my time Derek. Good afternoon, Chairman Oberman, Vice Chairman Schultz, Senator Fuchs, Prime Minister Edlin, and the board staff. I, like Jennifer, would like to thank you for your time today. I'm going to focus on how the switching proposal would prevent us from providing the reliable, consistent, and efficient service we must deliver to retain and grow our business. Earlier today, you heard complaints about PSR, and first mile, last mile service. Switching is not a cure for those complaints. Switching would magnify existing service challenges and make future problems more likely. As I will explain, the switching proposal would build delay, longer cycles, greater congestion, and increased complexity into the supply chain. We would find it more difficult to plan and manage our network resources, and our network would be more vulnerable to disruption. We would be using more resources to move the same amount of traffic instead of using our resources to better serve the existing and new business. This proposal inherently complicates the supply chain network. It would make that network less agile and less predictable. As Executive Vice President of Operations at Union Pacific, my job is to keep the railroad moving fluidly and efficiently while planning for market changes and keeping our employees safe. The nation's supply chain is a delicate arrangement of movements and handoffs that must be well-timed and closely synchronized to main fluidity. Each increment of complexity is a source of error and dysfunction. 
Each increment of complexity also reduces transparency on the network for our customers. The switching proposal makes the rail network and overall supply chain continuously vulnerable to new sources of disruption while failing to promote the stated goal of improved service. One of the key vulnerabilities for the supply chain is the handoffs between service providers. This is true for handoffs between logistic providers and the overall supply chain, as well as the handoffs within the rail network. To maintain fluidity of the network, the handoffs must be well-timed and synchronized through significant planning and communication. Reciprocal switching increases the number of potential points of failure by injecting new handoffs into an already complex and challenging system. This proposal would lead to desynchronization and bottlenecks. Additionally, this proposal will make proper resource planning and resource allocation for the complex network significantly more problematic. It takes time to adequately plan for resources to be sourced in the appropriate areas of the network. Locomotives cannot be everywhere at the same time, and they do not appear overnight. The proposal will inject unforeseen demand into the network due to the unavailability of certain equipment. These are long-term assets that need proper planning. Also, people are not interchangeable. We staff our crews due to their qualifications and understanding of how to do work in certain areas or in a particular location. This proposal assumes that any crew can service any area of the network. And that is simply not the case. Each crew goes through specific training to meet the needs and demands of the network in a defined area. Moreover, we have received feedback that our customers want the same crew serving them, so the crews do not make mistakes in picking up and setting up their cars. This continuity of talent is an integral point in sustaining fluidity in our network. Our network is a series of tightly mapped out links. If one link goes missing, the chain or the rail network would be incomplete. By decreasing traffic density and injecting inefficiency into operating plans, the long-term health of the network will be affected by the proposal. Transit times will significantly increase. We don't have to speculate about that impact. Reciprocal switching that we currently perform typically adds 48 to 96 hours of delays due to cars traversing the terminal twice. The cars subjected to reciprocal switching would remain in the yards, consuming more capacity, interfering with service, and diminishing our ability to build traffic density. Let me address a misconception about current switching that occurs in our network. Railroads already reciprocal switch, so how do, would this proposal be any different? There are many instances of reciprocal switching that currently exist on the rail network. That is absolutely true. These situations differ from the proposal before the board in that these situations were long planned and deliberate. Additionally, because we were aware of these switching situations due to mergers and or consolidations, we were able to evaluate the network to determine if it could sustain the switching and to plan adequately with resources to support these switches. We utilize and leverage the appropriate resources in our network to address this voluntary switching. More important, these situations are narrowly tailored, limited in number and location, and mitigated in advance by significant changes in the phys physical network of the merged railroad. This switching proposal is not a solution for improving service. On the contrary, it will degrade service and it will create very different challenges over and above normal traffic fluctuations, volume seasonality, and increased response time to unpredictable events like weather and fires. Under the proposal, Union Pacific could not mitigate the impacts of force switching through processes we normally use to try to anticipate and adjust for dynamic changes and uncontrollable events. The proposal complicates the network, driving fragility and raising uncertainty. This would increase the customer's transit time as surge resources are not available at a moment's notice and not sustainable, and again, take time and planning. Let me also say this. Union Pacific wants to compete and welcomes competition. The board has received comments that railroads are against reciprocal switching because they fear competition. This is not the case. We compete hard and we welcome competition. We take business from one another all the time. We also welcome growth and we welcome continuing to have positive impact on the supply chain. I urge the board to consider the severely negative consequences this proposal will have on the overall US supply chain and our customers rail service and experience. Thank you for your consideration of my deep concerns about force switching 
look forward to addressing any questions you might have. I pass the remainder of my time to Kenny. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the reciprocal switching proposal currently before the board. First, let me begin by saying that we've been talking to our customers. Based on their feedback, we better understand where they see pressure points in our network. And I can tell you today, these points identified by our customers will only be exacerbated by the switching proposal and our ability to improve those points will be frustrated. We also have spent a great deal of time listening to our customers. We wanna better understand their processes, their needs, their plans and their challenges. We wanna know how we can improve their customer experience with us. What we've learned is simple. The most important value that customers seek is consistent and reliable service from their transportation provider. With this switching proposal, there will be a higher potential for variability of service because force switching increases the number of connections between two railroads. One of our chemical customers has shared with us that the increase in variability of service will negatively impact its costs in several ways. In reviewing the feedback, we realize that this may be something that all customers understand and experience. The biggest concern for our customers is in the loss of sales if production is slow or halted because of delays in getting their rail cars to their facility. Customers are also concerned that shipment delays may cause them to use truck transportation at a higher cost to move their product to M receivers. They are also sensitive to service variability because it causes increased cycle times, which forces customers to respond by requiring more rail cars and increasing inventory carrying costs. Those concerns can quickly create real, tangible, and increased costs for our customers. For instance, if we assume the cycle times for manifest traffic increase by 24 hours and customers would need to increase their fleets by 3,200 rail cars, a chemical customer shared that a one day increase in transit time would translate to an additional rail car lease cost of 100,000 annually and 350,000 in annual inventory carrying costs. Those general customer concerns would arise in the environment created by the switching proposal. Our customers have also been demanding a seamless and transparent user experience, and Union Pacific has been working to meet that demand. We have made significant investments to improve the customer experience. When a customer ships on our network, they know the rail car ETA from the time the car is waybilled or received by Union Pacific. Our online shipping management and API service tools give customers increased shipment visibility. That visibility enables our customers to better manage their inbound flow of rail cars. The proposal would undermine that investment by hindering those transparency and technology tools. For instance, we do not get an advanced ETA for interchanges from foreign railroads to Union Pacific at the final serving yard. The actual number of rail cars being delivered on a train to Union Pacific from a foreign road is only known the day of train arrival. This does not allow Union Pacific to plan for and manage the flow of rail cars. As a result, it could cause our serving yard to exceed capacity and not be able to provide timely and reliable service to our customers. Our customers would face increased shipment times and not be able to properly service their customers. Overall, the supply chain would continue to be overburdened by the inability to satisfy the customer demand due to a slow transit supply. As Jennifer and Eric have both stated, railroads create vital links in the nation's supply chain. If you add more links to that chain, then there is added risk of failure inserted into the process. Variability is a customer's greatest concern and adding complexity promises to increase that variability for our customers. With multiple handoffs, there is an increased risk of service variability and a much greater shipment visibility challenge for our customers. With additional parties inserted into the movement, there will be less visibility for customers to know where the shipment is at any given time. This creates additional contacts for the customer to resolve issues. The increase in service complexity increases the likelihood of disruption and adverse ripple effects across the broader supply chain over the course of these proceedings, we've heard arguments that force switching works in Canada. 
so it must be able to work in the United States. I'll let our Canadian colleagues address their experience with how force switching works in Canada. But I think it's fair to say that the US rail network is different than the Canadian rail, rail network in many ways that will force switching would be more harmful to our customers. With all due respect to our Canadian colleagues, the challenge they face is just not as complex as what we're dealing with here in the United States. We estimate that Canada has approximately 3,700 rail served customers. Union Pacific alone has more than 10,000. More customers mean more switches. In addition to the far greater number of customers, the US system is far more complex, interlocking and web-like. All of this greater service and network complexity requires us to work closely with our customers to plan and bound shipments. And Union Pacific must keep an eye on the big picture the whole time so we can avoid the congestion and service inconsistencies that will create the negative experiences our customers particularly want to avoid. We understand several customers might choose reciprocal switching. However, we are deeply concerned for the customers who are bystanders to that choice because those bystanders would be negatively impacted by customers that chose reciprocal switching. We are here today because Union Pacific values all of its customers and makes decisions that consider the entire network. In closing, Union Pacific is working to improve our service product to maintain consistency and reliability. We've invested in more technology solutions to enhance the customer experience. I urge the board not to inhibit those efforts. Thank you for your time and consideration of my remarks. Good afternoon. Uh, you've heard Union Pacific describe the harms that would result from adopting the proposed rule. Both railroads and their customers will be worse off. You'll be hearing from other panels about why railroads don't believe the board could lawfully adopt the proposed rule. Nonetheless, Union Pacific is interested in having a conversation with stakeholders, larger and smaller railroads, customers, and their organizations to try to address the concerns that prompted the proposal while avoiding its negative consequences. We suggest drawing on the collaborative process that produced the current competitive access rules, which for all the criticism they've received in recent years, once had widespread support. We believe the board should convene a committee with stakeholder groups and ask them to work to try to find some common ground. Thank you for your time, and we'd be happy to address any questions you have. Uh, thank, thank you all. Um, now, Michael, let me ask you first, have you discussed this idea of a committee with any of the shipper organizations? I'm not sure that the topic has been broached yet with any of the shipper organizations. You think you could do the work in less than another 11 years? I would hope so. I would think that if we were to move forward with this, there should be a reasonably fast time period to give us a chance to try to do this. I think what we've seen, even in this most recent round, is a bit of a shift in position and some different concerns. And we want to understand what those are as well. But I don't think you should expect to wait another 11 years. But I do think it's worth taking the time to develop a rule that has wider spread support because in the long run, that's more likely to be effective than to proceed with a rule that is going to face additional challenges for it could be implemented and serve its intended purpose. Well, I appreciate that. I've been waiting for a constructive suggestion. So let's see if people are interested in pursuing it. In the meantime, I have a few questions. I should have said, by the way, at the outset of this session, 
for timing purposes, and I'm, I'm as long-winded as anybody, so I'm not uh, at all criticizing. We have a very crowded agenda. And it, as I said it this morning, it's not my intent to cut anybody off, and I won't. We're going to try to stay here tonight to finish both the UP presentation and AAR. Uh, may require us to work a little bit late. Otherwise, I don't see how we're going to get tomorrow. So I wanted to give everybody a heads up. If it really gets too late, we'll have to just, uh, you know, reconvene in the morning if we don't finish AAR's presentation today. But I hope we can. Um, the uh, uh, I'm not sure who I should direct these questions to, probably Kenny or Eric, but I wanted to talk to you about, uh, as I did with BN, your existing reciprocal switching arrangements. I've been looking at the UP tariff number 8005F, which I assume you will recognize as your reciprocal switching. You call it a circular and it lists I've roughly counted them up somewhere between five and 600 customers in, uh, in 77 different locations around the Western half of the country or your territory, a little bit Eastern. You mentioned, one of you mentioned earlier, I think it was you, Eric, but I'm not sure it may have been Jennifer, that you do a fair amount of reciprocal switching now because of merger agreements and other requirements, but I don't think you're telling us that all of these 77 locations came about only as a result of being ordered to do so by the board in a merger. Would that be fair? That would be fair. Yeah. Sir. Right, Kenny, you wanna, I'm not sure who's going to who I'm talking to here. So <laughs> you tell me who's the appropriate. Person. So I'm not, I haven't looked over the entire five to 600 pages. I think, yeah, that's that's fair. Five, I, I think that's fair to say your, your assessment though. Yeah, it, it's not five or 600 pages that I have. The actual list of customers and locations about 16 or 12 pages, but there are 77 separate locations on it. And, if, and all of the customers who have a, a right to reciprocal an agreement to reciprocal switching with UP are listed. Uh, and there are about four or 500 of those customers I estimated by just a quick count. And I know that you have, uh, UP has taken the position uh, that the other railroads have that reciprocal switching should only be in terminals. But I don't read these locations as all consisting of what most of us would think of as terminal, terminals. Would you agree, Kenny? That you have reciprocal switching going on at places that are not really terminals. I think each one is on a case by case basis. I'd have to look at all 77. Well, let me give you a couple of exam examples. Hope, Arkansas, you have a reciprocal switching agreement there with Tyson's. That's not a terminal, is it? We have a terminal in Hope, Arkansas. Yes. Okay. Yes. How, about, how about Enid, Oklahoma? Yes, sir. So you would regard every one of these as, as 77 locations as a terminal? Uh, Chairman, I, I wouldn't say that either. Uh, to Kenny's point, I would have to see the whole list. Just it happens to be the two that you selected. I know we have terminals in both of those. Uh, all right. Well, I didn't want to go through all 77 or we'll be here all night. But I'm really trying to get at the point that isn't it more important if we're trying to figure out the feasibility of where reciprocal switching can take place as to where you've already made arrangements for it with existing customers? Isn't that a better definition than just saying terminals? But Chairman Oberman, I, I would say that there, there are two issues here. One, to the extent that Union Pacific has voluntarily agreed with a shipper to provide switching, um, that, that's one thing. That's a decision that Union Pacific could make. I think that's separate from the question of what perhaps the board could do under the statute in order to require a restricted switching. Well, are you, is it your, are you the person who makes the contention that the statute limits it to terminal areas? We took that position yeah. in 2016 filing, yes. What, what's the basis of it? The basis is that the term reciprocal switching, which is used in the statute, had a well understood meaning at the time that reciprocal switching is something that occurs in terminal areas. 
And so that meaning we assume is part of the statute and is encompassed by the definition of reciprocal switching. Who, who, when you say it was well understood, by whom? It was, it was under board precedent in our 2016 filing. We cite some cases that discuss it. And in fact, when you look at the board's history or the ICC's history of dealing with these questions about terminals, you'll see one of the earlier cases, Golden Cat, in fact, was dismissed because they concluded that the shipper who was requesting switching was outside the terminal area. So it's, a, it's an issue that's been litigated. There's precedent, like any precedent, you have to look at facts and apply it. But we think it was understood at the time of the statute what reciprocal switching meant, that it was limited to terminal areas. And we've seen it applied in cases that have come before, well, the, uh, before the agency. I've looked at the, at the uh, legislative history and I don't find any reference to any of those cases. I find the Congress using a different term in subparagraph C than it uses in A and B, where it specifically mentions terminals. So uh, I'm not sure where you're coming from. Well, I, I think right. wasn't Golden Cat a 96 case, though? So I think it's for precedent after. Staying. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. You're not going to see those cases, the cases I'm talking about. Some of the cases I'm talking about mentioned because they came and they were applying the, the decision. I'm talking about there were cases beforehand about what reciprocal switching was, and we think it was well understood, you know, something that would occur in the terminal area. The other point is, if you look at other sections of the statute, when talking about uh, imposing terminal trackage rights, you see language about a reasonable distance outside a terminal. And I think one of the basic principles of statutory interpretation is that you see language used in one part of the statute, and it's not in another part, that it's going to mean something different. So we think the area in which the board could impose reciprocal switching is different from the area in which it can impose terminal trackage rights if you just well uh, I, I agree I I agree with you that when the legislature uses different language in a different section it's intended to mean something different and in the reciprocal switching paragraph it doesn't use the same language that it uses in the terminal trackage rights area it doesn't mention the word terminal at all so I think it the argument goes in both directions. But what I'm really interested in is understanding the argument that's frequently made here is that it isn't practical as to where, where it is practical to do switching. And I know there's a lot of criticism of the shippers' proposals about allowing it at any interchange. But if you're already doing switching at these 77 locations, wouldn't it be fair to say it's hard to argue that it's impractical to do reciprocal switching at the places you're already doing it? I think as you as you start thinking through that and the different factors, the fact that we do it, I would agree with you. That's a strong indication that we did that one thing. We can say, yes, we do it today. Where we go further, though, and, and many of the other members today have mentioned it, uh, the participants have mentioned it, is then getting beyond that to how do we think about the type of service that that particular customer is asking for? How do we think about the customer's dwell time, which we would argue is going to be significant 48 to 96 more hours um, through reciprocal switching? How do we think about connection times to other railroads? So I think it's an indication that to your point, Chairman, we do it so it's we can do it, but I think there's many more steps after that for us to consider on will it actually add to the service benefit of the customer. Well, Eric, let me Marty, ask you a question. Marty, I don't want to go too far on this. I just want to circle back to the Golden Cap point because I think it's an important one that we should just get absolute clarity on, if you don't mind, because no. I think we're exploring the fact that A has terminal in, in it and C does not, right? And uh, Michael, uh, Ms. Rosenthal, isn't it the case that Golden Cat was a terminal trackage rights case? And I don't think Golden Cat in that case alleged a subsection C case, which is what we're discussing here, uh, didn't make the case at all under that subsection. So is that, does, is that case really prove the point? It, it wasn't a reciprocal switching point, but there was a question about whether you had a terminal area. So I, my, I was citing that for the, for the point that right. there are definitions out there about what is a terminal area. Well, well I, but I understood the chairman's point to be that A and C are different and we should draw significance from that. So it doesn't strike me that an A case would, would necessarily disprove the point on C. I'm not, no. it can't be disproven by other means, but I'm just sort of trying to figure out why Golden Cat 
was the one that disproved it. No, Golden Cat, Golden Cat doesn't disprove anything. As you say, Golden Cat was under a different section. The point yeah. was simply that there are def was going to the question of is there a definition of what is a terminal? Is there STD precedent and ICC precedent for that? But no, section C talks about reciprocal switching, which we're saying implies a terminal. A is different because it talks about a terminal and a reasonable area outside a terminal. And I think C I, is, I, is different from all of that. I think that's a really helpful clarification. I appreciate that. Thank you, Patrick. I am wise to call on my lawyer, on a colleague on the board to clarify these for me because he, he had read the case and I hadn't. So thank you, I appreciate that. But, but Michael, they, I, I have seen ICC precedent which talks about reciprocal switching normally or usually taking place in terminal areas. I've never seen one that says it's only permitted in terminal areas. Well, again, so as, I I am, said, I, as I said, Mr. Chairman, as I said, if, if Union Pacific or some other railroad wants to voluntarily engage in reciprocal switching, I think that's a different question than what the board could impose under the statute. So it, it could well be that both of those things exist. But I think the, the question here is what the board could impose under the statute. Well, but you're arguing about how it was understood by the Congress when it adopted the bill, and that would be based on what actually happened in the real world. So it seems to me you can't really have it have it both ways. Well, I, I'm, I'm talking about if you, I mean, if you could point to an example that happened before Congress adopted it, where that language came in, perhaps. But I think we're pointing to, and we do this in our 2016 filing, a lot of older cases that established, I think, a pretty clear understanding of what reciprocal switching was. Well, I'll read your filing again. I don't think I've ever seen a case that says the board can only order it within a terminal area. I'm more interested in the practicalities of it for this line of questioning, you know, that's what I wanted to deal with because we've had a lot of assertions about, um, you know, tying up the system. So uh, Eric, I I'm a little confused. Are you telling me that these five or 600 customers that you now provide reciprocal switching for in your 77 locations all have 48, uh, 46 to 98 hours of dwell time when they do a reciprocal switch? So let's, let's clarify one thing. So if we look at across the system, Chairman, uh, if you look at all the cars that we deliver and pick up on a daily basis, only 6% of those are reciprocal switched. So 94% of the time we do not do reciprocal switching. I'd have to look at every single one of those lists to confirm whether all the five or 600 customers were being reciprocally switched. But for the ones that we do currently reciprocally switch, it's our experience, at least on our railroad, that because of the connection to another yard and dwelling there, that you're going to get 24 to 48 hours on the outbound side of additional dwell, and then you're going to get the same thing, of course, if it's a round trip back. That's how we come up with the 48 to 96 hours of dwell. And, and Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, to build upon what Eric just mentioned. I mean, for these new cases, uh, we have significant concerns about it. We think it's a bad idea, uh, primarily under the um, points that the variability will ultimately uh, be harmful to our customers. I pointed to some, I pointed to some uh, examples of where we've got higher inventory carrying costs. We've got, as someone talked about earlier, customers investing in their rail cars, uh, more rail cars that need to be acquired. Uh, increased variability does not help us uh, with competing against truck. All those things really just uh, make for a, a poor customer experience for our, our customers. Right. Well, let me, I appreciate that, Kenny. I want to get back though to Eric, you said, I thought, and now I'm a little confused, that re if we order reciprocal switching, it will result in 46 to 98 hours of delay. That's what I wrote down when you were speaking. On a, on a round trip, we would say 48 to 96 hours is our current experience. All right. And you're saying you've got all these customers who have opted for reciprocal switching, even accepting that they've got 46 to 98 hours of delay. It, let me ask this question. Is that more delay than they would have if they didn't reciprocally switch? I don't think I could go through 500 and tell you uh, definitively right now whether they would get less delay or more delay if they did not have reciprocal well, switching. Well, you've got a dwell figure for reciprocal switching. What's your dwell figure for the people who aren't reciprocally switched? And they would be, in, 
because they're not being reciprocally switched, they would not incur that additional time. When we think about that time, Chairman, what we're really talking about is the fact that I'm going to spend on average one additional day getting that car from the customer into a terminal. And then I'm going to spend another day as I switch that car uh, into, excuse me, we're going to spend the first day switching the car into the yard and the next day getting it over to the other railroad. So well, let me, uh, let me see if I, if I can walk me through this. Most customers, are, the cars are picked up either by a short line or a local train and they're taken to a switching yard, right? That's correct. And then they're put onto a track and a train is built. Most 94% of the time, it's a UP train. That's correct. Right? The reciprocal switching customer is taken to the same yard typically, right? Not necessarily. Where they, our, by the local train takes them to a different yard? A local train from a different carrier would take them to their yard and then switch them into our yard, which is why we say that's 48 hours. Wait, wait, you, lo you lost me there. If a different, the customer is going on a different carrier, why, are the, why is the other carrier bringing them back to your yard? If we have the, if we have the uh, line hall share of that. Uh, so, I thought so, we're talking about somebody who's reciprocally switched. They're going on a line hall on another railroad. So, Mr. Chairman, just, just, to, just to clarify, I think it, it depends whether you're looking at it from the empty car coming in or the loaded car coming out. Well, let's, let's take it one at a time because, you know, I'm not a railroad person. You've got to walk me through this. You've got a shipper. You know what? Uh, well, I have some photographs I was going to show you, but I think you can walk through this. You've got a shipper who has a loaded car that's on your line and it's ready to leave. Right, a local train picks that car up. If it's not reciprocally switched, it's being taken to a UP yard where it is sold on a UP train to be taken wherever it's going across the country, correct? That's correct. If that same car is going to be reciprocally switched, let's just take most of yours, the reciprocal switching is gonna be BN. Is BN local train picking it up from that on your track? No, just, just to clarify, we're picking up that car, we're yeah. taking it to our yard, we're classifying it into a block for the BN, Yeah, it comes to our yard to pick it up, or we take that car to them, to their yard, to depart the train. Okay. So, and you're saying, so for the most part, that car is coming to the same yard, whether it was going on a UP or being reciprocally switched. If it's not switched, it's going to get built into a UP train. And if it is switched, either UP or BN locomotive is going to take it over to a BN yard where it's put on a BN train, correct? Or the BN could come to our yard to pick it up. Yes. Right. And you're saying that adds 24 to 48 hours for that car. That's our current experience with yeah. customers that get reciprocally switched. Yeah. And the customer who's made that choice has obviously decided that's to their benefit even to buy that much extra delay or else they'd go on your train. Well, the customers made the choice for, for them that that's the best decision for us. But as we consider what we just walked through, there's repercussions to first our terminal as we think about capacity, but then there's also the repercussions of the customers that aren't involved in the reciprocal switch. You heard in testimony earlier today that we can see increased congestion by reciprocal switching. Adding well, how, does it, how does this cause increase? The example, just the simple, I want to just stick with this simple example that I have. There's really only one extra move, and that is from your yard to the BN yard. How is that causing congestion in the system? So today, if we weren't doing reciprocal switch in this example, we follow the same process you and I just walked through. That local and its delivery into the yard is going to be timed up to be able to leave on that Union Pacific train, uh, say within six to ten hours. In the case of reciprocal switching. And the fact that either we have to take it to the BN or the BN has to come get it from us. Now we're contending with two different schedules. We've got to sync those both up. It's also one thing that I don't think anybody's mentioned today is we still, it's not as simple as we just come and pick up the car or the BN just comes and picks up the car. We still classify the vast majority of those cars, which means that on the day the local brings it in, we're still spending another 24 hours as we get it into the proper block 
so that the next day we can take it to the BN and the BN can come to us. But why does it take you 24 hours to put it in a block for BN and only six hours to put it in a block for your own train? Because in most cases, when we interchange across from yards, that's only done once in a single day. There are, of course, exceptions, Mr. Chairman, uh, but in general, that is done once a day versus if it was our terminal and you have mainline trains coming through, not only could you originate the car at less than 24 hours, but you could also do a work event with it inbound train that's just picking it up maybe even just a few hours after it got all right so let's take the a situation where you now have an existing reciprocal switching customer who who's willing to go through this 24-hour delay because obviously they think it's better for them to go on the bn price service or whatever now we add another customer in the same area who decides they want to do reciprocal switching too now, same local brings them into the yard and it's put into the block that's going over to the BN. Why does that add congestion? Well, really for the same reasons, depending on the schedule for taking it over to the BN and then taking it from us, you now have another customer that's bringing in those cars that's gonna occupy track capacity until we take it over to the BN or the BN and come gets it from us. Yes, so. Are you assuming your yards won't have capacity for one more car? So I, I think when you think about it in single digits, there are, it would be, I would be hard pressed to say that there is a yard on Union Pacific right now, a single car, but I don't think we're talking about single cars. And certainly as we think about running the railroad, I can't think about it in single cars. I've got to be thinking about it for the next two, three years. And as Jennifer pointed out in her testimony, that's also how we're thinking about our best. So I've got to be focused on the long term and assume it's not a single car and plan accordingly for that. And there are terminals on the Union Pacific that could not handle that today. All right. Well, let me ask you this question. Are most of your shippers, whether they're on your uh, own trains or reciprocally switched, switching back and forth every week, or are they making long term arrangements with, with you as a railroad? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not following your question. Are you, oh, I, you have a reciprocal switching customer who has a right to be switched over to BN. Are they going back and forth between BN and UP every week? Or are they making a long-term arrangement typically with BN and all their cars? You know, I would have to go through each one of those to know if we're, if we're doing that. Um, well, uh, what's typical? Uh, with 500 customers, uh, at least the ones you've listed, but only 4% of our volume. I still don't think they're switching back and forth on a consistent basis, but I will say we would have to confirm that by going through those 4% of cars. Well, and, and I might, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could just interject, I mean, we were listening to the, to the prior testimony and certainly we heard the customers talking about their desire to have reciprocal arrangements uh, completed and approved ahead of time so that they could make it, our interpretation, they could make moves back and forth if they were experiencing an issue that they didn't like on one carrier or another. So well, what I'm what asking, being... Jennifer, is what happens in real life. I heard what I heard the rhetoric was. I'm trying to understand how the railroad operates. It would seem to me, from what, what my understanding of the way most arrangements are between shippers and class ones, is that most make relatively long-term arrangements. They're not, it's not efficient for the shipper to be on a different railroad every week to get customers. Well, Mr. Chairman, we've said this, uh, Jennifer, all of us have been on the public uh, earnings calls and, you know, we do have about a third that can move their business day to day, a third that's annual and then the re remainder are multi-year. So there's a significant portion that could move back and forth to what Jennifer and Eric are saying. Well, I think if you want to persuade us about the long-term planning difficulties, I need a, a little more information. Uh, because it, it doesn't seem to me that it's that hard to, to plan for these things. The other question I had, Eric, is that most of the proposals for reciprocal switching, and certainly the current one, talk about the board evaluating a request on a case-by-case -case basis. But well, why do you think if the UP came to us in a reciprocal switching case and said, look, this yard can't handle it. We've got a shipper over here who wants to deliver cars a day to us. We're filled up now. You don't think we'd take that into consideration in determining whether reciprocal switching met the standards, whatever those standards ends up being? 
I don't doubt that the board would take that into consideration, but in the case by case approach, it, it doesn't dismiss in our minds at least that for the customer and for the customers who are not gonna give our sense of usage, that the impact is still, uh, it's still intense for them, that they still will have an increased transit time. Now, as we think about the fact that we may have those terminals like that, it's a consideration amongst many, but we would still call back to the fact that as we think about service today and the customers that we have, they're not asking us to take longer to, to go from point A to point B. They're asking us to be, as in most cases, to increase our transit time or at least continue to sustain what we have today. And this would not well, do that. You, you've got five or 600 customers who, according to you, have been willing to buy a 24 to 96 hour delay. So at least some of them, seem to, to want it. But the Ch real question is, the real question in my mind is all of these concerns that you've all raised here, why can't they take be taken into account? And if you are right, we will evaluate it. Other customers are going to come in in a reciprocal switching case and say, don't do it. It's going to mess up our service. We'll be able to take that into account. Why, why do you assume that board would willy-nilly just order reciprocal switching in a way that's detrimental to the rail network. Chairman Oberman, I don't think it's the, the concern about the board acting in your words willy nilly. It's about the uncertainty that's created because what would be available then is for shippers to come forward at any point in time, at any potential location, depending on how obviously the, the proposal is put together and ask for a reciprocal switch after we have potentially invested millions of dollars over decades to serve that particular customer. And now they're going to be asking for uh, us to have essentially subsidized our competitor for them to be able to come in and, and serve them. That's the concern, sir. They may be asking for it, but you're assuming they're gonna get it. I, I'm just not following well, this. <laughs> But Chairman, you, you're, you're saying you can help, you can address a service issue on a case by case basis. But what you can't address on a case by case basis is the issue that Jennifer was just raising, which is the investment. Right? That's not a case by case basis. That's that's an effect that your rule is going to have the moment you put it into place and signal that it's going to be in place. And that's not something you can address on a case by case basis. And what we do know on a case by case basis with regard to services, as Eric has said, is that in every single case, it's going to result in worse service for the customer and risk the service we provide to other customers. Well, that, that, that's not a case by case. That's, that's an impact of the rule. It's an yeah. inevitable uh, impact. Well, uh, and I, uh, Marty, Marty, I, I have to, um, I didn't want to chime in. I know we're on for time, but I mean, no, I, no, no. go ahead. I, well, I guess, let me just add, I'm just going to say one more thing, Robert, and I'm happy to refer it over to you. I just don't assume that rail customers are going to come in and ask, put hire a lawyer, spend a lot of money, wait a long time to get an order for, from us that's going to provide them with worse service than they're getting now. I just find that hard inference to draw. Gentlemen, the, 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 the first panel essentially said that all these customers and, and the comments of the customers that came in said, we want this in place. We want it in place in case. And so they, they've told you they're going to come in and file something so that they have this option in their pocket. And if just they, have they, it again. If they can meet the standards. You already got 500 customers who have the option in no, their pocket. But, but, I don't see the difference. Chairman, the, the difference is we don't know exactly what the situation is for those 500 customers. These are reciprocal switching situations that were put in place voluntarily over time, in many cases, it's probably because it was more efficient given the way the networks were structured that a shipper actually switched to another carrier to make their route. In other words, Union Pacific might not have had an efficient route, so we agreed to open up the situation to a, another shipper. A shipper said, we'd like to locate here on you, but gee, we also ship to a place served by BNSF. So if you could open up switching so that on those routes where it's efficient, we'll use BNSF, and on the routes where it's efficient to use UP, we'll use UP. And I suspect that's what you're seeing. It's not customers who are taking 24, 48, 96 hours just for the heck of it. It's because that is their best service option. It's their best service well, option today. Well, let, let me just say this, Michael, with all due respect, 
I, I am interested in the actual experience of these people and not what, what you suspect or what's hypothetical. And that's really been the focus of my questions. I have some more, but let me defer to the other board members who want to weigh in here. Robert? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just be quick. You know, I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed sort, sort of what I'm hearing in a sense that, you know, we all, everyone thinks that, you know, we put this, this rule in place and everyone's going to run to reciprocal switching because now they have an option. And I, I, I go back to what I, I've told you, uh, 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 your folks and every other uh, railroad I've, I've spoken to is that, you know, you know, this issue, this problem, you know, is, is self-inflicted. We're, we're trying to figure out how to solve a service and a rate problem that was brought by your customers. You know, and, and so if, if you're worried that they're gonna, they're gonna bolt, you know, that's something that you guys can, can fix internally. You know, this is, and Marty has said before, and I've said it, I know other board members have said it, you know, we're not, I don't wanna be here regulated or, or, or passing rules. I'd rather for the market to fix the problem. But this has been 11 plus years that's been before the board. And you guys come today and say, we want to sit down and be part of the solution. I mean, you're 11 years late. And, and, and to me saying now that, oh, well, now we're worried about our infrastructure and others. Well, if you're so worried about it, then start delivering better service on that infrastructure and better rates. And then we wouldn't have these folks before us asking us to do what, what they're asking us to do. I hate being in this position because I'd rather see you guys fix it. I'd rather, I'd rather not be sitting here listening to you guys. I'd rather see you guys fixing the problem, but you're not. And that's, that's what we're dealing with. And, and when you hear the, when you guys give these, these examples and, and, and make these statements, you know, you're only making the case in my mind, why we should go through with it. Not why we should try and work to, to, to let you guys try to fix it on your own. So, and again, I'm not, I don't have a question and, and I, I, I want to keep my statement, my statements brief, but you know, it's a little frustrating to hear what, what I'm hearing because it doesn't sound like you guys really understand what's at stake and what, 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 your, what your customers have been telling you for the last 11 years, 11 plus years. Patrick? <laughs> yeah. just, just real uh, quick, uh, member Primus. You know, we've paid for third parties, uh, JD Power to come in and survey our customers anonymously. Uh, we send them surveys twice a year. We look at our net promoter scores and take them very seriously. Uh, Eric and I have spent time uh, actually surveying customers. We've inserted the whole company to have a very uh, customer-centric culture. And so we do know our customers. We spend a lot of time with them, and we know more than anything. They do value that consistent, reliable service. That is the most important uh, you know, value for them. And what we're saying today is that this for switching would um, uh, really create problems for us trying to accomplish that. Well, Kenny, it's, it's your customers that are coming to us. I mean, I've only been on the board for a little over a year and I've heard directly from your customers too. I haven't heard from JD Power. I haven't heard from any other third party. I've heard directly from your customers as, as soon as actually last week when I was in Milwaukee at a conference about the, these issues. And so again, we're not making it up. I, you know, this isn't something that I'm coming here saying, I wanna do this. This is, the, this is the, as a result of, of 11 years of submissions by your customers. Michael, you shake, shake your head all you want, but it's true. This isn't, this isn't our, our issue. We're asked, we're asked to make a decision right now because of that. Not one board member you can poll said they came to the board saying that they want to do reciprocal switch. I didn't come to the board saying I wanted to do it. And yet here we are because we are asked day in and day out by customers, not just from yours, but from the board to fix the problems that are currently uh, 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 before the network. I'm dealing with a problem right now, dealing with your, 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 uh, one of your customers. So, it's, not, it's just, it's, it's, again, I would much rather, Kenny, that you sit down customer centric and fix this problem yourself. I mean, you got reciprocal switching going on and people aren't, maybe they're not using it. That's, well, that's a great testimony. 4%, Eric, that's a low number. And if you guys can deal with that and you say, hey, you know, we can get around it, then that's fine. Give me an example of how you're working with 
and how like you, you convincing people not to do it. But, you know, to say, oh, well, you know, it's going to hurt our network and, and infrastructure. And, and, you know, we're talking to our folks. Well, we're talking to them, too. We get the same response, the same visceral response that, that it's not working. And all I keep telling you guys is, is, hey, it's up to you to fix it. We're the last line. We're not the first line. We're the last line. And member Primus, make no mistake, we want to provide great service to our customers. We know that we need to do that to be able to grow with them. And that is very, very important to us. This, this whole discussion is very important to us. That's why you have the four of us here speaking with you today. Um, but we do not believe that this proposal will improve service to our customers. In fact, we very adamantly believe the opposite will happen. And so while, you know, Today is a, is a point in time, and there's a lot of different things, as I talked about in my testimony, I think Eric and Kenny both touched on it as well, that are going on in the supply chain today that are impacting customers. We are one link in that, and we're certainly not doing what we think we need to do, and we have every person at Union Pacific up against that today. Uh, but, but this proposal will not fix that problem. Uh, this proposal will, in fact, make that problem worse, in my opinion, and in the opinion of Union Pacific. Fair enough. Patrick, did you have a question? Yeah, I, you know, and I uh, appreciate it, Marty, and uh, appreciate Robert, your points about it. certainly when service, there are service challenges on the network, we, we definitely hear more calls for, for regulation. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about uh, UP's uh, planning point. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me about the proposed rule is even if UP were providing adequate service to a particular area, and even if they were providing reasonable rates, it's possible that they could lose an access case. And so even if they did fix it for particular shippers, they still remain vulnerable under the rule because of the circumstances of market dominance, as opposed to particular conduct of any type, whether or not you call it anti-competitive or, or not. And I think that's part of the conundrum with the rule. And shippers made points uh, uh, as to why that, that is a, a feature, not a bug of the rule for sure. Um, but I, I just, I, I just thinking about, I think your important points, Robert, I, I, it just strikes me that the proposed rule, um, is not necessarily tied to any particular detrimental conduct, whether or not you want to define anti-competitive conduct in a certain way, even if you just say inadequate service with some degree of market power that, you know, that doesn't even inadequate service doesn't need to occur for a railroad to lose a case under, under the proposed rule. Um, but at the same, you know, to, on, on the other hand, and I think it's important to mention, I'm, I have a question in here, <laughs> um, is that, you know, I, I think it's fair that a lot of shippers have difficulty planning when there are service disruptions and adequate service, especially over a long period of time. You know, they, they have to invest in their facilities as well. And so I guess my question is, you know, um, Mr. Bob in the previous panel indicated that when a shipper um, has an adequate service over a long period of time, and does not have good competitive options. I'm not saying is in a market dominant situation, but doesn't have good competitive options. Is reciprocal switching on the table for something that could be welfare improving, understanding we also have to look at the operational effects on the railroad. Is that the type of thing that you think should be available to a shipper like, like Mr. Bob seemed to indicate? I can just kind of echo uh, number of pukes, what I mentioned earlier. It's really about the entire supply chain. That one customer may have an adverse impact to the other bystanders and other customers that are in that area. And that's the concern that we're bringing up today when we talk about the links in the supply chain. But if you're, if you're talking about like I'll say episodic or unusual events that occur I think we already work very well with one another in the rail industry to try to overcome those issues. Um, you know, I know when we had the wildfires uh, last summer and fall, we worked very closely with the BNSF helping them out. They helped us out so that we could continue to provide service. So that is something when you have those episodic things or something that's going to have, I'll say a very near term real impact to customers. We work very closely with all of the railroads and, and, all the, the pieces and parts of that customer supply chain to help them out. That's something that we're, we're quite familiar with and, and are willing to help jump in and help our customers with on a daily basis. And I appreciate that, but couldn't the current rules be read to provide for 
the scenario that I'm describing, inadequate service over a period of time when there's some degree of market power? And am I understanding the point that UP even thinks the current rules go too far? Or are, am I not reading the current rules correctly? So I think the current rules do have some element of anti-competitive conduct or at least conduct baked into them in looking at you know, what is actually in the public interest and when is additional competition needed. So again, not directly in the the reciprocal switching context, but in the, cl the closely related context of, um, of 10705, Union Pacific litigated a case involving uh, access and routing to a, to a power plant in Arkansas. And part of the question was, was you know, there were allegations about our service um, and there was evidence back and forth about what was the cause and what was Union Pacific's response. And did we respond like a disinterested monopolist? Did we take advantage of our monopoly position over this particular plant to give it worse service than others or to ignore its needs? And that was a, a fact-based question that the board looked at. So, so service is an issue. Service over time is an issue. But I still think you have to look at why and what does that service actually tell you about whether intervention is in the public interest or intervention is, is needed to provide competitive service. So what would be a concrete example of something where intervention would be justified via service? So I, I think, you know, if you'd look back to the mid-tech case, if, for example, uh, the, the question is, are we providing poor service on a route where we're handing over traffic to BNSF at some interchange point because we'd rather favor our own single line shippers uh, of foreclosure. I think that might be a case. Are we providing poor service? I mean, even, I mean, I, I, Michael, sorry to jump in. I'm sorry, no, no, continue, please, please. Oh, no, I'm saying, I mean, I, I think there, 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 there might well be cases where, again, we're, for, we're acting any competitively to foreclose an efficient interchange because we want to, or we're indifferent or want to hold on to the traffic, but we're providing them poor service because we don't think we have to offer, um, you know, offer a, a joint rate, offer an interchange. So I, I think I think there has to be an element of, of monopolistic indifference in addition to the service. I think you're still asking whether competition would matter, and you have to look at it on a, on a case by case basis. I do think there cases that would meet the test. I think if you look back at the allegations in mid-tech, at the allegations in um, a case like Vista Chemical, I, I think there are factual scenarios where a shipper could win. They just didn't in those cases because the allegations they were raising weren't true. Or when you look back at what the railroads were providing in terms of service, there was evidence that it, that it wasn't indifferent, that they were well, I, 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 I want to just hone on this point just a little bit more, which is, you know, in, in the D.C. Circuit and reviewing, Midtech said that, you know, people with market power will either raise rates or they will potentially ration or provide lower quality service. And, you know, and, and Midtech itself said there was either approach, right? One was the classic anti competitive conduct, right? And then it said, or inadequate service under either approach they fail. And so foreclosure was in the first part and not the second. And, you know, the way that the DC Circuit described the actions of someone with market power was that they were providing bad service. Now, you know, you know, the, the, the evidence of their indifference is that they're not being as responsive as you would expect in a competitive market, just like you would expect someone who's charging unreasonable rates to not charge anything close to marginal cost prices. And so I, I, I guess I'm, I, I'm still grappling or searching for what additional evidence does a shipper need to provide to show monopolistic indifference besides they don't have very good options and service has been bad for a period of time? Because I, I think the answer is that you have to look at least at the justifications for the service issue. In, in the energy case that I'm thinking of, they were complaining about problems with service from the power delivery base 
And what Union Pacific explained was these problems weren't specific to energy. They were affecting competitively served shippers as well. And so when you, when you look at the issues were affecting both types of shippers, you can't conclude from that that the service is bad because one shipper is solely served by Union Pacific. So I think so I think there's you still compare a question. whether or not competitively served shippers are. I, I understand. I think that might that might be an element to show that that there is some element of anti-competitive conduct. You can't just say service is bad. Service suffers in cases for, for many reasons and it can be extended. So I think you have to look beyond it, just it, you know to oversimplify if UPS was suffering the same issues as a, as a scrap steel uh, uh, shipper for well that actually wouldn't be a good example as a grain shipper as a uh, 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 that might be that might be something to take a look at is if UPS was providing markedly better service didn't have the same service failures as um, you know some sort of carload shipper. And we effectively do that today as we even with UPS to your example as we think about control and uncontrolled failures. So you're exactly right. right. I appreciate that very much. The helpful discussion, Michael. Uh, but just to follow up on that, I, I'm having a little uh, trouble translating your answer into, in the real world, what is a shipper, what kind of evidence does a shipper have to come up with to, to win a case under mid-tech? You, you said there's some anti-competitive aspect. How do they prove it? I think like you would prove any other case as a lawyer, depending on what the standard is, you have to focus in some cases beyond your own experience and you have to look at the experience of other, of other shippers who are exclusively served and those who are not exclusively served. And if we're talking about, again, that, that specific example of the energy case. Well, it, we, know, it, we know what the standard is to some, whatever the mid-tech court left us with is what the standard is. So I'm trying to figure out but the mid-tech court said that bad service is the best evidence of, uh, of, of the most probative, I think it said, of anti-competitive behavior. Is it sufficient, bad service? No, I, I, think, I think where it becomes probative is that if you look and you see what the service is for shippers who actually do have competitive options and you compare them to the shippers that don't. And if you found a, a, a pattern where the shippers who don't have options are treated differently, that, that would be a pretty strong factor that it has something to do so, with the competitive situation and not a larger problem that's affecting everybody equally. So in order to win a reciprocal shipping uh, switching case under mid-tech, the shipper's got to go out and do a whole bunch of discovery of other shippers and what their experience has been with the same railroad. Is that how we do it? I'm trying to get into the real world of what these cases are going to look like. I, I, yeah, I, mean, I, think the, I think the real world is that you have to be able to show that you're dealing with a situation that's affecting you because of your because of your need for competition. And I think that implies that, that somebody with competition is being served differently. Otherwise, you don't have a need for competition. That's not the solution. How many other shippers would they have to do discovery on to prove that pattern? I don't know the answer to that. That's going to depend on what the board does when it's looking at the case and the inferences that the board is willing to draw from the evidence. Well, I'm talking about, you know, there's been a point made here that nobody's brought a reciprocal switching case and been able to win it in 40 years because the standard can't be met. You know, there are a whole bunch of very good lawyers, as you are, on the other side who represent shippers. And to a person, they've evaluated the, the situation as it's a standard which can't be met. So I, oh. I'd, I'd say, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. So I, I'd, I'd say two things. Um, one, I think it's, it's, Difficult to believe having gone back and actually looked at the way the agency analyzed mid tech, analyzed Vista Chemical, and analyzed Shenango, which are, I think the three main cases back in 1989, that somebody thought it was impossible to, to meet a case if the standards had been met. I think the board, I think the ICC pretty clearly laid out what had to be shown. And the problem is people can't show it because railroads understand their obligations and meet them. I mean, you said yourself that the whole idea here is to set up a standard as a backstop and then have people comply with the standard. And I, I would argue that that's what you see happening. I'm not sure it's just compliance with the standard. I think what you've heard 
from the railroad witnesses here is that it's not just fear of the standard, it's that we need to serve the customers to grow. We need to operate efficiently because that's also in the railroad's best interest. So I, I don't think in, in this particular case, it's necessarily the, the backstop of having a rule looming over us. I think it's the imperative of the railroad to grow its business and to operate efficiently and to have the capacity to grow its business. But I think the fact that you're not seeing cases doesn't mean the rules of failure. It means that people are behaving. And, I, and I, I just don't for the life of me understand why the implication of people not coming and complaining or not bringing cases is that there's a problem. I think that's a sign that there isn't a, a problem that requires a rule change because it, it's out there, it's understood. It, it was litigated, there were standards, there were decisions with, to be with, 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 with all due respect, Michael, if I accepted your description of what's the situation with the rail industry today, as a responsible shepherd of the taxpayers' dollars, I would fold up our RCPA office and lay all those people off because we wouldn't have any problems in the rail industry. And as Robert said, and I've heard it since I joined the board, shipper after shipper complaining about both service and rates. And we're in the midst of a rate reform not because everybody's happy with their rates and haven't brought any cases, but because they can't win cases under the current standard. So I, I just don't accept the notion that everything is hunky dory because nobody's bringing any cases. Let, let, let's move on because we're going to run out run out of, of time here. Eric, I had one uh, question. I just wanted to be clear on: Is it UP's position that? In the 77 locations where you now have reciprocal switching in place, there is no congestion on your network. But if we add any more shippers to those 77 locations, there will be congestion. I just want to make sure I nailed this down. So what I was saying was in the event that you had that you actively use reciprocal switching, and if you were to grow that reciprocal switching, it would potentially create congestion in areas where we may not have congestion today. Well, do you have, you know, when I had an ex parte meeting with representatives from UP on this issue a few months ago, I asked the question of whether there was any congestion. Now, you know, you say that you've got a lot of voluntary uh, reciprocal switching arrangements, but you also have a lot that were ordered by the board that I assume you wouldn't have taken, but for the merger. Uh, and I asked the UP representatives if they were, could point to me any place where reciprocal switching was causing congestion. And they said they'd get back to me and I'm still waiting. So it either is causing congestion or it's not as currently implemented. And well, that's, it, I'd like to pin that down. And, and we can do that follow up with you and sure we do that. But wait, I think right now I'll tell you, you can't answer, at least we don't think you can answer that today in a time in a single day where you could say, well, this is what it looks like. When we make these changes and people start to use reciprocal switching while we're still trying to grow their parts of the business, as well as our current customers trying to grow, what is not congested today could be congested in six months, 16 months from now. And well, that's you've got experience here over the last year, two, three, four, whatever period you want to look at. Tell me if, if any of these 77 locations, the reciprocal switching movement itself caused any congestion. I, I'd like to know the facts there. Not just a generality, I'd like specifics. Uh, because wondering. all we really hurt or generalities. I have one more area I wanted to pursue, Michelle, if you don't mind, and I'm going to finish. Oh, I was just going to piggyback oh. off of your oh, question. Okay, go ahead. Go, ahead. Um, go ahead. In, Sorry. in, in those instances uh, where you currently have reciprocal uh, switching, um, have you had any occasions where it's led to uh, a request for a higher number of cars? Where the customer is asked for had to buy? Yeah, yes, with the extension of taking more time to be able to handle the sale of volume, they're going to have more cars, generally speaking. And one more question. Um, in, in those instances, have, have you actually experienced a higher level of congestion or no? We absolutely have. And when we go back, though, to the same comments to Chair Roberman, you know, when you look at congestion and you think about yards, again, we can look at it today and say well, we're not congested, but through just a handful of events, you can get to a congested state, and that's outside of the growth. So, yes, in those locations, I'll well, we not say every single one of them until we see the entire list and come back to you. We've absolutely seen periods of congestion where increased reciprocal switching 
would push us beyond the limit of the capacity of the other. Thank you. Were, were you done, Michelle? Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I have a question. I think this is for you, Kenny, but Eric, you may want to weigh in because there's been a lot of talk here about having the most efficient network and how reciprocal switching is going to interfere with that and cause inefficiencies in the network. And I am looking at the comments that were filed in this docket by Dow Chemical. I don't know if you've read them. They're your customer, so I would assume you wanted to read them. And Dow points out that at their facilities, uh, they have two facilities at Taft and Plaquemine that do quite a bit of uh, freight traffic. And because of UP's unwillingness to allow a switching in New Orleans for much of that traffic, according to their comment, 60% of Plaquemine's traffic is routed by Union Pacific to East St. Louis. And um, uh, I can't see that a large percentage of the TAF traffic as well. And a result, as a result of this routing, uh, they add hundreds of miles on every one of their trains. So instead of I guess this is an interchange, not a switch, but the point is that it's UP's routing decisions in terms of the interchanges from just these two Dow locations, which according to Dow's comment, results in adding hundreds of miles to each of these trips to their destinations. And uh, they point out that if they had simply been allowed to route these trains through New Orleans rather than East St. Louis, by UP, they would have eliminated 335,000 route miles in just 2021. And as a result, so UP locomotives and then the Eastern locomotives are adding to the atmosphere. There's wear and tear on the rail cars. And as Dow points out, just as you said what happened to customers if you allowed reciprocal switching, Dow says they've had to maintain a larger rail car fleet and product inventory uh, just to deal with these routing decisions by UP. And the question I'd like to put, Kenny, is, is it, does it promote the public interest, in your view, for UP to add 335,000 right miles a year to Dow traffic, which it wouldn't have to do if it would route it through New Orleans? Mr. Chairman, I, I think in this case, context matters. Uh, we need to get into the details to understand where the end receivers are. Uh, we're moving something through East St. Louis and it's going to Maine. That might be the right route if it's going well, to. Well they, well, they tell you, Kenny, they tell you. I didn't want to read the whole thing. Union Pacific routes traffic from Taft to Carteret, New Jersey on a 1930 mile rail trip via East St. Louis. Even though routing the traffic through New Orleans would decrease the route distance by 492 miles. Union Pacific routes traffic from Plaquemine to Institute, West Virginia on a 1,451 rail mile trip via East St. Louis, even though routing that traffic through New Orleans would save 227 miles. I'm just reading from Dow's comment in this docket. For the top 10 Taft and Plaquemine lanes by volume, Union Pacific routes through East St. Louis uh, would, uh, I'm sorry, instead of New Orleans, uh, if they'd gone to New Orleans instead of East St. Louis would have eliminated over 335,000 route miles just in 2021. Is that in the public interest for UP to cause those extra route miles? Yeah. Again, Mr. Chairman, the context matters. Uh, I, I'd wanna, I have not read all of that. I need to read it and, and look at those and circle back with you on that. Can you I think can... of any context in which adding 335,000 route miles would be an advantage to the public? Yeah, I can tell you when we're uh, working with uh, interline, our interline partners, it may be a faster route, even though the, the miles may be different. There could be other instances where it could be advantageous. We'd yeah. have to look at. Uh, do you, do yeah. you think Dow came in here and complained to us about the situation because they're getting the fastest route? 
You don't have to answer that question. I, I, I don't really have any other questions. That does get to, can I still make a comment on that, Mr. Chair? Yeah, no, be my guest. So in part of my prepared statement, we were talking about the fact of building density. So when we think about those examples, and Kenny's right, we can get you a more specific example. But going through East St. Louis is how we build density into having that efficient interchange with the Eastern Carrier. Now, I understand from just a distance perspective that that would look like more miles. In fact, it is more miles. But Kenny's right. From a timing perspective, we've been able to provide them the most efficient service. It still may make more sense to go to East St. Louis. In our case, because we have the density coming to East St. Louis, it does make more sense for us. Yeah. Today. Well, Eric, I'm just going to say this. It's really difficult for me to imagine that a company the size of Dow and a company the size of Union Pacific need me to try to bring the two of you together to resolve a major shipping. But we're not talking about some mom and pop shipper who's spending a few dollars. The fact that I have to raise it at this hearing strikes me that there's a failure by somebody to communicate and work things out. That I would assume Dow is one of your major customers. And uh, it's just remarkable to me that th this is how this issue gets raised at a public hearing. I would expect business people of your sophistication and experience, and I don't mean you specifically, Eric, I mean your companies, to work these matters out. Uh, but it certainly caught my attention. You know, we have a public interest standard that's built right into the statute. We've got a climate crisis, and uh, the railroad seems to be oblivious to it, from what I can tell. But I'd certainly like an answer. Chairman, let me just let me just add one point here on this. I mean, this is actually this, this is not actually sounding like what BNSF's witness was talking about about looking at open routing and the issue of routing. And there is already a statutory remedy under 10705. This is exactly what the energy case was about: the argument that we should be interchanging at a different point. And this is an issue that Dow has raised since the beginning of this proceeding. It was in the papers in 705, and we've explained. Just what, what Eric has said before, that the route going through New Orleans with all of its service complications and congestion and getting over the bridge down there is just not efficient compared to the route over East St. Louis. And I think if, if it were an issue, it would, we wouldn't keep seeing it in the, paper, the, in the papers. There would have been a discussion between, between Kenny and the folks from Dow. I, I just don't think this is a real issue. There is a, there is a board... There is a board statute that addresses inefficient interchanges. So if, if something is really inefficient, that case can be brought. That was the energy case. Well, Michael, pardon me for being a novice in the railroad industry, but I'm having a hard time understanding how 335,000 miles a year more than is necessary to move the product from A to B is efficient. Maybe in your world, it's efficient. It doesn't strike me that it is. And if there's trouble moving traffic through New Orleans, then it seems to me the railroads, which have been making billions and billions of dollars in stock buybacks, not only you, but CSX, need to improve the infrastructure. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I don't find it very persuasive to say, well, there's more space in East St. Louis, so we'll just send the trains further. Uh, you, you know, the railroads uh, didn't like the fact that uh, the labor people wanted firemen on locomotives after they stopped burning coal. I don't understand why it's in the public interest for the railroads to take trains thousands of miles farther than they have to go to get from here to there just because they make more money doing it that way. So somebody's going to have to persuade me otherwise. Any other uh, board members have any questions for UP? Anything any of you folks want to say to us that you haven't said? No, I don't think so. Thank you, thank for, you your for your time. time. Thanks for your time. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. It is 448. We have, uh, I assume, a, a major presentation from AAR. What's the pleasure of the board? Should we take a short break or keep moving? Short Thanks break. All right. Let's recess to five o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all.
All right, uh, we are back in session. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm going to call on AAR. We are going to make every effort, Ian and your team, to finish with your presentation before we go home tonight. So uh, we're all well advised to see if we can make that happen. Sounds good. So uh, present on your panel, Ian, are yourself, Ian Jeffries, Michael Baranowski, Jonathan Orzag, Mark Fagan, Deborah Aaron, and Benjamin Horwich. So it's all yours, Ian. Take it away. All right. Great. Chairman Oberman, members of the board, good afternoon, and thank you on behalf of the members of the Association of American Railroads for the opportunity to speak with you today. This is a very important issue for the rail industry as a whole, and we're mindful of the board's request that we provide new, updated information, and we have done so. The board will hear from new voices making new points. However, there are certain rock solid fundamental truths about this proposal that cannot be swept aside just because the industry has been warning the board about them consistently for a decade. Before introducing our panel of experts, I want to underscore some of those fundamental concerns. The proposed rule would require one railroad to hand business off to a competitor, even though that railroad has done nothing wrong. That needless intervention into the complex rail system will clog the rail network, reduce investment, and harm the public interest. Railroads today maximize operational efficiency and network fluidity. More switching will mean more congestion and more potential points of failure. This will lead to delay in the network, which will reverberate across the wider supply chain, a supply chain that is already strained. More switches will also hurt the environment. Longer wait times will increase emissions from rail traffic and inefficient railroads means more traffic will shift to trucking, which is less fuel efficient and generates comparatively more emissions. The proposed rule would discourage future investment by railroads by creating uncertainty and depressing returns on equipment and facilities. It would also increase safety risks by adding complex switching operation, which are relatively riskier than line haul operations. Any desire by the board to intervene in the market absent any allegation of abuse in order to provide some shippers with commercial leverage that the marketplace does not offer is misguided and dangerous. Sole serve shippers have legal protections from unreasonable rates and several pathways to obtain that protection. Backdoor rate, reg, re, excuse me, backdoor rate regulation is not better, it is worse. It will come at the expense of differential pricing that is necessary for railroads to recoup their investments and continue to develop and sustain their networks. And here, it will transfer wealth from railroads to shippers that are already significantly more profitable. Simply put, the proposed rule is unsound policy and AAR is joined in its views by many other stakeholders, passenger railroads, economists, environmental advocates, labor groups, short line railroads, elected officials, consumer groups, tax groups, and more. And this afternoon, you will hear from our panel of experts that further elaborate on the points I just made. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce Mark Baranowski, who's Senior Managing Director at FTI Consulting. He will discuss the detailed analyses that he and his team have completed using the board's carload waybill sample data as well as data from other sources, analyzing both the basis for and scope and impact of the proposed rule. Jonathan Orzag, Senior Managing Director at Compass Lexicon. He will elaborate on, the, on his economic assessment of the proposed rule, including its effects on competition and critical future investments by railroads in their networks. Mark Fagan, Lecturer in Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard University. He will elaborate on the flaws of the proposed rule from a public policy perspective and how it will affect the supply chains of which railroads are a key part. Deborah Aaron, Vice President at Charles Rivers Associates Competition Practice with extensive experience around competition policy, including in the telecommunications industry. She will discuss important lessons from competitive access policies in the telecommunications industry that the board may wish to consider as it evaluates a proposed rule. And Benjamin Horwich is outside counsel for the AAR in this proceeding and will address legal and policy issues with the proposed rule. I'll turn it over to Ben from here. Great, thank you, Ian. And uh, especially thank you to the board for hearing from us today and, and being mindful of the time, Mr. Chairman, our, our hope is to spend uh, you know, maybe five or 10 minutes with each of our panelists and, and that should actually come in significantly shorter than our requested time. And, 
So our goal there is we can maximize the time we have to respond to the board's questions. But yeah, just to be I just, clear, Ben, I don't want anybody to feel shortchanged. So do oh, no, I understand. I, I understand, but sometimes shorter is more effective. And uh, although there's a lot of issues, we are often. trying to be focused. <laughs> often. Um, so I, let me just give an overview of a few points before our panelists kind of get deeper into their areas of expertise. Um, the, the first point is that overall, the board should think methodically about how about adopting the proposed rule. And, and that process would include first, clearly identifying the, what precisely is the need for the proposed rule change? What's the problem that would be solved by taking action? And then second, once you know that, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the revised approach versus the existing approach? And we've been talking some today about the existing approach and the revised approach. And Mark Fagan will speak in, in some more detail about those points about policy development. But I, I, I do think it's right that we should do some some level setting around what the existing rule does and, and what the, the proposed rule would do. So the existing rule. So you know, we've, we've heard the concerns that the existing rule doesn't cover anything meaningful and we really disagree with that. I mean, we really take the ICC and the DC circuit at their word when they say that it covers a variety of potential abuses of market power. It's, it's a remedy for exclusionary conduct that prevents the competitor from competing on other routes not involving the switching line. It can be a remedy for substantially inefficient routing or inadequate service. We've been talking about those things when those are the product of an abuse of market power. Now, we know the rule doesn't address rates that are unreasonably high due to an abuse of market power. That's because there is a more direct remedy for that problem in the statute already through maximum rate regulation. And, John Orzag will, will go into that. But I would point out that when you think about what's left after that, you know, if there's no evidence of abuse of market power, which is what those existing rules aim to identify, then the board has been right to let the free market function. That, that is the point of the Staggers Act is to avoid that intervention. And as Mr. Orzag will explain also, that's sound economics. So that's, that's the existing rule. Now the proposed rule, uh, obviously no one on, on, on this board wrote the proposed rule. Um, and you know, we think the board should have a clear picture of the problems with the proposal. Um, we think, you know, we see it has two parts, right? And, and they pose overlapping, but, but somewhat distinct sets of concerns. And so I wanna make sure we think about them separately. So first there's what we have called the public interest pathway. That's the part that, that proposes to do things case by case in light of all the relevant factors. And you know, that has the potential to apply almost anywhere. Um, you know, and we heard this some discussion this morning from, from shippers about maybe there's prophylactic orders, and then you get into hypothetical costs and benefits. And even if it's not hypothetical, you get this problem that some of the things that are really important to the, to the public interest are difficult or impossible to judge case by case. And then you have this concern that when everything's relevant, nothing's dispositive. And, you know, and then everybody's going to disagree when nobody knows what the outcomes really can be predicted to be. So that's, that's kind of the set of issues we think about around the, the public interest pathway. And then separately, there's the competitive access pathway. And so that's, that's the part that proposes to say, if a shipper meets the threshold requirements for a maximum rate case, then we're not going to actually make the shipper prove the rate case. Instead, we're going to grant for switching unless there's a serious practicability or safety problem that arises. And, and I want the board to recognize that the, the proposal as drafted does not say that operational inefficiency would be a reason to then refuse switching. You know, it doesn't say that an obvious distortion of investment incentives would be a ground for refusing switching under that, that pathway. So the board is, is tying its hands in that pathway in a way that I think it needs to be mindful of. And together, the upshot is that the, the, the board would be handing out switching as a sort of new regulatory entitlement. It's, it, it, would, it would have to be something that's being bestowed upon shippers, even in situations where a railroad has not done anything wrong in an identifiable way. So then we ask what would, what would, you know, what's changed that might favor that change in the rule. And there's been several justifications there, and I think we'd be happy to address any of them. There, there's one that I think in the newest uh, papers and some of the ex parte discussions seems to have captured significant attention is this idea that the rule was 
you know, originally adopted in the mid 1980s. And then there were some important rail mergers that continued into the 1990s and those uh, supposedly reduced competition. And that, that's an interesting theory, but we really wanna emphasize it's just factually false. And of course the board wants to rely on facts to make policy and Mike Baranowski will go into that, but at a very high level, it's basically three points to remember there. The first is that you know, where mergers threaten to eliminate that sort of intramodal competition, the, the ICC or this board Im imposed a condition and those conditions were supported by shippers. And we heard that again, even fr from the shipper groups this morning. Um, the second thing to remember, and this is just an important background point that may be easy to lose, is that a, a clear majority of traffic has always been single served as far as its rail options are concerned. That, now that doesn't mean that there's no competition and, and Mr. Orzag can talk about that. But the point is that single rail service was like really normal before the mergers, it's really normal today. And the industry is organized around there being a significant fraction of single service. And then the, the third thing I would say is that there, you know, we heard some complicated theories this morning about vertical effects of mergers and long routes. And I, I look, the proposal here though is specifically about regulating short segments over which there's single service. And that's what we've tried to look at is you say, the, and, and that's what Mr. Bernowski will, will talk about. The proportion of traffic moving to or from single service stations has, has dropped since the 1990s. Meaning that since those mergers, there's this greater percentage of traffic moving between multi-service stations than there was before. So you can't, can't say the mergers cause single service to increase and now we have to combat that because single service actually had decreased. So then we think about the rules downsides. And I think today there's been a lot of focus on operational concerns and, and the board has already heard from other witnesses and it will tomorrow hear from other witnesses about that. Another place to look at that I think it won't actually, the board won't hear during the hearing, but I think is worth taking a look at is the, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen's comments. Um, I mean, those are the people closest to the disruption that, that this proposal could, you know, can create and they're the ones literally on the ground. So I think that's a really, valuable voice in, in, on this issue. So let me just kind of make three high level points on operations and my fellow panelists will probably have some more to say on this. But the first one is that the operational complexity is real. And, and I hope the board has seen the diagrams or the videos about you know, the rail car having to get moved from A to B to C to D to you know, just to get onto the line haul train. And we, we heard some of those discussions earlier, I think on other panels. But the notion that this is just going to be swapping, you know, one switch here for another switch somewhere else, it, that turns out to be false. And Mike Baranowski will explain that the data really show that. So we're adding switches. And then, I mean, I, as the lawyer, I should add that it's legally problematic to, to talk about regulatory interventions that are kind of picking and choosing between particular routings and switching choices, because that is generally the carrier's choice absent that abuse of market power that, that we talked about. So the second point is that that operational complexity and those risks are widespread. Um, and I mean that in two senses. Now, first, there's a, as the slide shows, there's a vast number of places where a shipper could theoretically argue for an interchange. And you know, that doesn't make it a good idea in practice, as I think, Mr. Chairman, you've recognized today in some of your observations. Um, and then, you know, there's also the question, which I'm happy to get into if the board is interested in the questions about places that are outside of terminal areas where the shipper is located. But the other sense in which the complexity is, is, is widespread is that it's not just about where it's going to be felt, but it's going to be felt up and down supply chains. And as others have alluded to, it, it kind of feels like particularly disastrous as an idea when we've seen what kind of external disruptions, you think COVID-19 or global events and what they can do to complex systems. And we really do in North America have the best freight rail system in the world. And the sort of experimentation that this would cause, I think is something we should really pause on. And Mark Fagan will have some more to say about that. And then the third thing I'd say is that when you think about these risks, the proposed rule as it's written really lets the genie out of the bottle. And it, it doesn't let the board have enough control over it. And the problem is a little bit different under those two different pathways. So under the public interest pathway, the board kind of has a blindfold on. That's how I think about it. It's gonna look at this particular location, 
But as you've heard, and as we'll also probably discuss some more, the concern really is cumulative effects across the network. Railroads you know, can make something happen at a particular location. But when you're having interventions in a wide number of places that have these knock-on effects, you really get unpredictable results. Under the competitive access pathway, it's a little bit of a different issue. As I said before, it's more about the board tying its hands, where even if the operation looks really foolish and inefficient, the board is leaving itself without the ability to say no, unless they get to be you know, downright impracticable, I think is one of the, the, the backstops there. Um, so look, in the end here, I, I, I do wanna come back to the, the, the sense that, that a, prime, a prime motivation, maybe the prime motivation for the proposed rule is, is about shippers' desire for lower rates. I mean, that, you know, the whole thrust of the presentation earlier today from the shipper coalition about the switch fee, for example, if you remember that, was about, well, you have to set the switch fee in a way that will make sure we get lower rates. So, I mean, that's, that's how we really do know this is, this is ultimately about rates. And we can talk about the other issues too, but rates is a big part of it. And so I wanted to close my observations by speaking directly about that. Using a, an operational change, a force switching framework to produce lower rates just upends the statutory rate reasonableness framework. And the, the easiest place to see that I think is in the competitive access pathway because it actually sort of parallels that, that rate framework. It starts out in the same place that a, a rate case would start with the existing market dominance test. And I think we think that is a, a very plausible place to start. That's a good screen, but under the proposal, the force switching inquiry essentially ends there. And the effect is that a significant proportion of cases that would proceed at least under that pathway, get something that looks like rate relief via force switching without any showing that the rates were ever too high under the board's you know, actual adopted rate methodologies in the statute. So you have this, this weird sense that like the shipper gets to the starting line in a rate case, and then all of a sudden gets given the gold medal without ever like running the race that we would have, you know, that we would see in a rate case. And that's this like, it, it, internal contradiction that kind of predictably results in courts thinking something is not right and vacating the rule. And, you know, we've been talking about not wanting to be here years from now. And, and I think we really worry about that as being a scenario where we're back here in three or four years with no progress. And I don't think anybody wants that. So to be clear, this is not competition producing lower rates. And John, uh, John Orzag will talk more about this. The basic points is, are that lower rates and competition are not the same thing. Lower rates can't be an end unto themselves because what justifies regulatory intervention are market power abuses that are preventing the benefits of competition that would arise in a free market. And the rule as it's written is just a, just a regulatory intervention that kind of produces this faux competition where everyone's gonna you know, stop doing what they would do in a free market, start focusing on what switching would lead them to do and start focusing on the board's intervention and the board's price and how that shifts things. And this is where Deborah Aaron will, will really speak because it's, it's very much what happened, I've learned from her in the telecommunications space. And you know, just forcing an incumbent to share the facilities it's made investments in is not actually rate competition. It's, it's kind of the opposite. It's what the DC circuit Kind of derided as synthetic competition is the phrase it used in one of uh, its decisions overturning the Federal Communications Commission's approach. And that, that then leads into to Dr. Aaron's other points because the proposal isn't deregulatory. It's kind of the opposite if it produces all these waves of, of regulatory litigation about when force switching is going to be ordered at what price and how do you mediate the operational complications. And then that's kind of a lesson from the force sharing in the telecommunications industry. And so we think of this as like the old saying, if you can't be a good example, then you'll just have to be a horrible warning. And I, I would urge the board to, to heed that warning and, and, and listen to what uh, Dr. Aaron has to say. So let me turn it over to Mike Baranowski first, and then uh, John Orzag and Mark Fagan and Deborah Aaron. And then uh, I might take a minute to wrap up, but we really ben, do want to get to the board's questions. Before you do that, I'd like yeah. to ask you two questions, a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, earlier on in your remarks, you talked about uh, providing a, a, an order for switching, even if the railroad hadn't done anything wrong, or words of that effect, and uh, that there's no basis for that. Isn't a basis 
for that, the statute itself, which doesn't mention anything about railroads wrongdoing in terms of whether we may order reciprocal switching? Well, I think there's a couple ways to, to see that um, this is always the, the provisions and their predecessors, uh, where they're kind of where Congress drew on them from, have always been about kind of showing showings of necessity, uh, and then of course staggers overall um, thrust to minimize regulatory intervention. So, and this is a point that I actually I, I think in some ways John Orzag can speak best to because it it is kind of a point about when regulation should be should be triggers that regulation needs to be a response to an identified abuse of market power some sort of, of, of failure of the behavior to promote the public interest but when you generally are relying on the free market you have to identify something that the free market is not doing that it ought to be doing and then intercede on that basis and so for example in the way the competitive access pathway is written it identifies conditions of market dominance in which a railroad could act inconsistently with uh, you know, the, the public interest or competitive principles, but it doesn't actually take the further step that you would, for example, in a rate case to say, well, wait a minute, let's actually look at what the railroad's doing. And we have a test here to say whether that's in bounds or out of bounds. And then we, you know, we call the balls and strikes and we say, well, the railroad's out of bounds, the rate's too high, we're gonna issue a rate prescription. And it's that kind of two-step kind of kind of thinking that, that 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 structurally is throughout the statute here, and is and 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 sort of leads to my view that there has to be some identified something that identifiable about the railroad having done something or could be failed to do something, I suppose, but but actual conduct on the railroad's part, as opposed to the mere circumstance of happening not to have a competitor around, it could be but behaving wouldn't, appropriately. Wouldn't that, be a, wouldn't that be an argument better directed to the Congress? I mean, you're, you're asking the language practicable and in the public interest to carry a lot of load to put all, the, put all of that into a requirement for a rulemaking. I realize there's been rules since then and there's a proposal now, but I would like to start with the statute. And I, I don't find any insistence by the Congress on market dominance or wrongdoing or anything else. They just say, do it when it's practical and in the public interest. Uh, well, so you're, you know, you're, you're asking us to read all of what you've just said into the public interest language. You may be right, but I don't see it on the statute itself. I think the, I think the way we, the way we see it fitting together, and I expect that Mark Fagan will have something to say about this because I think a lot about public interest generally in crafting regulations and how to serve that. But what we see is that public interest echoes what the ICC said in, in the Jamestown decision, for example, which is something that can't be a mere private benefit. It has to be, it has to be something that sort of accrues to the public, to the public as a whole. And, and in fact, that standard even goes back before Jamestown. We're almost at its 100th anniversary uh, this summer, I think, of, of the board articulating that principle. And we know, Cong you know, I think it's clear enough that Congress incorporated that, that concept. That was certainly what was kind of the understanding at the time this provision was added. And under, uh, under an act like this, where market forces are presumptively thought to promote the public interest, there's kind of a there's a there's a bias towards saying, well, we think market forces will promote the public interest, kind of until shown otherwise. And so, I, I don't think that the board has kind of a rigid kind of constraint on exactly how it determines that something's been shown otherwise. But I do think that it can't simply be a simple market dominance test that says, well, you're in a position where you might be disserving the public interest, uh, because as we've talked about today one of the significant and hopeful effects of any regulation and setting outer boundaries is that people, the actor, market actors will observe those boundaries and might not be disturbing the public interest. So there's, there's kind of uh, you know, a reason that the board needs to find something more, I guess, is what it is. And one other question, when the Congress said to us, we can do it if it's necessary or should, may do it if it's necessary to provide competitive rail service. Is it your argument that the Congress intended us to provide competitive rail service in every respect except with regard to rates? 
Um, I, doesn't, I think, comp, doesn't competition imply all aspects of whatever it is that the supplier is supplying? Oh, I see. Yes. Price? Oh, no. Ab we absolutely agree with that view about the benefits of competition, which is which is why I said what I said about the existing standard, which which recognizes that although, you know, money and rates is always kind of probably there in the background of any case, there can be circumstances, certainly where the real harm, uh, you know, a, a, an abusive market position really could be visited through the, the you know, inadequate service. I, I, we agree with that. Yeah, service uh, or, or rates. I mean, co competition is an all-encompassing concept, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I, do, I do agree with that. The, the question, of course, is which kind of, you know, which tool is the best one for the job? Well, that's a so when you're talking question. rates, there's, you know, a different that, set of tools a, too. That's a separate question of what, what's the best tool. The argument the AAR is making is that we can't use reciprocal switching as a tool at all to deal with rates, as I understand it. And I don't know how you can separate out the concept of competition, which the Congress directed us to deal with, from both rates and service, the whole product that's being offered. Uh, well, I, I agree. I'll, I, I think maybe John Orzag will have an opportunity. Before we do that, Karen, but, yeah. Karen Hedlund had a question. Karen? Thank you. Um, and maybe one of your economists should address this. Um, uh, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, should, should there be relief in the absence of an abuse of market power, but how do you go, how does a shipper prove uh, abuse. Um, in fact, the, you know, we know that the railroads have been stressed over the last couple of years, and the result has been that there has been a decline in the quality of service to many shippers. Uh, and that may be a result of the railroads preferring to provide better service to customers where they make more money, there's a bigger margin over customers uh, that don't provide them uh, the equivalent margins. Uh, and is that an abuse of market power? But how do, how do you go about uh, proving that? So that's, that's a concern uh, that I have. Um, one other point about the switch fees, um, and you indicated that that's an indication that this is all about uh, rates. I think it's about uh, how the shippers can get better service without incurring higher costs for paying a larger switch fee that more than offsets the, uh, uh, any um, uh, uh, cost savings they may get from the other railroad, but where they're really just seeking better service. Well, I think, I, I guess I'd, I'd make the observation on the on, on the second on the second point there that one challenge uh, I think with the way the rule is written is that if it's intended to be a response to a service issue, then you would want a rule that is you know, written with some particular sensitivity towards the service issue. But that's not actually what's written into the rule. And so the inquiry isn't focused there the regulated parties that are trying to observe the rule don't kind of have notice about what that is and, and so forth. So that's, that's sort of the, the challenge that- Service if you're, part of competition. You, you compete on rates and you compete on service. Well, I, 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 cert, I certainly appreciate that point that it's part of, that it's part of competition, but, but and again, take the competitive access pathway, a showing of market dominance doesn't actually answer the question, doesn't actually answer the question, well, is your service good or is your service bad, right? And so by contrast, something constructed in the way that we think the current rule operates, which is, well, if you're market dominant and you've abused your market power to, so to speak, get away with inadequate service, and there's kind of a causal connection between your abuse of market power and the service that's, you know, not merely, oh, it's a little less than ideal, but it's actually inadequate. And, you know, we've got a strong connection there. That, that we think is the, sh is the showing of relief that, that MidTech leaves open. I thought, I, I thought that, that Mr. Rosenthal's discussion of that on the, on the previous panel is pretty well in accord with how, how, I, would, how I would describe it. It's, 
you know, it's difficult to come up with the hypotheticals that isolate service from rates for all the reasons we've just been talking about, but I, I don't think it's, I certainly don't think it's impossible. I again think that it's an understanding that railroads have under the current regime that this is out of bounds to, you know, give, give this kind of abusive treatment towards the particular shippers, uh, you know, over whom you may have market power because then you're subject to this and you need to rein it back in there. Maybe we should let, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I know you want the other panelists to speak. So but, um, one quick follow-up, I think it's a natural follow-up to Karen's and so I wanna jump in. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me um, about Mr. Rosenthal's presentation is that, you know, and, and I think you recognize that the, the DC circuit said it's really hard to assign quantitative values to service. And so when he's calling for comparing a particular shipper service, you know, to, you know, a shipper that's in a more competitive situation and identifying the Delta, it's, 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 I read that as, you know, the attempt to quantify, quantify that would be quite a burden on a shipper. So I, I'm wondering what your reaction is to, to how that would properly be done in light of, you know, what the DC circuit said about qualitative judgments. Well, I think it's, I actually think it's unavoidable that there have to be some comparisons done in that, in that factual showing. And, and the reason is this, is that as, as I, I think we've recognized you know, in some of the earlier discussions with other panels about this, is that the, the, the causes of degraded service, I don't want to say inadequate service, because I think inadequacy actually is a fairly, you know, significant charge to level against someone, but, but even degraded service, so just speaking about that, there can be different causes of that, right? There can be kind of external factors, right, that cause service disruptions. There can be well-intended but improvident decision-making by a given railroad where, you know, they thought the traffic flows were going to go east this, you know, the, you know, east this year. And it turns out there was some weather pattern that resulted in westward flows of, of some commodity or something. Right. And they, you can just guess wrong and then be out of position or something. There could be obviously abuses of market power at the root of some of something like that. Um, and, you know, I think we can imagine other permutations. And I think it's impossible to actually make that causal connection without some reference point within the broader market. I mean, just to, for a loose analogy, we were speaking about on the previous panel, we were talking about, well, 24 or 48 hours or 96 hours of dwell time. Well, I mean, we all have, I think, an intuitive sense of like, oh, well, that's you know, longer than a shipper might like, but it's not an outrageous period. So it's something someone might tolerate. But where did we get that idea? Well, we got that idea from some comparison to how we understand other movements to go. And so I, I think there has to be some sort of level setting of that nature. Otherwise the board's decisions will just be aiming kind of too high or too low if the board doesn't have some kind of calibration relative to other circumstances. All right, you wanna proceed, Ben, with your panel? Sure, Mike, you wanna take over? Thank you, Ben, sure. Good afternoon, my name is Mike Baranowski and I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. My testimony will focus on three areas of data analysis. First, there's been much discussion about railroad industry consolidation leading to single serve stations. My analysis show that less traffic originates and terminates at single serve stations after the industry consolidation than before. Second, I look at class one carrier access for new stations appearing in the board's carload label sample for the first time in the post merger period and find that those stations are overwhelmingly single served. Third, I address claims that have arisen in shipper comments in this proceeding that the operational effects of the proposed rule involve simply trading one switch for another. The data show that this is simply not the case for the vast majority of shipments potentially affected by the rule. The most recent round of railroad consolidation occurred in the late 1990s. 
I conducted an, an analysis of the prevalence of single serve stations in the STB's confidential carload label sample. I looked at a pre-consolidation for which I used 1992 to 1996 waybill data and post-consolidation for which I used 2015 to 2019 waybill data. The demonstrative summarizes the results of my analysis and shows that the amount of carload traffic originating and terminating at stations served by single class one carrier in the post-merger period declined from the pre-merger period. For all carload shipments, 55.6% originated or terminated at single serve stations in the pre-merger period compared to 52.2% in the post-merger period, a decline of 3.4 percentage points. Non-exempt carload shipments show a higher percentage of shipments originating and terminating at single serve stations than all carload shipments in both the pre and post merger periods, as well as a higher percentage reduction. Non exempt carload shipments with RVCs above 180%, the shipments most likely affected by the proposed rule, show the most significant decline, 8.7 percentage points. This bears repeating, a, a smaller share of traffic originates or terminates at single serve stations than before the mergers. Next, I look at new stations that have come online in the post-merger period. Overall, my analysis found 542 new stations that reported volumes for the first time in the 2015 to 2019 post-merger period. Of those 542 stations, the vast majority, 438 or 81%, are stations with access to only a single class one carrier. Bear in mind my last point, the share of traffic originating or terminating at multi-serve stations increased over this period. So what does it mean that there are lots of single serve stations being added? Presumably this reflects shippers own strategic economic choices. They have options. They can make trade-offs between the advantages of multiple rail carrier access on the one hand and other industrial development costs and benefits on the other. Shipper decisions are also likely influenced by industrial development efforts by class one carriers that include economic incentives for shippers to locate lines served exclusively by those railroads, on lines served by those railroads. What else does this mean? Most fundamentally, it means that the proposed rules would afford shippers that made economic and strategic choices for single carrier service, costless access to other class one carriers. To give these findings some perspective, I looked at the number of carloads in the 2019 carload label sample potentially affected by the competitive access pathway under the proposed rule at the 10, 15, and 30 mile distance thresholds from the nearest potential inter inter interchange. I found that at each mileage interval, well over 90% of the stations never had access to multiple railroad service in the first place. What does this show? It shows that it is very rare for existing stations to lose multiple service through mergers or otherwise, and that new stations normally come online as single served. Last, I evaluated what I understand to be certain shipper comments suggesting that the proposed rules will have little effect on operations because they will result in the shifting of switches from one location to another. I understand the notion is that there is an interchange somewhere in the middle of the route now 
but there could instead be a switch closer to the point of origination or termination. First, this idea works only for shipments that currently experience an interchange from one railroad to another. As the table shows, however, approximately 70% of the shipments potentially affected under the competitive access pathway do not currently require an interchange with another carrier. What does this mean? It means there is no interline switch to trade for. It means that these new switches will not be saving a switch somewhere else. Next, I look to see whether there are some existing local switching operations already in place near the origin and destination potentially affected by the proposed rule. This table shows that the vast majority of the volumes potentially affected under the competitive access pathway are located beyond where local switching operations occur and would require new local switching operations be established. Finally, what happens if you combine these two? The idea is to look at the, look at the proposition, the proportion of potentially affected traffic that might meet the shipper view of requiring only a shifting of an existing interchange to some possible lo local operation. My last table shows that only about 6% of the potentially affected shipments are both currently interchanged and located proximate to where local switching currently occurs. What does this mean? It means that the trade one switch for another theory is refuted by the data. It is potentially available only for a small fraction of traffic. So for the great majority of traffic, it really is true that new, new operations will be needed. Thank you again for your time. I will now turn it over to John Orzak. Uh, Michael, I have a couple of questions for you before you turn it over. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm trying to under, understand you. There's a statement, I think, in your uh, written comments that you looked at 1,500 potential places for interchanges. Is that right? Um, yes. So your tables there were based on measuring traffic against those 1,500 locations. All of those, all of the potential locations that would qualify under the proposed rule as I understand it. Right. You, I take it you did not do an analysis of how much traffic would be eligible for switching if we were doing the, we limited it the way we've been discussing today to only to interchange or yards where reciprocal switching currently is subject to a existing reciprocal switching tariff. You didn't look at that, I take it, right? Well, well I, I, I did to the extent it can be done in the context of the, 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 the level of granularity available in the, in the SDB carload waybill sale. And, and, and if we can go back to one of my, my um, tables, the, the second to the last table, um, what, what, what that table shows is that 80 per, around 80% of the shipments that are potentially affected under the competitive access pathway are, are outside the areas of where local switching or recipro reciprocal switching could, could occur today. And, and I say could, again, because of the lack of granularity in the waybill data, but you can, you can get a, what I would describe as a high level sense of the magnitude by looking at the um, railing centralized station master, which has a, an indication at, at each individual station for those stations that are within the switching limits of another station. So, it, so it's, not, it's not a precise metric, but it gives you a general representation of where these kinds of things could occur. I want you to, could you go to the, your last table? Sure. So 
I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the table. Are you saying that only 6.8% of the car loads are within, uh, are, are near an existing interchange? The, the, this is the. What, what are you trying to tell us here? The, here, here, you you have these are these are these are the car loads that meet two criteria. One is they're within proximity of an existing interchange, and two, they already experience an interchange. They're already an interline shipment. So these, this is the relative percentage of potentially affected traffic that would qualify for the for the shippers categorization of the one trade one switch for another theory well if we were to proceed on the idea at least at the outset of permitting reciprocal switching this is a question i've been asking all day uh to take place in yards where reciprocal switching is already approved by the railroads and we have those locations in their tariff this, this chart doesn't really answer that question of how much traffic would qualify. I, I think the chart before that, again, with, with, with no level of precision, but, but the chart before this one comes closer to that specific metric. The, these are, and it's the reciprocal of this, no pun intended, uh, but it, it, what this is saying is that between 78 and 82% of the potentially affected shipments under the competitive access prong are outside areas where the local switching occurs, meaning that that the, um, the 20, 22 to 18 to 22% would fall in as, as defined by the centralized station master areas where this kind of switching could be occurring. But it'd be even a smaller number if you assume that not every place where there's an interchange now actually has reciprocal switching approved there, not 100% of those places are subject to a tariff, right? That, that's, that's so, so something correct. under 23% of car loads would be eligible for reciprocal switching if we were to limit reciprocal switching to existing places where reciprocal switching has a tariff? As a very, very, very rough estimate, right. but again, the, 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 the real answer is in the details and, and the, the Waybill data and the centralized station master aren't sufficiently granular to get you to the detail level to give you a precise number. I have one other question. You told us that there were 482 new single serve stations since the mergers took place. Is that what I understood that chart to mean? The, not these. These were stations that sh that showed as reporting volumes in what I described as the post merger period, which for which I used the 2015 to 2019 waybill data. So, so these are stations that, that showed up in the, showed as reporting volumes in the 2015 to 2019 period that didn't report any shipments in the 1992 to 1996 period. So those are stations, your, your inference is they didn't exist before 2015. They, they weren't shipping any volumes, whether, whether the station was physically there or not. All right. And your prior chart to this one, which showed us how many fewer single serve stations there were. Can you put that up again? So my, here's my question. There's nothing on these charts to tell us whether there was a net increase in the number of single serve stations. In other words, there were 480 some new ones, but you didn't tell us how many may have disappeared. So in the 25, 2015 to 2019 period, how many total single serve stations are there as compared to the prior period? Um, my, my recollection from the analysis is there are fewer 
in the 2015 to 2019 data, I don't remember the number specifically, but that, but those that that number is included in the work papers and the and the build up of the of the 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 relative traffic levels that we showed in this chart. So we can get you that number. Yes, but what I'm trying to figure out is this doesn't tell us that stations that were single served in '92 to '96 became dual served. It just may mean there were fewer places shipping on rail, right? It means that there were fewer traffic volumes moving from stations served by a single class one carrier. Right, but one of the reasons that may have happened is that places which had been shipping on a single serve carrier before stopped shipping altogether or went out of business or are only using trucks. I mean, we don't know the reason for the reduction. We don't know the, re I haven't looked to to try and find the reason it was th th this analysis as as I as I tried to explain was more to just take a look at what, what what's going on um, with single serve stations and volumes moving from single serve stations in the pre merger and post merger period as I define them. Well, we can't really draw an inference, can we, from this data alone? that the mergers did not cause a reduction in single serve stations. I mean, you're, it seems to me the inference you're, you're trying to get us to draw is that you can't blame the mergers for an increase in uh, you know, captive shippers. But some of these captive shippers may just stop shipping. So that may account for the decrease, that's all, I, right? May stop, uh, stop shipping on rail. That, that's possible. And you're right. There hasn't been a detailed study of competition and, and what might be underlying these numbers since the Christensen study. Yeah. Well, it just is of limited use to, to understand the point of whether the mergers had anything to do with this. That's all I'm trying to get at. I, find I, 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 I think it's of some, it's not of zero use, but. Um... <laughs> well, I wouldn't want you to say your own work was of zero use, but I, I find it to leave me up in the air as to why there are fewer single serve stations, particularly because I have get, been getting an endless amount of anecdotal evidence of demarketing uh, since I've been on the board, a lot of such evidence. And so I, I can't tell you that that's why there are fewer single serve stations, but it's a alternative explanation that people have just stopped using rail. Sure, but but I, I would also again remember the the, the second the, the slide after that one, which shows the number of new stations reporting uh, in the post merger period are overwhelmingly single serve. Yes, but um, that uh, in terms of the overall use of shipper uh, use of rail by shippers, that's a that's also a limited. Uh, provides limited insight. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't really conclusively answer the question. It's just an interesting piece of data. Sure, that's not unfair. And there's only so much that, that one can garner from the label data itself. Yeah, I understand. Okay, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank I don't you. know, if, else, but I don't know also, if any other board members had questions for you, Stephen. It'd also be fair to say just because of the limitation of the label data, you have difficulty identifying customers. Right, and so you can't necessarily tease out any loss of geographic competition from 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 the data, or can you? There is no customer visibility in the in the Wayville data. You can do some high level metrics related to geographic competition by looking at commodity flows. Thank you. Oh, I, I thought I was handing things over to Mr. Orzak. Are you muted? Sorry about that. Is that working now? 
You can hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. And thank Okay, how's that? Great, thank you. And I wanna thank the chairman and the entire board for having me here to talk to you about this important regulatory issue. And I just wanna start with three key critical points. First, low prices cannot and should not be the sole goal of any regulatory approach. Such a goal would not serve the long-term interests of either shippers or the public. Any regulatory policy here must balance short-term lower prices while maintaining incentives to invest, which are crucial for the long-term availability and quality of the network, as well as longer-term lower prices. Second, mandatory switching is not going to enhance true natural competition. Indeed, competition under this regulatory approach will be faux or synthetic because it will not spark market forces. At most, it will give shippers more, quote, options. But options and competition are not the same thing. And I'll explain more about how the policy will require continued and ongoing regulatory intervention by the board. Third, if it were the case that competition today is failing and some shipping rates are too high and economically inefficient, then the best policy response is the most direct one, direct, direct rate regulation to curb excessive rates. And if I may, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about each of these. As a general economic matter, not all shipments can be priced at incremental costs. The costs, the extra costs incurred from just adding that shipment. Some shipments, and this is important, some shipments must be priced above incremental costs. And I heard this morning someone claim that differential pricing just isn't that important anymore. That perspective is inconsistent with sound economics. Indeed, from an economic perspective, differential pricing, that some shippers pay more than others, is absolutely essential to ensure that the railroad can invest in infrastructure, safety, quality. It's also consistent with sound economics that those who need rail more pay more for it, while the railway could still compete over those who need the railway less. This ensures that the railroads earn a competitive rate of return. That is an amount that covers both their fixed and incremental costs. Now, the concept of differential pricing and the fact that a service must be charged above incremental costs is present in industry after industry. Imagine, let's just say a cell phone company were forced to price at a level that it couldn't cover its fixed cost investments. It wouldn't be able to buy new spectrum and build and or lease new towers with an obvious harm to consumers as services degrade over time. The can you hear me line would become even more prevalent in that situation. Moving prices towards incremental costs here as the mandatory switching policy would do if implemented the way I understand proponents suggest, creates a similar risk that railroads will not be able to earn a competitive rate of return and will lack the incentive and ability to make desirable investments to the detriment of shippers and consumers in the medium to long run. The goal in any market should therefore to be ha to have prices that are low enough for customers, in this case shippers, and high enough for firms railroads here to earn a competitive rate of return and creating additional without creating any additional distortions to resource allocation. Market forces typically balance these issues best, but when it fails and regulatory intervention is needed, it needs to still focus on these principles. It's also important to emphasize that just because there may be only a single class one railroad on a route, that does not mean that that railroad owns a monopoly position. Indeed, ship it, shippers often have other options, whether via truck or river or otherwise, disciplining the prices of that railroad on that route. To be clear, imposing mandatory switching policy on routes where competi competition exists today is extremely problematic from an economic perspective. 
it's a central principle of economics that in the absence of a market failure, regulatory intervention will produce suboptimal outcomes and raise real risks of unintended consequences. Now, even if there is a market failure, more than 20 years ago, Joe Stiglitz and I wrote a paper, and for those of you who don't know Joe, Joe won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his insights into market failures. And in that paper, we talked about how when you, there is a regulatory intervention, it's important that the benefits of the regulation exceed the costs. That means here, even if you thought a railroad had no competitive constraints at all on some route, you still need to consider if the railroad is abusing its position on that route, because you don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. And there might be no disease at all. From an economic perspective, that is what best serves the public interest. Now, to help illuminate why mandatory switching will produce synthetic and not real competition, one needs to consider the costs and implications of the policy. To begin with, switching is complex. We've heard about that today. It has real costs, such as crew time, locomotive time, track time, fuel usage, as well as technical costs and planning costs. We've heard about that. It has safety risks. The risks associated with switching are relatively greater than those associated with line haul operations. It is correct that we observe switches today, but the complexity and cost of switching under this new regulatory policy would be even greater since the switches would have to occur at locations they haven't happened at historically. Now, this factor would be attenuated to some degree depending on if and how the board limits the location of the switches as suggested by the chairman throughout today's discussion. Given that, it would be not, it wouldn't be surprising that a rail carrier forced to engage in switching might have views about the questions of where, how, and how much compensation. So the railroads will need to negotiate rates against the backdrop of a regulatory process that kicks in if the negotiations break down. And this is a very important fact. In that scenario, economics shows that what governs these negotiations is the expected end result if the negotiations reach the regulatory phase. Any uncertainty over the outcome of this regulatory phase, which is heightened when it's considered on a case-by-case -case basis and increased when the issue is complex, such as mandatory switching, will translate into uncertainty during the negotiations. And again, as a matter of economics, if both sides have different predictions over the outcome, no negotiations are more likely to break down, which will lead to a dispute resolution process. Thus, thus it hopefully is clear to you that the board will likely have to step in, creating an ongoing regulatory rule. Indeed, the rule does not, quote, create competition, since the regulatory needs to stay involved in the process. That means there's not true market or competitive forces at play, nothing that could survive in say the wild without the board's continued intervention. That increases the role that you will have to play even beyond the occasional need to engage in rate, rate setting. It they therefore may actually be a real step backwards by sidelining true competitive forces. But here there's a better policy approach. There should be a direct remedy for extreme pricing on routes involving a bottleneck. That would achieve a worthwhile policy goal, but in a far more direct and transparent way without the inefficiencies of switching and without many of the complexities and indirect costs of introducing a whole new policy regime. So if I can just show a slide quickly, this is a comparison that you need to keep in mind, and I'm showing it using the usual diagram here. First, as I said a few minutes ago, low prices cannot be the only goal because prices are, that are too low may discourage investment. Second, maximum rate regulation allows recovery of all economic costs, the cost of the switch move and both the incremental costs and a share of fixed costs on the BC segment here. Now you can debate the right methods and procedures for doing this, 
But from an economic perspective, this strikes the right balance. Third, the problem under the proposed rule is that you might recover enough on the AB move, but that leaves the red piece, fixed costs on BC, in jeopardy. And to be clear, mandatory switching has other costs too that direct pricing regulation does not. Environmental costs, network distortion issues, which could reduce quality and efficiency. And we cannot forget that railroads are a network industry. And that means changes in one part of a network have effects on other parts of the network. Mandatory switching would also create uncertainty regarding returns to investment. And the economics literature shows that uncertainty depresses the types of irreversible investments made by the railroad industry. Finally, the basic problem here, which is unavoidable with a rule that artificially separates part of a route, is that when you focus on just one part, that's the AB route, AB part, you may lose sight of the other part, the BC part. So that's a very important consideration here in looking at this issue. In conclusion, mandatory switching is an inferior policy along all of these dimensions, in my opinion, compared to direct rate regulations in the rail industry. And with that, I'll either take your questions or pass it to Mark, depending upon if you have questions. Well, Jonathan, I have one question. Your focus was entirely on... Uh, reciprocal switching's impact on rates. There's been a lot of discussion today as a, a motivation for people to seek it for bad service. So do we have a, do you have a different conclusion if that's what well, as a, wrong that's attempted to be corrected here? No, I, I, and uh, Chairman, I appreciate the question and the opportunity to um, discuss that issue. It is absolutely correct to consider competition has an effect, can have an effect on price or quality. Now, service will be reflected in cost. So to the extent that um, the railroads are earning a super competitive rate of return, that is prices are, what are significantly above costs, accounting for the, each of the pieces as, one's, as necessary, if you are degrading the quality of the service, that should be reflected in a lower cost structure. And then the gap between the price and the, and the cost would reflect some um, weakening of competition or a problem with competition that uh, would be appropriate for you to consider as part of a regulatory um, intervention. What would that intervention be if it's not doesn't involve setting a rate? Well, you're setting rates relative to costs. Costs are going to reflect the quality of the service because uh, generally speaking, the more money you spend, the, the higher the quality of the service. And so you well, are- I'm not anticipating a shipper coming in and saying, I'm filing a petition with us saying, we're getting bad service. Please order the railroad to raise my rates. No, but it, in some sense, it, it, just as there's a trade-off between there's a trade-off between price and quality. So, if you're getting a, it's what we care about from a competition perspective is the gap here. And so, if you if you are getting a price commensurate with the service that you are um, paying, if that were in fact shown to be correct, and that's an important element. Then, then it would make sense that you're adjusting the price to reflect the quality of the service that's being offered. I, I understand, but what would the regulatory intervention be for the poor service under those circumstances? I, I might. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say a price that's commensurate with it would be, but you'd have to first show that it's, a, it's due to competition because if it's not due to competition for the reasons that I've already articulated, you would be intervening in a market and that potential you, you, in a way that would actually be have unintended consequences because to the extent that the market is functioning properly and just for whatever reason, the shipper is unhappy about the service, then that's not a, it's not due to competition. It's just due to exogenous factors. But I, well, I would, I would well, but uh, I'm, try Mr. I'm, Chairman. I'm at a loss here. I, I thought I understood you to say, that if there was a service problem, that would warrant regulatory intervention. And I was just no, I didn't. No, I said that if let's just back up. If you you first have to have there has to be a problem due to the first principle has to be there has to be a competition issue. 
because if the market is functioning, then there is the reg- intervening into functioning markets uh, has significant unintended consequences. Well, when you say uh, uh, you've lost me, if the market is functioning, what, what do you mean? You're assuming the conclusion the, this whole exercise is presumably in places where they're captive shippers. Well, we, let's we have to parse this, sir, because to okay. the extent you, you see a lot, there's a lot of industries in which are highly competitive that somebody may complain about service. So you can't, just because there is a complaint about the quality of service, that does not tell you that there is a competition issue. And so to intervene- well, wait, wait, wait. That, When you say competition issue, you mean lack of competition? Precisely. Okay, well, I just wanna get the terminology straight. But so you're saying <laughs> if there is a problem with service, but it's not because of a lack of competition, we should do nothing. Well, resp- might, might I try to try, try to answer, Mr. Chairman? I think, sure. I, I think it, it, it's going to have to be sensitive to the actual dynamic in the, the facts of that case. So for example, we certainly don't disagree that, there, that, that you can imagine a service problem that might be resolved by switching, right? That, that that could be caused by an abuse of market power and then could be caused and then could be resolved by switching. And we could come up with a hypothetical for, for that. But it I, 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 what I'm hearing is the point that not all service problems are going to trace to a competition problem as opposed to some other factors, which I mentioned, which I mentioned before but also that in not all instances is providing the switching actually going to solve whatever the problem is, right? I, so. Well, I, where, where I'm having something me, else. Yeah. Patrick, let me just finish this then. You know, I feel like we're going around in circles here. There's been a lot of discussion today about shippers who are suffering from inadequate service and a lot of questions about whether for that shipper to get relief they have to prove some kind of anti-competitive impact under mid-tech or some quote wrong of some kind that the railroad's engaging in. But we have a number of rules and I think the statutes are there to enable us to make sure that shippers who are getting bad service get some relief under the appropriate circumstances. And, And I thought I heard Mr. Orzag say after telling us that we shouldn't do reciprocal switching just to affect rates, that if there were serp- service problems, it would warrant regulatory intervention. If, if I may, if, yeah, if there but, is- And you're saying, but if, that, if the service problem isn't caused by a person being monopolistic or abusing their power, then we shouldn't intervene. We should just let the bad service continue. Is that what is that your position? I mean, I'm just trying to understand. Well, from a from a from a economic perspective, and again, I can only speak as an economist here. As from an economic perspective, in well functioning markets, there can be service problems. So let's just start there. In there, but to the extent there is no market failure, government intervention is more likely to create more harms than benefit. Well, could could I try to give a my, concrete my problem? Exactly. Ben, and then I'm going yeah, to over to Patrick. This is not purely a question of economics. I think there's a misapprehension on the part of most of the rail interests I've heard from today. We, we exist to make sure that we have a healthy network that serves the best national interest in our economy. So it isn't a pure question of picking up my old Samuelson book and deciding whether I should intervene if a shipper is having terrible service problems. We have an obligation when we can, when there's a solution to improve the levels of service or make sure shippers get service so the economy thrives. So I don't see how this question can be answered purely by an economist with all due respect. It's not unimportant, but you know, if if it's not a, you're saying if it's not a monopoly problem, it's not an economist problem. So we. you're leaving me uh, at a loss. Am I supposed to go home or am I supposed to deal with this shipper's legitimate service problems 
suppose they're only caused by what we see here, and that is a lot of railroads choosing to lay off thousands of workers years ago, and now they don't have enough workers. Whether they're monopolists or not, that's what they chose to do. We're, we're powerless to, to try to provide that shipper with a different railroad who could perhaps provide better service? There, here, I think history should help guide us. Um, there is a long history of evidence that shows that in balancing the short-term interests of lower prices and higher quality with the longer-term interests of investments, incentives to invest, which in the long run matter to quality, in long run matter to prices, that market forces are the best approach to balance those interests. Well, in I, I can tell you, I'm still waiting to see increase investments to serve, solve some of these service problems. It's been a long time since some of these, many of these service problems have come into existence and I'm still waiting to see the increased investment. In fact, what I see is the opposite, but you know, I think we're beating a dead horse here. Patrick had some questions he wanted to ask. Well, I, I think, I, I just wanna get clarity from Mr. Orzeg. You're not suggesting that if the board were to find a shipper is getting inadequate service relative to somebody who, a shipper that doesn't have good competitive options relative to somebody who has better competitive options, um, and the board were to find that that person is getting inadequate service, are you suggesting that the railroad should have the opportunity to go back and price that person higher once com competition is ordered compared to what they were uh, pricing when they were providing inadequate service? I'm no, I don't think so. As I understand your question, right? Point is that there has to be differential pricing because right. there's going to be some people who have lower prices than others. That's a necessary element of the of putting together a network uh, with different elements of different um, right. shippers, etc. That is a necessary component here. And there'll be some who who are charged more and some who are charged less. What we should be concerned about is for those shippers who don't have choice, choice being either another railroad or another form of shipping, that's truck, river, or otherwise, uh, for those, if the price that they are paying is excessive, then, in, and there's, an, there's a supra competitive profit that is being earned, those would be ripe for consideration for um, a regulatory intervention. Right now, but what about what about uh, the rationing or decrease in quality of service? How should we be thinking about the rate in that context? You know, whereas if you just looked at the top line rate, you wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily, for example, be found unreasonable under the board's rate reasonableness. But under a service lens, we find the service to be unreasonable. Um, you know, how, how should the board be thinking about um, the rate in that instance? Where, where, where competition is ordered in to deal with the service, um, but the rate was lower than what the railroad would charge in a, you know, it, with more pricing power because they chose to ration service as opposed to, you know, increase rates as, as high as they could perhaps. But it's going to be price. I mean, in thinking about whether those prices are excessive, it's relative to a cost. And right. if they're ratcheting down the service, that's reducing their cost. And that makes the gap relatively larger. So they're earning right. a larger profit on those customers relative to other customers. And so um, it's, it's all being reflected in that analysis of price versus costs. Right. And, and I think where I'm kind of going with this is, you know, I think Mr. Horwich and Mr. Rosenthal have talked about, well, you know, it's an adequate service coming out of market power, right? And that's what mid-tech you look for in mid-tech. And so you can't just look at an adequate service. You can't necessarily even look at an adequate service relative to what the shipper had before. You've got to sort of make a judgment versus other shippers that are competitively situated compared to the person who might not have as good of competitive options, um, you know, whether or not they're market dominant under, under mid-tech. And so that was, that was sort of how they articulated it. But I, I think what you're touching on is another even layer of complexity to that, that which is not only do you have to compare the service of the shipper that's not in a good competitive situation to the ones that are, you also have to adjust it for the rates. And MidTech has some language along those lines. And, you know, MidTech was hit by the ICC for not providing that evidence. So now stepping to another layer of complexity, 
how does the board go about not only comparing service between shippers, but comparing rate adjusted service? So there are, I mean, beyond the scope of probably just talking about this today, because it, it, will, it will take some time, but there's a, uh, there's a variety of, of tools economists have used to what I'll say quality adjust prices. And so you can use those sorts of tools. But one thing I want to emphasize again in thinking about comparing one shipper to another, we can't lose sight of the fact that there, and I can't emphasize this enough given the, the nature of, of the business, there has to be some in which there's differential pricing and that you're keeping in, in your mind covering, say, in the diagram I use, the fixed costs of BC. Because if one just says, okay, sh the shipper should be identical or they should be comparable, you may lose sight of some, that somebody has to cover that fixed cost of BC in these examples. So, so I, just, I, I, I know that's not precisely the question you asked, but I wanted to re-highlight that because in thinking about these comparisons, or you do have to cover the joint and common costs of the, of the railroad. Right. I, I do wonder whether or not, I mean, if you just look at, you know, I, I think BNSF uh, submitted that our rate case process is already um, very uh, complex. And, you know, you think our current most simplified methodology, 3B, you know, basically you establish a comparison group, um, you know, over 180 and you adjust for the revenue shortfall allocation method, right, to try and figure out, you know, what the railroads need for, the, for their enterprise. And that's already seen, and BNSF conceded that that was too complex. And I, I wonder whether or not when you're talking about something like rate adjusted service comparison groups, that strikes me as it could be seen as even more complex than 3B. And I, and I do wonder whether or not, um, you know, the, 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 the compensation portion of the statute was meant to kind of um, include all of those, you know, very, very complex factors or whether or not you know, that it, we're, we're starting to approach something that I think BNSF stated they weren't necessarily looking for was, was, was a, 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 a bar that was too hard for a shipper to meet. And is it really realistic to imagine, especially small shippers, think about the small shippers, whether or not they can, even, they can come in with quality adjusted service comparison groups. Is, so I mean, you I, think I'll, make, I'll, make, I'll make two yeah. observations, if I may. Um, number one, I, I haven't analyzed the, the statute and your rate regulations relative to this. But I think one thing that's critical here, and I think it's one of the, in the reciprocal um, uh, switching policy that you have, you're gonna have to go through all of that plus the work on figuring out where the switch occurs, et cetera, et cetera, and all the issues that arise from that process. And to the extent that there is a, a problem of, on the bottleneck and there's a problem with pricing um, on a particular route, it's much more efficient to just regulate that price and not go through all of the costs associated with the mandatory switching policy. And so you, you're gonna have, you're gonna, my, I get the, from an economic perspective, you're gonna have to do both plus right. and so you might as well do the simpler version. Well, yeah, you do a simpler version, but then, you know, one of the things that's always struck me about rate regulation is you can regulate rates, but then the railroad can ration service. So what do you do in that situation then? And so you're back to the service problem. Can I make an observation about some of the evolution in the, in the rate proceedings, which I think maybe applies here too, is that we're, we're very supportive of finding ways that are kind of consistent with the economics that Mr. Rorzag is talking about, but which sort of streamline the, you know, things like the order of proof or what have you, right? So, you know, I mean, I, 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 I forgive me for not having like a solution at hand immediately to propose for that, but some of these issues about, you know, if you have this feeling that like, well, the problem is over here and then the problem is over there, you know, can that, you'd have to ask questions like, well, could you address that with like, you know, burden shifting, right? Somebody has to show X, then somebody else can show Y, right? Who has better access to proof on this or that? I mean, those are kind of things that the board has already, I think, thought about in constructing, you know, existing rate cases, has thought about it, you know, in some of the more recent evolutions, you know, and look, like there may be debates about whether certain things are consistent with the statute or actually get to the, the economic reality. But, 
you know, th this is the sort of thing that you know courts have to deal with too, right? As they try to structure proof in a way that that is sort of gets to the truth, but in a sensible fashion that doesn't kind of overload one side or the other. And you know, I think I think the board has you know some latitude in thinking creatively about those, and that's the yeah. kind of thing that parties should talk about. Right. I I, I think that's I think that's a, a a very good point, and you know, not to get on a soapbox a little bit about it, but it is, of course, you know, it's the very shippers that have the least ability to negotiate across geography, right? And it's the very shippers that have the least ability to pay, you know, for, for lawyers to mount a complex case. Those are the shippers that, you know, could be argued are in the most vulnerable situation from a competitive standpoint. So, you know, I, I, I think it's always important as we're discussing this and as we're thinking about rules, you know, there is the economically perfect solution, which is extraordinarily important to inform our actions, but we also have to take into account administrative complexity. Okay. Uh, where are we, Ben? Do you have? Uh, it's now Mar it's now Mark's turn. Okay. Just a quick question uh, from Mr. Warzak before we move on. Um, sure. you mentioned that uh, changes in one part of the network have an impact on other parts of the network. I wondered if you could perhaps elaborate on that or, or give an example. Well, whenever you're operating a network, and, and this is you see this in all network industries, whether it's an airline, whether it's a railroad, whatever it may be, and this has been well studied in economics, and, and perhaps some of the railroads specifically can address this. Um, when you, you make changes, say a train is late in one part of the network, that has effects on other parts. And we the most tangible thing for probably everybody is we've experienced that with airplanes. It's, a flight comes in late from point A to point B and it affects the B to C leg of, of the airline. So to the extent, and we heard a little bit about this, the potential delays that are associated with a switch, that may have an effect then on what happens next. And so the, my point there is you can't ignore the fact in any discussion of costs that, that we're operating a network and, and in a network, um, one part of it has an effect on another part. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Fagan. I'm on the faculty at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Uh, I thank the board for the opportunity to share my concerns about the proposed rule, which I believe introduced significant risks to railroad operations and the supply chains they participate in. I also believe that a clearer definition of the problem is required to ensure that forced switching is in fact the best solution to be pursued. My written testimony deals Hale's concerns about the proposed rules increase in service failures by adding a handoff, in particular at a place not designed for it, and that such failures can have knock-on effects which will negatively impact shippers and consumers. And to the point that was just raised by the member and Mr. Orzag's response, I'll elaborate a little bit more on the network effects that I'm concerned about. Every node or link introduces risk. And as an example to have seeing that in the context of the switching uh, proposed regulation here, I can point you to this exhibit. This was submitted in a previously in this proceeding. And you can see, even in a relatively simple switch, you've got 10 steps in order to achieve the objective. A more complex example on the next slide shows more than 20 steps in order to achieve a successful switch. If I can use a track and field analogy for you, the proposed rule in essence turns a single runner 880 meter race into a relay race with all its challenges. The image you're seeing here is from the 2008 Olympics where you can see the baton being dropped which lost the race. Baton handoffs and railroad switches take time, effort and training. Expecting a perfect handoff at facilities not designed for that purpose creates undue risk of service failures. We can actually estimate or quantify the magnitude of those risks 
using the concept of roll throughput yield. For example, if we have a process that only has five steps and each individual step operates at 95%, the full system will only be operating at about 78%. You can see here, therefore, the impacts of adding steps, adding complexity can have a, at a system level, a significant concern. Recent events from the grounding of the evergreen, uh, ever given uh, container ship in the Suez to the computer chips failure or shortage that we're seeing right now demonstrates to us that even small disturbances or poor forecasts in a supply chain can cause significant impacts throughout the entire supply chain. I want to use the Ever Given as an example. So the Ever Given was operating in the global supply chain. The global supply chain consists literally of thousands of ships, tens of thousands of miles, hundreds of ports, et cetera. You can see in this image that blocking just one quarter of a mile of a segment in that supply chain froze an estimated $42 billion of commerce for a week. Now, while it only took four days for the waiting ships to pass the canal, it took more than a month for the global supply chain to restabilize. The stylized image I'm showing here shows the impact and the knock-on effects of the ever given. As I mentioned, there were, as a result of the blockage, about 450 ships which needed to pass through the Suez. Typically they move 50 ships a day, but they were able to move the 400 plus ships and clear them out in four days. So if you're sitting in this supply chain and you're just the Suez Canal Authority, you're done. This is great, I've resolved the problem. But you aren't just the Suez, you are part of a broader supply chain. And so what I'm showing you in the other line is the impact on Rotterdam. Rotterdam was the next port of call uh, for the Ever Given as it uh, transited the Suez. Here, you can see two impacts as a result of the Ever Given. First, you see for a week, the nine ships a day that should have been coming to Rotterdam, they have the capacity to handle and are planning on handling, don't show up. So we have idle resources. Then you see the spike of ships that emerge waiting at Rotterdam now because Rotterdam can only handle nine a day. Now I'm only showing you one initial knock-on. From there, the Ever Given was headed to Felixstowe. And then there's another port of call and another. So I'm hoping this illustrates for you that a small impact in one portion of a large network can have a sizable effect. The analog for us in the railroad side is if I have a supply chain problem in one terminal, it can easily migrate and, and permeate through not only our the specific railroad where it happens, but the rail network and then beyond to the broader supply chain. The rule as it's proposed is also inconsistent with the operation of effective supply chains. Successful supply chains are those where we decrease complexity, not increase it by adding a forced switch. Success also requires accurate and desirably stable forecasts. The proposed rule makes forecasting more difficult and increases the safety stock, whether that's cruise, rolling stock, terminal, line of road capacity necessary in order to ensure that if a larger uh, number of cars are tendered and required shipping that they can be accommodated. And finally, and perhaps the most important, successful supply chains require extensive collaboration. This is unlikely as it is both time sensitive, it's predicated on trust and often requires aligned interests. 
I have a hard time seeing that in this case. A second thrust of my testimony addresses the lack of a clear problem definition, which reciprocal switching is intended to solve. Without a very clear articulation of what is the problem we're solving, it's very hard to know whether this intervention or another is the best way to solve the problem. Now, you may argue that the case-by-case -case method helps address that, and it does have some advantages. However, one still needs to understand the macro level impact of benefits of costs across the entire rail network and its associated supply chains. There are, as has been mentioned by several speakers today, a number of potential solutions beyond the uh, mandated switching. If it's a service issue, there are board existing authorities to remedy that. We've talked quite a bit about rate reasonableness also to address if the rates are the issue. In closing, I'd like to observe that a private wealth transfer from railroads to shippers does not a priori create public value. We create public value when, as a result of the regulatory action, we see sustainable long-term cost reductions that can be passed on to consumers as a result of productivity gains, improvements in service, modal diversion, and the like. In the description that we've seen about forced service, it is, excuse me, forced switching, it is very hard to see those sustained improvements taking place. In a analog, Australia, a number of years ago, moved to an open access regime. Now, there is an important difference, which is in their case, they are opening access above rail or below rail, and it's allowing multiple competitors above rail. And we did, in fact, see a wealth transfer from the mining companies, excuse me, from the railroads to the much more profitable mining companies. But what we didn't see was we didn't see improvements that were sustained in terms of efficiencies, new services, and the like. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, seeing the practice so far, I'm happy to answer questions now, or if you'd prefer, we can turn to Deborah Aaron and she'll share her perspectives. Mr. Faggot, I have a couple of questions. Could you put that chart back up on the number of moves which you switch? Yes. So how many moves are, are required here? So this is a 10 step process in this particular example to handle a switch. All right. were, you, were you listening to the UP presentation today? I was. Did you hear the UP operations people say that to move a car into a yard that's going to be reciprocally switched requires one more move, and that is to put it on the track that's going to go over to the B yard where you're listing? I was. And uh, what I think... All, that's all the question I had is whether you were listening. Yes, sir. Uh, you didn't hear him say it would take 10 moves, did you? I didn't hear him say it would take 10 moves, and I'm not suggesting that the number of moves he was referring to is comparable to what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the individual actions or steps that are required in order for this change to take place. And the reason I'm highlighting it is every one of those has the potential for a failure. And what I'm concerned about is creating increased failures in a system that is integrated so that we are able to provide the service level that the shippers anticipate getting. All right. But if there are nine more moves on your chart than are actually made, there are nine fewer times for a failure. Would you agree? No, because what we are talking about, unfortunately, uh, about apples and oranges, and perhaps we can define the nomenclature a little bit more carefully. 
I'm referring to the actual individual activities that need to take place. Okay. And so you can see number one is a yard switch move to move the empty card uh, to an interchange rod, interchange train at yard C. You can walk down each of these. What he was referring to, I think, is an aggregate of getting the car from the initiating origin location and handing it to the railroad that will take it on from there. Uh, he was, well, uh, you know, it's late. I'm not going to go back over. We all heard what he said. I, I did not have the uh, time uh, getting ready for this hearing to read your resume. Do you come to this testimony as a person uh, experienced in railroad operations? I come to this person uh, excuse me, to this testimony uh, with a variety of expertises. I have worked for a number of years consulting to railroads and in that capacity have had the opportunity to understand how switches do take place. I would not proffer myself as an expert in the, in the order of the gentleman and uh, Mr. Geringer from Union Pacific. And certainly we could turn our questions back to him to make sure that uh, our, our nomenclature aligns, or if uh, I am mistaking or misspeaking, that he could correct it. But yes, I do have a basic understanding. Well, uh, I understand, but you're, you're coming here and explaining to us what you say and was involved with a switch as somebody who's had a railroad operations person explain it to you. You're not an operations person yourself. Would that be? That is a true statement. All the right. point uh, of my, may I, with I'm your sorry. indulgence, may I finish my statement? What I'm here to do is to explain that the, in, the addition of this switch increases the risk in the supply chain and that risk in the supply chain has to be accounted for in thinking about whether the switch, the mandatory switching is the best solution to the problem that you face. Well, with all due respect, um, I don't think we've learned much by saying how the Suez Canal was blocked up by the Evergreen. It really doesn't enlighten us very much, but I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Fagan? All right, let's go ahead. All right, I think that's me then. I'm Deborah Aaron. Hello, members of the board. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm very aware that today's hearing is not about telecommunications and that I am a telecommunications expert, not a freight rail expert. But I do have years of experience with forced sharing requirements in the telecom industry. And I've been asked to provide that perspective as one that may be useful to the board in evaluating the potential unintended effects of requiring forced switching in rail. The Telecom Act of 1996 was passed with the good intentions of reducing prices, increasing quality, and encouraging innovation. The forced sharing aspect of the Telecom Act was intended to create competition where competition was purportedly impeded by monopoly bottlenecks. It even built in rewards to incumbents by allowing them to enter new markets if they cooperated with the sharing obligations. But the envisioned competition is not what came to pass. Instead, the telecom industry in the US underwent a grueling decade of regulatory morass, legal disputes, and wasted resources. To set the stage, here's a schematic of the wireline telephone network. Wireline telephone service is provided over a physical transmission path from a hub to a home or a business. And that physical transmission path is called in the telecom world, the local loop. The local loop is dedicated only for use by the home or business to which it connects. 
The hub is the local switching center where the call is routed in a process in telecom called switching over long haul or short haul facilities to the switching center serving its final destination. From there, the call is delivered to the recipient's home or business over the dedicated transmission path or the local loop at the other end. Multiple carriers have networks that may be able to transport traffic from point A to point B, but at the time of the Telecom Act, all homes and offices in a local area were connected to the telephone network via dedicated transmission paths provided by only one company. The components of the network that were largely at issue in the forced sharing regime under the Telecom Act were the local loop and switching, which are circled in red on my graphic. All right, so that's to set the context. The telephone network and the freight rail network obviously carry very different kinds of traffic, but both are network industries. Both have high fixed costs that require long-term investment. Both have a long regulatory history that has affected pricing. Both have significant shared and common costs and both have a federal regulator that would have to enforce and live with its policies. Indeed, you might think that sharing would be easier when the traffic being shipped is just data over telecom wires and not physical products over rails or roads, but it was not easy or successful. So I offer this history to educate those who know that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So to implement forced sharing of network components, the FCC first had to determine which network components incumbents were required to share with their competitors and where. The FCC also had to determine what pricing methodology would govern the prices for the forced sharing arrangements. A very brief sketch of the ensuing struggles provides an image of how costly, lengthy, and ultimately futile this process was in the telecom industry. The FCC first issued a 700 plus page order with its rules on one, which elements have to be shared and when, and two, how to set prices. The FCC required that if a network element could be shared, it had to be shared on the premise that the broadest standard would do the most to promote competition. The incumbents responded by taking the FCC to court, focusing on the FCC's failure to properly limit the sharing obligations. When this litigation reached the Supreme Court a few years later, the court rejected the FCC's sharing rules and instructed the FCC to go back and try again. Over the ensuing six years, the FCC tried to respond to the court's instructions to provide a limiting standard for forced sharing. And the courts rejected the FCC's new standards two more times. Was the FCC just being incompetent? I would say no, the FCC consulted with industry parties, consumer groups, business groups, government agencies, elite economists on all sides, and devoted what it called enormous amounts of time and resources to its efforts. And it was doing roughly what the law called for, which was to promote competition. But the courts repeatedly found that instead of promoting competition, what the FCDC was doing was attempting to create what the court called and what economists call synthetic competition, meaning that the alternative supply that they were creating was a result only of forced sharing of the incumbent's resources at regulated low rates. The competition they were promoting was a regulatory construct, not organic competition. Finally, nine years after the passage of the Telecom Act, the FCC released an order that abandoned the most contentious sharing requirement. Now, at the same time that the industry participants and the regulator were tied up in court back and forth over where and when forced sharing must occur, the incumbents and their competitors were also battling over the implementation and interpretation 
of the pricing methodology that the FCC came up with. Initially, the FCC expressed a naive expectation that the incumbents and their competitors would be able to negotiate the prices. In almost all cases, however, the negotiations broke down and the pricing ended up back on the regulator's doorstep. The parties entered into difficult and again, lengthy, highly detailed and costly regulated arbitrations over pricing. And again, this was even though the incumbents faced attractive incentives to cooperate with the sharing obligations, as I said earlier. After seeing how its pricing rules were playing out in practice over several years, the FCC was concerned about the effect that the low prices were, that were being set seemed to be having on industry investment. So the FCC itself issued an NPRM to reconsider its own pricing methodology. And many of the issues highlighted by the FCC in that NPRM are still unresolved. There are other lessons from telecom's attempt to promote competition with forced sharing that you may, I hope, find instructive. For one, despite other incentives to cooperate, incumbents did not necessarily want to spend their own money to make it easy and fast for competitors to take their customers away. Predictably, disputes arose over how to monitor the incumbent's compliance with the forced sharing rules and how to make sharing work in practice. This led to costly, lengthy, and highly detailed proceedings regarding the performance of the incumbent's operation support systems, regarding the proper policy solution to the question of who should bear the cost of those systems, and regarding the ongoing monitoring of those systems. For another, while the FCC and the courts were going back and forth for nearly a decade, the industry was being whipsawed. Companies made investments and other business decisions based on the FCC's policies, only to have those policies overturned or challenged. The resulting instability in the industry contributed to its ultimate upheaval. So after all of that, did the sharing obligations and favorable pricing methodology the FCC adopted at least advance competition? The data say no. Regulators attempted to jumpstart a certain form of competition and ensure its success. But once the FCC issued its fourth attempt to comply with the court's reprimands, the form of competition envisioned by the regulators did not materialize. There was a lot of industry upheaval, but the number of customers served by shared lines today is exceedingly small in the context of the overall industry. Thank you, and I will either return the floor to Ben or be very happy to entertain your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, any of the board members have any questions for Ms. Aaron? Okay, thank you. Very lucid presentation, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. I might uh, think maybe just wrap up and see if the board has any additional questions. I just, you know, I think our takeaway here is, is that the board should remember that there are a lot of stakeholders that are likely to suffer if this rule is adopted in its present form, because we have to we have to remember the shippers. You know, the shippers say they, they they won't ask for these orders where it hurts them, but they don't say that they won't ask for these orders where it benefits them and it hurts someone else. It hurts everyone else in ways. You know, and those that's the, those those people who can be harmed are shippers who aren't getting a benefit here, but still have to use this an operationally compromised network today, have to use a network that suffers reduced investment for the future. We haven't even talked about passenger rail during this session that's facing the same issues. I mentioned labor earlier. Labor knows that there's not anything good in, in this rule for them. 
the, the public, I, I think we actually haven't seen a rigorous case for why ultimately the public is better off here, especially if you have to tell them this is making supply chains worse, not better, if these new switching operations are invoked. And then we just heard from Dr. Aaron about how this board may face these contentious proceedings that you know, could be as bad or worse as what the telecom regulators had to address. And that's even without speaking at all about the members of, of the railroad industry. And so in that game of winners and losers, you know, we think about who are the winners and, and I'll remind the board that the state has been presented in the revenue adequacy proceeding, but you know, this is a chart of the very profitable shippers that are the most zealous advocates here and comparing them to the railroads in terms of relative return on investment above cost of capital. And, that green line that's way above there is the median member of the American Chemistry Council. And the blue line at the bottom that sometimes drips below zero, sometimes barely above, sometimes below, is the median class one carrier here. We can put that down, but I mean, this is what Mark Fagan was talking about in terms of sustainable and public, true public benefits. So I think we'll leave it there. I know it is, is late, but we are certainly happy to answer questions. I'm question out, Ben. I don't know about the rest of the board members. I got one last comment. Karen. Um, you talk about we have to consider, you know, the impacts on other parties, et cetera. If a shipper, because of poor service, can't get its good to market, everybody suffers. The economy suffers. It's a failure in the supply chain that's caused by poor service by the railroads. So let's keep that in mind too. We need to get the shippers goods to market. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, folks. Well, it's been a very successful endurance contest, contest for all concerned. I appreciate all of your bearing with us. And um, if there was some sharp questioning, that's because I think it's our job, but I certainly appreciate everybody's presentation today and the work that went into it. Uh, we will recess until 9.30 Eastern time tomorrow when we will begin with uh, panel four. Uh, and I think, well, they all know who they are because they've gotten the order. Uh, and we will do our level best to finish this tomorrow. So thank you all, appreciate it. Thank you, Ukrainian. Thank you all.